Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 2 of what if I was reborn in Naruto as a prodigy half Yuki and Kagaya. Let the tale begin. Chapter 26 Hatsu seemed helpless as the sand umbu he was facing pulled her fingers, manipulating the kunai and shuriken she had thrown, taking him off guard. The barrage of kunai and shuriken all hit their target as Hata's body was riddled with the razor-sharp edges of the blades. That's the end of you. The female umbu said. Hatsu's body suddenly burst into a small pool of water, the shuriken and kunai falling to the sand clattering against one another. A substitution. When did he? She shouted, outraged she had fallen for the simple jutsu. Hatsu quickly swiped down from behind her, aiming his kunai's blade at the back of her spine. At the last second, she was able to turn and jump out of the way of his attack, her reflexes proving to be too sharp. Hatsu stopped on the spot as he twirled his kunai into a reverse grip in his hand. The female umbu pulling her chakra threads to use her projectiles to attack once more, but to her surprise, nothing happened. Sorry, but I am already familiar with your chakra threads technique. It won't work on me anymore. Hatsu said with a smile, his filled teeth glistening in the sunlight. You arrogant fool! The sand umbu shouted as she flicked her arms down, connecting more chakra threads into the sand around Hatsu. You already played right into my hands. She shouted as she pulled her chakra threads back hard, exposing a large amount of kunai with explosive tags wrapped around them. Hatsu sighed as he lifted his kunai before tossing it into the ground. I already told you. That won't work on me anymore. He said with a blank expression. Suddenly all of the explosive kunai that the sand umbu was pulling with her threads suddenly changed direction, all of them shooting towards her instead of Hatsu. She was alarming startled and had no chance to react, screaming as all of the kunai she had laid out to use as a trap exploded all around her. Hatsu watched as her figure sailed out of the black smoke from the explosion before it hit the ground with a thud. He walked over to her slowly, regarding all of the damage she had sustained from her attack. Her demon mask had fallen off, leaving her half-scorched face exposed for Hatsu to see. She was breathing heavily. Her body burnt and profoundly damaged, yet she still managed to look Hatsu in the eyes with a devilish look. You won't win. She spat, giving a small chuckle. Lord Kazakage will. She was suddenly cut off as a monstrous roar sounded in the far distance causing Hatsu to turn and look. What in the blazes was that? He said, turning to look back at the sand umbu who now lay dead on the ground before him. Well, I had better give the others a hand. Meanwhile, Ozawa was retreating as quick as she possibly could with the princess over her shoulder, who was still kicking and screaming about the whole situation. How dare those sand ninja do this? My father will hear about it. She said screaming as Ozawa was forced to jump high into the air to avoid a barrage of shuriken. Will you stop running so fast? The sand umbu shouted as he chased after them waving his hands in the air at Ozawa. Only one sand umbu was currently on their tail, but with no cover to hide, the princess was exposed to too much danger. Ozawa continued to run as fast as she could doing her best to dodge and deflect the odd shuriken that got to close, the sand umbu seeming to throw them like it was a game at random. Ozawa was starting to get tired now, and the scorching desert sun was making things even worse. She spotted a large ravine in the distance, knowing that it was hers and the princess' best bet she darted towards it, the umbu following the two of them, gaining more and more ground as he continued to shout at them. Princess, I am going to have to put you down and fight this guy. When I do, you need to get out of here as fast as possible and hide. What? I will do no such. You must. It is your only chance of staying alive. Ozawa shouted, cutting the princess off. The princess sealed her lips as the realization of the situation was finally sinking in. Ozawa jumped onto the start of some large rocks before climbing over to the other side. It was a valley surrounded by two cliffs on either side, a path going in a sort of zigzag line. Now, princess! Ozawa shouted as she put her down. Deciding this was her best bet. The princess looked Ozawa in the eyes and gave her a nod. You have to survive. She said to Ozawa. 
Ozawa returned her nod and placed a kunai in her hand. Please take this princess. Just in case. The princess held it tight and nodded as a tear fell from her eye before she turned to run, leaving Ozawa alone to face the umbu that was chancing them. Ozawa watched as the princess ran and ran until she disappeared out of sight. I will win princess. She said, her resolve burning in her purple eyes. My, my. How touching. A voice said from behind her. Ozawa turned on her heel into a defensive stance to face the umbu. He was stood high atop the rocky cliff that Ozawa had climbed over to get into the valley. Where is the princess? The umbu asked as he drew his sword from his back. Ozawa clenched her kunai tight at the side of the blade. You won't touch her. She said before throwing a burst of shuriken at the umbu. The sand umbu easily deflected the shuriken with his blade before twisting it back into a reverse grip, the back of the blade placed against his forearm. I would like to take my time enjoying you little girl. But I have a mission to do. Tell me where the princess is and I promise to grant you a... He said, suddenly stopping to think about what he was saying, placing his hand on his chin to think. Well no, you're getting a slow death either way for making me chase you so far through the fucking desert. He shouted before jumping high into the air. Here we go! He yelled in a crazy tone. Ozawa jumped backwards and avoided the attack, but the Umbu Ninja was very fast as he darted towards her reading his blade to an attack. Time to die, little girl! He shouted. Ozawa blocked his first strike to her throat with her kunai, the sand umbu spun around his sword suddenly chancing hands, another attack coming down to the top of her head. Ozawa was able to block the attack, but he was much stronger than she was and the force of the block knocked her back. Not bad, he said, laughing before jumping into attack again. Let's see how you deal with this. He was spinning fast and jumping all over the place as his blade seemed to strike out of nowhere almost unpredictable. Ozawa blocked the first strike but was quickly put on her back foot as she was forced to duck and dive out of the way of his strikes. She soon found her back pressed against one of the large cliff walls. The sand umbu thrust his blade aiming for her face, but Ozawa was able to avoid it, his blade getting wedged in the rock behind her. Ozawa used a palm strike to hit him in the chest before she slashed with her kunai. The umbu let the first strike hit his chest but grabbed her wrist before she could slash him, her attack having no effect. I don't think so, little girl. The only one here who will be putting something inside one of us is me. He said, giving a sickening chuckle from behind his demon mask. Ozawa smiled, and it seemed to confuse him a little. Sorry, but you aren't my type. She shouted as her wrist suddenly turned into water, freeing her from his grasp. Ozawa used his confusion to strike him in the groin with her knee, dropping him to the ground with a large groan of pain. Why you bitch? He shouted as he tried to get his breath back. Ozawa quickly dashed up the cliff face using her chakra to stick to the wall with her feet before making some quick hand signs. Fuck you! She shouted as she finished the hand signs pointing her finger towards him like a gun. Secret Hozuki Clan Technique Water Gun Rapid Fire Jutsu Ozawa shouted as bullets of water suddenly started to fire from the tip of her finger. The sand umbu noticed the jutsu and was about to try and jumped out of the way. When he suddenly noticed his hand had been tied to the handle of his sword that was stuck in the cliff wall by a piece of ninja wire. When did you? He screamed as he tried to pull his arm free, the wire cutting into his hand, almost taking it clean off. Fuck! He screamed as the storm of water bullets hit him, pumping him full of holes as they tore right through him, hitting the sand below knocking up a small dust storm. Ozawa finished screaming and stopped firing the water bullets from her finger before taking in a large breath of fresh air. She jumped down to check that her opponent was dead and gave what remained of his body a kick. That's what a piece of trash like you deserves. Fucking creep. She said as she relaxed her guard. I had better go and find the princess. She said. As soon as she took one step on the ground, the hairs on the back of her neck suddenly stood up, and she felt a blade cut right through her stomach. You shouldn't let your guard down, the voice said as the blade went clean through. 
Ozawa noticed it was another of the umbu and thankfully not the one she had just killed. He must have managed to get past the others and followed us here. She thought as she turned around to get a better look. The San Umbu was very surprised that his blade had done no damage and was forced to dodge Ozawa's kunai that almost slit his throat. Jumping back out of the way, he raised his sword and took a low fighting stance. Ozawa also jumped back and took a defensive stance, if not for her hydrification technique she would have been dead and she knew it. That's a nice technique you have there. No wonder Palabo over there didn't stand a chance he said, standing to his full height. Ozawa noticed his size and couldn't help feel intimidated at the sight of his massive frame. You miss ninja are full of little tricks, aren't you? He said as he placed his blade back in the sheath on his back. If my sword won't work on you then maybe ninjutsu will. He said as he started to form hand signs. Ozawa watched as the sand umbu started to make hand signs and she decided to counter with her own. Wind style, air bullets. Water style, water pistol. Each of them shouted as they unleashed their jutsu. The wind bullets collided with the water bullets clashing in the air giving small shock waves off as they cancelled each other out. Both Ozawa and the hidden sand umbu jumped back, each landing on a cliff face before starting to make more hand signs. Try this one. Wind style, great vacuum sphere. He shouted as he unleashed a massive compressed breath of wind-style chakra. Ozawa had quickly formed her own hand signs while running along the cliff face, her chakra holding her feet to the wall. Water-style, raging waves jutsu. Ozawa shouted as she unleashed a large stream of water from her mouth. Again both jutsu clashed in the air as the water and wind-style jutsus cancelled each other out over and over again. Each of them continued to run along the cliff walls as they continued to fire off jutsu at one another in what seemed like a never-ending battle. However, Ozawa was starting to tire as her hydration levels were running on low, the blazing sun making things worse. The sand umbu's wind style suddenly broke through Ozawa's water style and he pressed his advantage. What's the matter girl, can't handle the heat? He shouted as he flipped through the air, trying to land a flying kick that would have crushed her against the rocky cliff. Instead, Ozawa was able to jump out of the way, watching as the power of his kick destroyed the cliffside. Ozawa knew she needed to retreat and find some water if she was to stand a chance against this monster. But the sand umbu had other ideas. As he pulled himself free of the debris, he started to form more hand signs. Don't tell me you're trying to run away already. He shouted as he continued to make the hand signs. Ozawa jumped as fast as she could running along the cliff sides trying to gain as much ground as she could away from him. Wind style. Wind dragon bullet. He shouted as the air around him suddenly whipped up into a small tornado before taking the form of a dragon. Ozawa realized too late she was trapped between two cliffs and his wind dragon having played right into his hands. The wind-style dragon flew towards her as it roared, smashing into her before closing its vast jaws. Ozawa's body was whipped around like a ragdoll as the wind dragon violently smashed her off the cliffs and rocks before finally crashing into the ground exploding in a massive blast as it made contact. Hatsu could hear the sounds of a monstrous battle coming from the distance where he knew Fiona to be battling against the Kazakage. Not wanting to waste any more time he rushed over to find Sawano laying on the ground bleeding badly. Hatsu rushed over to assess the damage seeing that Sawano was still alive but barely. Hold on, Sawano. He shouted as the sounds of blades clashing caught his attention. He turned to see Kaga battling with his opponent before the two of them clashed in midair, landing in a strong stance each with their swords raised. Even Hatsu couldn't tell who had delivered the final blow and he quickly drew a kunai ready to attack if Kaga fell. Kaga and the sand umbu landed strong none of them moving an inch, each waiting to see who would fall first. Kaga coughed up a little blood and dropped to one knee, using his sword to help keep him upright. The sand umbu turned around and placed his sword over his shoulder, standing tall before speaking. Good fight! He said as his upper body suddenly dropped to the floor, blood sprang from his legs that stood upright for a moment longer before they too fell to the sand. Hatsu ran over to Kaga who was slowly picking himself up from the ground, his hand placed over the slash on his midsection. Ah, 
Hatsu looks like you won your battle too, Kaga said, smirking. Hatsu helped pick him up but let him stand with his own strength. Sawano is down, looks like his opponent went after Ozawa with the other one, Hatsu said, sounding worried. The sound of another monstrous roar echoed from across the desert, causing Hatsu and Kaga's hairs to stand on end. Is that the captain? Kaga asked, his eyes wide. Hatsu nodded as he could feel the immense chakra that was coming from that direction. Never mind the captain. Hatsu said as he turned around. You stay here and help Sawano, you're in no condition to move around too much anyway, Hatsu said. What about Captain Yuki? He needs our help. I mean he's fighting Akaga for God's sake. Kaga said objecting. No. We would only get in his way. Hatsu said with a solemn glance. I better try and catch up with the others, you stay here and try to patch Sawano up, Hatsu said as he quickly dashed off across the desert. Kaga nodded and turned as more and more explosions sounded in the distance. The Kazakage had managed to soften the blow of his return to the earth with a soft sheet of gold dust breaking his fall. From there, he had pulled himself back onto his feet, his chakra was now running low and his stamina was starting to give out. You are nothing more than a monster. A mere Jinchuriki. You cannot defeat me. He said as he punched his fist into the ground beneath him. Saikin watched as the Kazakage mumbled a few words and punched the ground. The Six Tails was still in full control of Fiona's body as he was still unconscious. Saikin had to say he was very impressed by the Kazakage. He had proved he was no mere ninja and was putting up an extraordinary fight. Suddenly ripples started to form in the ground below as the sand began to break and waves began to form like an ocean as gold dust exploded from the desert itself. The Kazakage slapped his hands together and made a few hand signs before finally placing his hands onto the sand. I already told you not to underestimate the Kazakage. This is my ultimate technique. He screamed at the top of his lungs, clearly enraged. Inside Fiona's inner world, he was currently lead unconscious atop the soft snow. His eyes abruptly snapped open as he took in his surroundings. What's going on? He said, standing to his feet slowly. Fiona, you have finally woken, Saikin said, sounding happy. What's going on, Saikin? Last I remember I was battling the Kazakage before passing out, Fiona said still a little groggy. That's correct. I have been using your body to battle against him while you rested. Saikin said. We don't have long now that you are awake, my control will fade soon, which means we won't be able to maintain version 2, Saikin said, sounding worried. Fiona took a moment to take in all of the information. We are in version 2? He asked, sounding surprised. I thought we couldn't do that yet? He asked. That is correct. However, while you were unconscious, I was able to take control over your body, which allowed me to use only my chakra to support the form leaving no stress on your body. Fiona nodded. All right, Saikin, how much time do we have left? Fiona asked. About twenty seconds. And it would seem the Kazakage has unleashed his most powerful technique. The Six Tails said, sounding worried. I fear he is attempting to seal us. Fiona let the word sink in before an idea suddenly popped into his head. That's it. He shouted. Saikin, I need you to fire a tailed beast bomb as quickly as you can to give me as much space as possible. Fiona shouted. Okay, I'm on it. Saikin shouted, not asking any question. Saikin jumped back trying to avoid the massive waves of gold dust that were crashing down, each trying to pull him under the vast ocean that had formed. Quickly he ran and slithered as fast as he could between wave after wave, melting any thread of gold dust that came to close to him. Saikin jumped high into the air and his body suddenly grew large and fast as if he was full of water, the black and red chakra forming all around his mouth. The Kazakage watched in dismay as the six tails had continued to avoid his gold dust ocean before jumping into the air, his eyes straining to see before opening wide. Is that what I think it is? He said to himself, not believing it. Saikin suddenly blasted a massive red beam of concentrated chakra towards the Kazakage and his ocean of gold dust. 
The beam was so intense that it let loose massive shock waves into the air traveling at a rapid rate towards its target. Curse you! The Kazakage shouted, willing his gold dust to form as many layers as it could to protect him from the blast before it hit, creating a massive explosion that could be seen and felt for miles. Chapter 27 The explosion was massive and could be seen for miles, letting a huge amount of smoke lose into the air. Fiona landed back onto the ground the version 2 chopper cloak fading away, leaving him relatively unharmed. Of course, he had Saikan to thank for that, but it could wait until later. Fiona waited for the dust to settle before he saw the aftermath of his tailed beast bomb. The desert had a large crater in it and the sand had been scorched black from the intense heat of the concentrated chakra. I can't sense the Kazakage. Fiona thought as he scouted the area for him. The gold dust had settled and scattered all over the place, mixing into the desert sand. Maybe that blast killed him? Saikin said. Fiona squatted down, picking up a handful of the gold dust before letting it run between his fingers, letting it fall back down to the sand. We shouldn't let our guard down just yet, Fiona said as he stood up. Fiona walked through the desolate wasteland he had created as he searched for any signs of the Kazakage. A few minutes passed as Fiona walked around before he heard a small cough coming from the distance. Fiona approached slowly before spotting that it was the Kazakage, or what was left of him. He was severely injured and in bad shape. Half of his body was scorched from the blast. His left arm had also been ripped off along with his left leg from below the knee. Fiona looked down at him, taking in the state he was in. He didn't need to say anything witty or give him a snide remark. No. Fiona Simple looked him in the eyes as he took his final breaths. Why you? The Kazakage spoke. Who? Are you? He said, struggling to get his words out. Fiona took a moment before he allowed a bone to protrude from the palm of his hand. I am Fiona, the ice devil of the bloody mist. He said as he allowed his ice-style chakra to coat his bone blade. The Kazakage closed his eyes, accepting his defeat in full, ready to embrace the afterlife. Fiona struck the Kazakage in the heart with his blade, his ice-style chakra pouring out freezing the Kazakage's body, preserving what was left of it in a block of ice. This way, at least they will find your body. Fiona said, turning his back on the now-dead Kazakage. He only took a brief moment before becoming serious once again. Saikan, I need to borrow some of your chakra. He said as he focused. Of course Fiona, Saikan said allowing him to tap into his reserves. Fiona made a couple of hand signs and focused hard, allowing the red chakra cloak to envelop his body sprouting two tails. Finishing his hand signs, Fiona opened his eyes as a crystal ice mirror formed in front of him. I hope this works, he said as he stepped into the mirror. Hatsu was running as fast as he could to try and catch up with Ozawa and the princess. He could only hope that Ozawa was able to hold her own against the two sand umbu shinobi until he arrived. Suddenly a massive explosion fired off far off in the distance. Even though it was still far far away, Hatsu could still feel the intense shock waves that came off of it. What in the? He shouted as he used his arms to block the sand being kicked up from hitting his eyes. The shock waves ended after a moment, and Hatsu could see the massive smoke cloud that it had left. Was that Captain Yuki? He asked. He didn't have time to think about that now. He had to go and help Ozawa and secure the princess. After all, that was the mission. Hatsu turned and started running as quickly as he could once more, using his chakra to amplify his speed as much as possible. The dust cloud faded in the background as Hatsu continued to run through the desert, he wasn't sure how much time passed by, but the sun was starting to get low now signaling it was mid-afternoon. I have to hurry, he thought as he continued to run. Suddenly something started to glow on his shoulder, catching his attention and causing him to stop in his tracks. What in the hell is that? He thought as he watched it glow. Is that a seal? He said, trying to rip his jacket off before the seal could fully activate. Suddenly, the light coming off the seal started to grow cold before the chakra it was giving off formed a crystallized mirror in the air next to him. 
Nothing happened for a moment, and Hatsu just stared at the Jutsu very confused. Suddenly, Fiona's reflection became visible before he stepped out of the mirror right in front of Hatsu. What in the... Captain Yuki! Hatsu shouted in disbelief. Fiona slipped out of the ice mirror and stepped onto the sand, allowing his red chakra cloak to fade as he looked at Hatsu. Ah, Hatsu, I'm glad you survived. I wasn't sure if the seal would work, but looks like it did. Fiona said, rubbing the back of his head. Hatsu looked very surprised, his mouth hanging wide open. What in the hell was that? He said before snapping upright. I mean, what was that, Captain? Hatsu corrected. Fiona gave him a small smile. Don't worry about formalities, Hatsu, please. Fiona is fine. Right. Hatsu said. Fiona took a look around and noticed Hatsu was alone. Where is the princess? Fiona said, suddenly becoming serious. Hatsu nodded. I am on my way to find her now. Ozawa was able to make a break for it, but two of their umbu got past us. Forgive me, Captain. Let us make haste then, lead the way. Fiona said as the two of them dashed off. What happened to the rest of the squad? Fiona asked. Hatsu nodded. Kaga won without any major injuries but was still wounded, Sawano, so however, is hurt pretty bad. I'm not sure if he will make it. Hatsu said, turning to look where he was going. Fiona nodded and continued to follow Hatsu towards Ozawa's location. Caption I have to ask, how did you survive against the Kazakage and what was that jutsu? Hatsu said, unable to contain his curiosity. Fiona nodded, well for a start that jutsu is something I am still experimenting on. I designed a seal that would allow my chakra to form an ice mirror that I could link with another I create, allowing for a sort of wormhole effect that lets me travel between the two. That was I can travel a vast distance in almost an instant. Hatsu looked very confused, not understanding what the hell Fiona was on about. It's like sort of teleporting you could say, Fiona said, trying to simplify it. As for the Kazakage, well let's just say if not for a bit of help from a friend, I wouldn't be standing here with you now, Fiona said with a small smile. Hatsu decided not to press the matter, after all, his captain had just defeated one of the five Kage. He was not someone that Hatsu wanted to piss off right now. The princess tried her best to run as far as possible, but she couldn't get far with her limited stamina. She could still hear the sounds of battle in the distance, and she decided her best bet was to hide and find cover. She had made it to a small river that flowed through the desert valley, taking shelter under a small rock deciding to wait for someone to rescue her. I just know Captain Yuki will come for me. She said, trying not to lose hope. Meanwhile, Ozawa had been blasted by a wind-style dragon. The force of the jutsu had slapped her off the rocks and blasted her into the ground with tremendous force. She was in bad shape now, dehydrated and low on chakra the wind style had done a lot of damage to her, leaving her unable to move. The sand umbu was pleased with his work and could see that Ozawa was down and out for the count. Deciding not to waste any more time with her, he quickly used the body flicker to vanish. Ozawa could only watch as she lay flat on the ground in horror. No! Princess! I have to! Save her! She said, struggling to get up. However, it was no use as she collapsed back down to the ground before her world became black. The princess had waited some time now and decided to have a look to see if the coast was clear. Poking her head out into the open she took in all of her surroundings, listening for the slightest noise all while gripping the kunai that Ozawa had given her tightly in both hands. She took a sigh of relief as she could see or hear nothing and decided to stand up walking over to the stream, grabbing a handful of water to drink. The princess splashed her face with some water before looking at her reflection as the ripples started to settle. A large shadow abruptly appeared behind her, and the princess turned around in horror letting out a terrified scream as she tried to run away. Not so fast, your highness. The umbu shouted as he grabbed her wrist and covered her mouth with his large hand cutting her scream short. The princess tried to bite his hand, but it seemed to have no effect on the large man. Now now, princess. Is that any way for a lady to behave? 
he said as he prized her jaw open to pull his hand free without hurting her. How dare you? Do you know who I am? The princess shouted as she kicked and screamed, trying to get free. She quickly pulled the kunai from her dress and tried to slash at the man, but he was too quick to react and grabbed her wrist, taking the blade off of her. Now that was dangerous, I'm under orders not to harm you but this will make life much easier. I hope you can forgive me, he said with a natural tone. The princess's eyes opened wide as she realized he was going to knock her out and she tried to scream one last time. Don't touch me! Help! She shouted before the sand umbu hit her gently on the side of the neck, knocking her unconscious. Silence at last. The large man said, breathing a sigh of relief. I had better get back to Lord Kazakage with the princess. He said as he placed the princess's limp body over his shoulder. He turned and started to run, jumping high into the air ready to get out of the ravine, but for some reason, the Sanumbu could no longer feel the princess's weight on his shoulder and turned his head to see her body had vanished. What in the? The large man shouted as he searched around for her, confused. Fiona stood atop the cliff ahead with the unconscious princess on his shoulder. His expression was severe as he stared daggers at the Sanumbu. The large man could feel the pressure coming from Fiona before he even set his eyes on him. The air around his was growing cold, causing the hairs on his massive arms to stand on end. You fucking miss ninja! Always showing up one after the other. I've had it with a lot of you. The large man said suddenly enraged. He tossed a handful of kunai with explosive tags attached to the ends of them, each hitting the cliff edge where Fiona was standing. Take this! You little shit, the large man said as he started to form hand signs. The explosive kunai exploded, causing the cliff edge to cave, large rocks and boulders falling down crashing into the water. Fiona fell through the smoke and flipped in the air allowing bones to protrude from all of his body, ready to use them to slice his opponent to shreds. Wind style. Pressure damage. The large umbu shouted as he finished his hand signs and inhaled a massive amount of air. He blasted the massive amount of wind-style chakra at Fiona who was free-falling right towards him taking a direct hit from the jutsu. The wind-style's pressure was so intense that it forced Fiona high into the air, cutting his body all over from the sharp blades of wind chakra. I'm not done yet! The sand umbu shouted as he flipped back onto one of the cliff walls and made a few more quick hand signs. Wind-style! Bite of the dragon jutsu! He shouted, the wind style around Fiona gathering and taking the form of a massive dragon. Its jaws opened and smashed into Fiona, dragging him down towards the ground before slamming him into the solid rock beneath. The wind from the jutsu scattered all over, kicking up a massive cloud of debris. The sand umbu took a breath and allowed his large muscles to relax as he waited for the smoke to clear. He walked over slowly and could see Fiona's body had been smashed into the ground head first, only his legs sticking out of the hard stone. Little runt. Thinking you could take me on. He said as he grabbed Fiona's leg before pulling his body out of the ground. To his surprise, Fiona's body suddenly started to crumble as it turned into ice, his leg snapping in the large umbu's hand. What in the? A clone! He shouted just before a foot struck him in the face, sending him flying through the air. The large man hit the stream of water and bounced off it hard before crashing into the ground and then into the cliff wall. Arg! He screamed as his large body smashed into the cliff wall back first. The large man fell to the ground, unable to move as he tried to gather his bearings. He had never been struck so hard in his life as he coughed large pools of blood onto the ground. Fiona appeared in front of him with his arms crossed over his chest. Looking down at him, the air around him was cold, his eyes even more so. The sand umbu used all of his strength to look up at Fiona taking a good look at him before realizing he was the kid that the Kazakage had killed first. The realization hit him after a few moments, if he is alive and here that must mean that. He thought as he looked Fiona in the eyes. It can't be. Lord Kazakage killed you he said, trying to stand to his feet. Fiona smiled, allowing all of his bones to protrude out of his body along with the two horns on his head. 
The air around him grew even colder and the umbu started to shiver as the hairs on his arms began to freeze first. The Kazakage is dead, Fiona said. His expression plain as day. The sand umbu used the wall behind him to hold himself up as terror filled his very soul. No. You couldn't have. Lord Kazakage is unbeatable. I'm afraid you won't get the chance to find out, Fiona said as he closed his eyes. No. The sand umbu shouted as he tried to lunge for Fiona one last time with his fist. Fiona activated his jutsu allowing his chakra to expel all around him, freezing anything within a five-meter radius. The sand umbu's entire body froze in an instant, every cell in his body freezing in a mere moment killing him without him even realizing. Fiona closed his eyes and sighed in relief before letting his chakra settle down again. That's the last of them. He said before using his body flicker to appear atop a cliff where he had safely placed the princess. Time to regroup with the others. He said as he lifted her up and placed her on his shoulder. A while later. Fiona had regrouped with his entire squad now, bringing the princess with him who was still unconscious. Hatsu had found Ozawa and helped tend to her injuries. Once she had drunk her fill and rehydrated, she was almost as good as new. Kaga had been able to patch himself up, keeping his bleeding under control. However, the same could not be said for Sawano, who had succumbed to his wounds. Fiona and the others stood around his body as they took a moment to bid farewell to their teammate. It was a strange custom to the others as the ninja from the Hidden Mist didn't usually do this. Fiona knew this well and decided to keep it short. Once they were done Fiona made a few hand signs before placing a seal on Sawano's body. Body Disposal Jutsu, Fiona said as he activated it. The seal came alive and started to burn away at Sawano's body until nothing but ashes were left. The Umbu tracking unit used this jutsu to ensure the enemy would not be able to get their hands on any of their remains if they failed a mission. So what now Captain Yuki? Hatsu asked. The others also wondering the same thing. Fiona turned to face his squad. The sunset was shining in the distance, its glow blocked by Fiona's frame letting his aura glow. I think it is time to activate my emergency plan, Fiona said. The others looked confused and Kaga spoke up. What do you mean emergency plan captain? He said. We need to get the princess back to the land of water ASAP. This place will be crawling with enemy sand ninja before long. Fiona said. The others agreed. They had found out that Fiona had in fact defeated the Kazakage, a feat that was extremely impressive and almost unheard of. Hatsu and Ozawa, I have a new mission for the two of you, Fiona said, causing Ozawa to snap to attention suddenly. I need the two of you to return to the capital city and inform the daimyo of what has happened here. Once done, you are to return to the Hidden Mist Village at once. Fiona said, crossing his arms. Ozawa nodded quickly, yes, Captain. She said. Hatsu nodded before speaking. What about the rest of the princess's caravan captain? He asked. Fiona acknowledged his question. Inform the daimyo that he is to offer an escort for them back to the land of water. It's too risky for the two of you to escort them back yourselves. Fiona said. They will be safe in the capital for the time being. I will escort the princess back home along with Kaga so his injuries can be tended to. Fiona said. The others all agreed to the plan but couldn't help notice Fiona's serious tone of voice. Hatsu nodded to Fiona and bid farewell. Just before he and Ozawa turned to leave Fiona said one last thing. Hatsu, Ozawa. Be careful, as of now. We are at war with the Hidden Sand Village. Chapter 28 Fiona had returned the princess back to the land of water. He had also delivered Kaga back safely to recover from his wounds, getting him to the hospital in a hidden mist. Thanks to his new teleportation abilities, Fiona was able to make short work of the journey. He had already left seals in his apartment, meaning that once activated, it created an ice mirror for him to link with another, allowing him to slip through the two of them like a wormhole. 
Fiona had first tested it out on Hatsu for long distance and soon found that he could activate his seals from anywhere, virtually allowing him to travel from one side of the globe to the other through his ice mirrors in an instant. Sure it wasn't as impressive as the fourth Hokage's flying Raijin. But still, it was extremely useful. Fiona had ordered Kaga to report to the Mizukage once his wounds had been tended to, while he let the princess rest in his apartment. The land of water's capital city was not far from the hidden mist village, and Fiona would escort the princess there himself once she woke up. While she was still unconscious, he decided it was best that he took a shower. After all, they were far from danger now as no one knew they were even there. Fiona turned the shower on and stripped his exhausted clothing onto the cold tiled floor. His body was beaten and bruised after his battle with the Kazakage, and if not for his increased healing factor thanks to Saikin, he would be feeling one hell of a lot of pain right now. He stepped into the shower and let the hot water wash away the sweat and dirt. He could still feel bits of sand and gold dust washing down his body and out of his hair. Looks like going to the beach is the same in both worlds. He thought to himself. You always bring it home with you. He said out loud with a small chuckle. Fiona was laughing a little longer than he should have been and realized how crazy things had gotten since his arrival in this world. He basked in the hot water for just a little longer before getting out of the shower. The mirror had steamed over thanks to the heat, Fiona wrapped a towel around his waist and wiped his hand over the condensation on the mirror to look at his reflection. Looking at his reflection for what seemed the longest time. His body was going through a lot of changes. His muscles were starting to grow. He was beginning to grow more body hair, and most of all, he was starting to get a couple of spots. Thankfully a little medical ninjutsu seemed to clear them right up allowing for clear skin. Very convenient. Fiona decided he had spent enough time in the bathroom. It was time to get dressed and ready to escort the princess back to her father. Fiona opened the bathroom door, to his surprise, he came face to face with the princess who was now awake. See Caption Yuki. She shouted as her eyes opened wide, realizing who he was. She leapt at him wrapping her arms around his body squeezing tight. I just knew you would rescue me. I just knew it. She shouted, tears coming to her eyes. Fiona was quite shocked as he had not known she was even there, thanks to him letting his thoughts cloud his senses. He put his arms around her and just let her cry for a moment. She pulled away to look at him, taking her only a moment to realize that Fiona was dressed in nothing but a towel that was wrapped around his waist. The princess started to go a little red in the face before she pushed away from him, giving a small yelp as she tripped on something. Fiona quickly grabbed her wrist and pulled her back to her feet, saving her from falling over. The two of them locking eyes for a moment before she looked away. I better get dressed, Fiona said. The princess nodded as she took a look at his body before looking away once more. She was no longer the confident, flirtatious princess she had been before. Now she seemed shy as if she was hiding her feelings. Fiona didn't pay it any attention after all, she was still a child in his eyes. Yes, that would be best. The princess said, taking another look before looking away once more. Fiona pulled out another hidden mist uniform, of course, he had quite a few spares. Once dressed, Fiona walked back into the living room where the princess was waiting for him. She was sat with one leg crossed behind the other and her back was perfectly straight. Fiona cleared his throat, getting her attention. All right, princess, are you ready to go home? Fiona said, smiling at her. She nodded and stood to her feet. Lead the way, Captain Yuki. She said with a determined face. On the way back to the capital Fiona told the princess that all of her maids and servants were safe, that his team had gotten them to safety. The princess was relieved to hear it as she voiced her concern about the hidden sand coming after her. Fiona reassured her that she was safe now and that they would not be able to reach her in the land of water. But what if that Kazakage decides to come after me again? She shouted, still sounding worried. Fiona placed a hand on her shoulder as he looked her in the eyes. He will not be coming after you anymore, princess. I promise you that, Fiona said, his words giving her confidence. Once that was over, Fiona escorted her in secret back to the capital of the land of water. 
He wanted to make sure nobody would recognize her as he only wanted the Mizukich to find out when Kaga informed him. Lucky nobody had seen them and Fiona made it to the capital with the princess without any more trouble. Once there, he allowed her to take her head down and the two of them headed towards the palace where they were met by the guards who immediately ran over to her. It's the princess! One of them shouted. Princess Mizuko! You are alive! Another shouted as they escorted her inside without hesitation. Where is my father? She demanded not answering one of their questions. The guards shut their mouths and nodded. This way, princess. They said as they escorted her to the daimyo's chambers. The daimyo was currently surrounded by his advisors, shouting about what had happened in the land of wind. Of course, word had already reached their ears and the daimyo sounded outraged. Their words were cut short as the doors opened as the princess walked through, her presence demanding the attention of everyone inside. Mizuko! The daimyo shouted in disbelief. Father! She shouted as the two of them ran to one another, the daimyo embracing his daughter in a massive hug. Oh, my dear Mizuko! You are alive! He said, grabbing her shoulders so he could get a good look at her. I'm fine, father she said with a small smile. I just got the news. The hidden sand ninja attack you. He shouted, examining her body for any injuries. Did they hurt you? He asked, getting angry once again. No father, I am unharmed thanks to my shinobi bodyguards. She said, looking at Fiona. All of the advisors started chatting amongst themselves as they examined Fiona. The daimyo also looked over to Fiona and nodded to him. You have my gratitude, young shinobi. The daimyo said before he sat back down in his chair. Summon the war council. I also want the mizukich here at once. He shouted, slamming his fist down hard onto the large oak table, getting the attention of everyone in the large hall. Sometime later. The daimyo had put out a summons for his war council, calling every political leader in the land of water to attend, including the Mizuki Jigura. He sat on one end of the large round oak table accompanied by Fiona, while all of the others sat around the outside with the daimyo at the opposite end. Full word had spread about the battle in the land of wind, which had resulted in the death of the fourth Kazakage by Fiona's hand. However, the main issue was that the land of water and land of wind was supposed to enter into a peace treaty, which the Kazakage had broken to try and kidnap Princess Mizuko. The daimyo of the land of water was outraged by this and demanded that the land of water go to war with the hidden sand village. My lord, I have his lordship of the land of wind on the line for you. One of the advisors said above the shouting that was currently going on. Put him on, the daimyo said as everyone went quiet waiting to see what happened. A large television of some sort was wheeled into the room and set up so that everyone could see it. The screen flashed to life and a picture of the daimyo to the land of wind could be seen. Is it on? The man shouted before he looked into the camera on his side. Can you see me? He asked. Yes, I can see you. The daimyo of the land of water said. Good. First off allow me to give my apologies about this whole ordeal. The wind daimyo said, seeming sincere. I want you to know that I had nothing to do with this. In fact, I had only just finished discussing the terms of our agreement with your sweet daughter Mizuko. How is she by the way? He asked. The water daimyo leant forwards in his chair, interlocking his fingers together as he spoke. I thank you for your words in this challenging time my old friend. Of course, I have had all of the details thus far and am confident that the Kazakage acted alone for his own gain. The wind daimyo nodded and leaned back in his chair. Yes, and the fool paid for it with his life. That being said, you can understand my frustration at the whole ordeal. The water daimyo said, sighing. Let me stop you there, old friend. The wind daimyo said. Before you go any further, what more are you looking to gain? Your daughter is home safe and sound, the Kazakage of my country is dead. Don't tell me you are seeking what I think you are. There was a moment of silence as everyone in the room waited for the water daimyo to speak. Suddenly, the Mizukage stood from his seat, 
raising his voice over the water daimyo. The daimyo looked at the mizukage in outrage but quickly shut his mouth at the hard gaze Yagura gave him. I think what the daimyo here is trying to say is that he is simply hurt that something like this would happen under your watch. I personally think justice has already been served and that we should use this as a stepping stone to learn from. Everyone in the room was shocked, including Fiona. It was certainly not like the Mizukich to turn down the opportunity for war and Fiona couldn't help but wonder why. Thank you for your words, Lord Mizukich. The wind daimyo also said, sounding interested. The water daimyo was about to object, but he was cut off once again by the Mizukich who ended the call with the wind daimyo. What is the meaning of this Lord Mizukich? The daimyo shouted. Yagura simply crossed his arms as he sat back down. War is not an option right now. We do not have the manpower or resources. Not to mention, once a war starts the other great nations will soon be at our doorstep. We have already achieved victory with the death of the fourth Kazakage. The water daimyo had to admit he hadn't thought of all of that. But he still was not happy about the Mizukage stepping on his toes. Very well. All that matters is that Mizuko is safe and that the Kazakage paid with his life he said, taking the high ground. Yagura nodded with a smile. Now if we are done I have matters to attend to. He said, standing once more. It was very noticeable that his presence seemed to put all of the nobles on edge, including the daimyo. But it was clear that he used that to his advantage. Very well. The water daimyo said as he too stood from his seat. I bid you farewell he said before turning and leaving the room with his daughter. Mizuko looked at Fiona one last time and whispered something into her father's ear. He turned to look at Fiona and gave her a nod as he walked out of the room with his advisors. Mizuko walked over to Fiona, who was stood next to the Mizukage. Yagura noticed her and then looked to Fiona with a smile. Make it quick, he said as he walked away. Fiona nodded and turned to face the princess. I just wanted to say thank you again, Captain Yuki. She said, looking a little sheepish. Fiona nodded and smiled at her. Please, Princess Mizuko. It was my honor. Also, call me Fiona. He said with a small bow. The princess bowed lower than he did as a sign of respect for saving her life. If there is ever anything I can do for you, Captain. I mean, Fiona. Please do not hesitate to ask. After all, I owe my life to you. Fiona nodded and went on to say his farewell before he walked back over to the Mizukage who was waiting for him outside of the Daimyo's estate. Fiona appeared next to him, giving him a slight nod. Sorry for making you wait, Lord Mizukage. Yagura pushed off against the wall he was leaning on and gave Fiona a stern look. We have a lot to discuss, Fiona he said, turning his back for him to follow. Time skip. Once Fiona and the Mizukage had finished up at the Daimyo's estate, they returned to the hidden mist village and Fiona found himself in Yagura's office to give a full debrief of the mission. Of course, Kaga had already given him as much detail as he could, but now it was time for him to hear it from the horse's mouth. The Mizukage seemed unimpressed about how the mission had gone and even more so once he told him what happened with the Kazakage. Fiona felt as if he was being scolded as if he was a student getting told off by a teacher, and he didn't like it. Although defeating the Kazakage in battle is no small feat, you leave me with no choice but to place you under house arrest. You will be stripped of your umbu rank and placed on normal duties. Fiona was shocked, to say the least, and looked up at Yagura. But Lord Mizukage, he would have taken the princess if I didn't. Do not talk back to me. Yagura shouted as he let his aura flare to life. Fiona had to admit that his killing intent was no joke and he decided to bite his tongue for now. Yagura sighed as he let his aura settle down, taking a seat in his chair as he did so. You have to understand, Fiona. This is for your own good. Because of what you have done, your name will spread across the great nations like wildfire. You will become the target of assassination attempts as the sand look for revenge over their fallen kage. The death of Akage is not taken lightly. For that reason, I have to keep you in the village so I can keep an eye on you. Fiona could kind of understand when he put it like that, 
but he was still not happy about being under house arrest. Still, what choice did he have? Yagura finished giving Fiona a lecture and the room went silent. Just tell me you understand and won't do anything without my say-so for a while, Yagura said. Fiona nodded and bowed his head. I understand, Lord Mizukic. Very well, you are dismissed, he said, watching Fiona as he up and walked out of his office. As the door closed, Yagura's eyes suddenly turned red as they reflected the Sharingdon and the shadow of a man appeared behind him, dressed in a dark robe with an orange mask that had black stripes across it. I will certainly be keeping an eye on this one, he said before fading back into the darkness from whence he came. Chapter 29 Six months had gone by since Fiona had been placed under house arrest. It may have been called house arrest, but it was more like village arrest. Fiona had been stripped of his umbu command and rank, being placed on regular duties so that the Mizukic could keep an eye on him. He was allowed to roam the village freely but was forbidden to leave. The Mizukic had also assigned a small squad of umbu to keep tabs on him, but Fiona spent most of his time keeping them confused about his whereabouts. For the last six months, Fiona had spent his time training to hone his abilities, but he had to say that not being allowed to leave the village was starting to drive him crazy. He would come up with little things now and again to keep himself entertained, though his favorite at the moment was to slip away from the umbu only to give them hints of his whereabouts, almost like a game of hide and seek. But even that got boring after a while. Fiona was also still allowed to see his old team and friends. He had become very close to Hatsu and Kaga ever since the incident with the Kazakage. Speaking of which, the hidden sand had not taken the event lightly. They had already sent assassins after Fiona, but each of them had fallen to his blade. The amount became less and less until they seemed to stop coming altogether. Fiona's reputation was becoming more and more infamous as time went on, especially as he continued to avoid and kill each assassin that was sent his way. They had also elected the fifth Kazakage. If Fiona remembered correctly, her name was Pakura of the Scorch style. He wasn't sure of how it worked in the hidden sand, but apparently, she was only acting Kage until a particular clan was of age. Which Fiona assumed was Gara, who was about two years old at this point. But of course, as usual, most of Fiona's time was put into his training. Mostly Fiona had been working on his control of Saiken's chakra other than that he had been doing the usual. Taijutsu practice, chakra control, and utilizing his keki jinkai into his fighting style. Fiona's shikatsu miyaku had become second nature, and he could use it as easy as moving his fingers. Fiona had also poured so much time into his ice style that he had even come up with a few more jutsu as well as improving on all of his others. But he still felt that something was missing. During one of his long meditation sessions, Fiona had an idea come to him. Sage mode. He thought as his eyes snapped open. He knew that Naruto could use sage mode thanks to his summoning the toads of Mount Maiboku. Even Orochimaru could access sage jutsu thanks to his snake summoning. So that begged the question to if Fiona's own summoning could help him. Well, I guess it's time to give these umbu the slip again. He said as he made the hand signs. Reverse summoning jutsu. He said as he placed his hand on the floor of his apartment, disappearing in a poof of white smoke. Fiona opened his eyes, finding himself in the land of his summoning creature, Fuyu. It was always freezing, and the snow was blowing in so strong you could barely see in front of yourself. Thankfully Fiona knew his way around and made his way through the thick snow towards Fuyu's cave. Fuyu! Fiona shouted as he entered. It was quiet for a moment before the large yeti appeared from the darkness, surprised to see Fiona. Fiona, is that you? He asked, his tone deep. Yes, old friend, how are your injuries? Fiona asked, remembering Fuyu had helped him battle against the fourth Kazakage. Fuyu grabbed his large bicep as he flexed in good health. Don't you worry about me. I'm as strong as ever. Takes more than that guy to put me down for good, speaking of which. You won, right? Fuyu said with his deep voice. Fiona smiled as he crossed his arms over his chest. I did. But it was not easy. Fiona said. 
Fuyu burst out laughing as he slammed his fist off the floor. You don't say. That's what happens when you fight someone of Katya level. The two of them laughed a little before it went silent once more. So tell me, Fiona, why are you here? It's not like you to just pop in for a visit. Fuyu asked with a questioning look. Fiona stood back to his feet as he placed his hands by his sides. Nothing gets past you, Fuyu. He said with a smile. But you are right. I'll cut to the chase. Fiona said, looking Fuyu in the eye. I have come to ask if you know anything about Sage Jutsu, Fiona asked. Fuyu looked a little puzzled at first but then gave a monstrous laugh. Sage Jutsu! He shouted between laughing. Once he was done, he looked down at Fiona with a serious expression. Now where did you hear about such a thing? He asked. Fiona was surprised at Fuyu's question and was quick to answer with a lie. I overheard some of the elders talking about how the first Hokage of the Leaf could use such a power, rendering him almost invincible. I didn't know who else to ask. Fuyu seemed to buy Fiona's story and took the bait. Hmm. It is true I know of Sage Jutsu. However, I cannot use it myself. Fiona seemed disappointed but tried his best to hide it. What can you tell me about it? He asked quickly. Fuyu sighed and stood slowly to his full height. I can tell you aren't going to give up on this without a fight. If that is the case, I will take you to someone who knows much more than I, Fiona. I may not look it, but I am only thirty years old and am still young among my kind. Fuyu said, surprising Fiona. Really? I had no idea. Does that mean there are more of your kind? Fiona asked. Fuyu nodded as he crossed his arms. I think it is time you meet the elder little Fiona. Fiona nodded as Fuyu turned around. Hop on, kid. He said, patting his shoulder for Fiona to jump onto. Fiona did just that and jumped high up onto Fuyu's massive hairy shoulder. Fuyu walked deeper into the cave and deeper into the darkness. Fiona's eyes struggled to adjust, but as they approached the end of the cave, they came face to face with a giant ice wall. What is this? Fiona asked as he reached out to touch the ice. Fuyu chuckled. This is the door. He said as he placed his massive hand onto it. Suddenly the solid ice started to ripple as if it was water. Only members of my kind can enter through this ice. It's how we have survived for so long. Fuyu said as he looked at Fiona. Are you ready? Fuyu said as he stepped into the ice, passing through it like a portal. Fiona had to shield his eyes as the level of light changed once more becoming very bright. As he opened his eyes, he was met by a beautiful snowy mountain peak with a village spread around it. There were a number of other yeti going about their business, but Fiona noticed that none of them was as large as Fuyu. Is this real? I have never heard of such a place existing. Fiona said. Fuyu walked down the large stone steps that passed the shrine that was on the other side of the ice wall, heading down into the village. Just because you have never heard of something before, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. As Fuyu walked into the village, he was met with praise and greeted by every other yeti that was there as if he was some kind of hero. He greeted each of them, and all of them showed surprise at Fiona's presence. Each of them was large standing at least ten feet tall, but none of them even came close to Fuyu's height. They really seem to like you, Fuyu, Fiona said. Fuyu smiled as he continued to make his way through the village. Well, I am what you would call a warrior of my kind. I am tasked with guarding the ice gate. It is something of a great honor of my kind. The large yeti said as he carried on walking through the village. He approached another large set of steps that seemed to go all the way to the top of the mountain and started to make his way up them. Fiona decided to stay quiet for the time being and just watch. The view was terrific and Fiona was still amazed about this whole thing. Even with all of his knowledge from his other life, he had never known of such a place. He guessed there were still many mysteries about this world that he had never seen before. As he and Fuyu approached the top of the steps, Fiona could see two large pillars that had opened flames on top of them. A large shrine had been built into the mountain's peak and on either side of the large door stood two more powerful-looking yeti. 
Each of them noticed Fiona on Fuyu's shoulder and readied their Susumina to attack him. What is the meaning of this Fuyu? One of them shouted. Fiona noticed that both of the Yeti in front of him were each the same size as Fuyu, one of them had a large scar across his face and Fiona could tell each of them were battle-hardened. Calm yourselves, Kori and Mofubuki. This is Fiona Yuki. Fuyu said with his arms raised. Both of the Yeti slowly lowered their weapons with a questioning look. Did you say, Yuki? Kori said. That's right. I have brought him to meet with the Elder. Fuyu said. Both of the large Yeti seemed to relax and placed the butts of their Susuma back onto the ground. Very well, Fuyu, you may pass, Kori said. Could have given us a little notice, eh? The other one said as he cracked his knuckles. Let's do this, Kori! The large Yeti shouted as both of them turned around and started pushing as hard as they could on the massive doors, forcing the ice that had frozen them shut to break. Fiona could tell that both the Yeti were trying their hardest, using all of their strength to push the doors open as their muscles bulged. Arg! Both of them yelled as they continued to push as hard as they could. Do they need some help? Fiona asked. Fuyu scoffed at Fiona's question. There is only one among us that can open these doors alone. Who is that? Fiona asked. You are about to find out, Fuyu said as the doors finally started to slide along the floor and opened, the heavy doors screeching along the stone tabs on the floor before hitting the inner walls signaling they had fully opened. Both Yeti were breathing hard now as they walked back outside huffing and puffing. Fiona could see that small oil lamps lit the inner hall and at the very end was a large shrine with a throne made of solid ice. Fuyu entered the hall and sat on his knees as he told Fiona to jump off his shoulder and do the same. Of course, he did and took a kneeling position next to the twenty-foot yeti next to him. The room seemed so much larger now as he waited for what came next. Heavy footsteps caught his attention and he could only imagine what kind of insanely powerful monster could be the leader of this clan of yeti. The footsteps got closer and closer as whoever was causing them got closer. The anticipation was killing Fiona, but he was able to hold the urge in and wait. To Fiona's surprise, a small hairy little white yeti with a walking stick appeared. The creature was even shorter than he was, its back was hunched and it had two small horns on its head. Fuyu bowed, placing his head onto the stone floor paying his respect to the small yeti. Fuyu noticed that Fiona didn't bow and poked him with his large finger, pressing him down to the ground. Now, now Fuyu pick yourself up. The old yeti said as he hopped up onto the large throne with surprising grace. Fiona also lifted his head off the floor as Fuyu introduced him. Great Elder Hyoketsu. This is Fiona Yuki. Fuyu said. The Elder Yeti's feet were dangling from the massive throne he was sat on as he looked over to Fiona seeming amused. My oh my. I haven't seen a member of the Yuki clan since little Shimo. I thought they were all dead, he said, hopping off his seat. He sort me out with the reverse summoning Jutsu Great Elder. After I deemed him worthy, I allowed him to sign a contract with myself. Fuyu said, still sitting on his knees. The old yeti was stood right in front of Fiona now as he examined him, prodding him with his walking stick. This one looks strong, Hayoketsu said. Must be if he was able to defeat you in battle little Fuyu. He continued to say. Shimo was my grandfather. Although I didn't know him well. Fiona said, speaking up. Hayoketsu pulled his hair from over his bright blue eyes to get a better look at Fiona. Ah. Now that you mention it, I can see him in you. Hayoketsu said as he started to sniff Fiona taking in his scent. It would seem you have also brought along something else. Something you carry inside of you, young Fiona. The little yeti said. Fiona seemed stunned, and Saiken's voice snapped him out of it. He can sense me, Fiona, Saiken said. Fiona concentrated a little so he could enter his inner world to speak to Saiken. What do you mean he can sense you? He asked. Do you think you can chat amongst yourselves without me being able to see? Hayoketsu said as he was sat in the snow inside Fiona's inner world surprising both him and Saiken. Fiona opened his eyes and jumped back away from the small yeti almost on guard. 
Fuyu seemed very surprised at his reaction and stood to his feet. However, Hayoketsu waved his walking stick, signing for him to stay out of it. How did you do that? Fiona asked, confused. Hayoketsu smiled a toothy smile, his large fangs showing through his hair. Why don't you just ask what you have come to ask little Fiona? I take it you are here to learn how to use sage jutsu? Hayoketsu said, placing both hands on the top of his walking stick. Fiona was again surprised but decided to relax just a little deciding he should cut to the chase. Very well. I asked for you to bring me here so that I could learn about sage jutsu. Hayoketsu turned his back, taking a few steps away before turning to face Fiona once again. There was only one other human that has ever asked me to teach them sage jutsu. That was your grandfather Shimo. I will give you the same test that I gave him. If you pass, I will teach you how to use sage jutsu, but if you fail, you will never be able to access nature energy. Hayoketsu said as he allowed his walking stick to drop to the floor. Fiona took only a moment to think about what the elder said to him, but Fuyu spoke up not able to stay quiet any longer. This is not an easy path, Fiona. Please, you must think about this seriously. You only get one chance and even then if your body isn't strong enough, you will not be able to learn it in the first place. The elder Yeti gave a small chuckle before waving his hand towards Fuyu. Be quiet and let the child make up his own mind. Fuyu bit his tongue instantly going quiet as the elder ordered, leaving Fiona in silence to think about his decision. I accept, Fiona said as he looked into the elder's eyes, his determination blazing like a small fire in a blizzard. Very well. Just so you know, little Shimo failed this test, Hayoketsu said as he suddenly struck the air with his small fist. The force he generated sent a huge shockwave through the air that smashed into Fiona so hard that the force sent him flying. The attack was so fast that Fiona hadn't even seen it coming. The blast carried him through the air and slammed him into the massive doors, both of them slamming open due to Fiona hitting them so hard. Fiona hit the floor hard and rolled down the solid stone steps before finally stopping still. His body felt as if it had been hit by a train and it took him a moment before he could even see straight. Saiken's voice was ringing in his ears over and over again as Fiona tried to pull himself up. But the blast had done more than just hurt him physically. It had also drained him of all of his chakra. Fiona, you must wake up. Saiken shouted. Fiona was finally able to stand, but the effort felt as if it drained the rest of his energy. Saiken. I need some chakra. He said through struggling breaths. I'm trying, Fiona but it doesn't seem to be working. The tailed beast said seeming worried. Fiona's eyes opened wide as he forced himself to climb back up the large stone steps towards the doors he had been blasted out of. Once he finally reached the top, he was met by Cory and Emmo Fabuki who seemed to be looking at him very surprised. Looks like I owe you dinner, Cory. Emmo Fabuki said, looking at his friend. This one will fail just like the last. Emo Fabuki said slamming his weapon but into the ground. Fiona was pissed now and he tried to pull out Saiken's chakra by force. However, it didn't seem to be working. I am sorry Fiona, but it doesn't seem like I can give you any of my chakra. It's as if something is stopping me from inside your own body. What did that bastard do to me? Fiona shouted as he slammed his fist down onto the ground in frustration. Both Cory and Imofabuki watched him with interest. Come on, kid. Didn't the old man tell you anything? Cory said. What do you mean? Fiona asked almost sound desperate. You always do this, Cory. Imofabuki said, crossing his arms over his giant chest. Come on, Imofabuki. It could make things more interesting. Cory said as he crouched down to speak to Fiona. Look kid. You can't use any chakra, right? Fiona nodded, still confused. And the only way to get it back is to get through these doors back to the old man, right? Fiona took a moment to think about it and nodded. Right, he said. But there is another way. You see, if you decide you can no longer pursue this endeavor of yours, all you have to do is leave through the giant ice wall. Once you pass through it, all of your chakra will be restored. But be warned. 
You will never be able to pass through into this realm again. Fiona didn't speak as the words from the giant yeti sunk in hard. This is what the old man meant by you only have one chance, Fiona thought. He looked up past the large yeti to the doors. Now the only question was how he was supposed to open them by himself when even the giant yeti struggled to do it together. This was the test. This would determine how far he could go in this world. This would determine whether he could obtain the power to achieve his goals. Or whether he would let it crush them. Chapter 30 Fiona pulled himself up off his knees as he tried to muster the strength to stand. The wind blew hard as the chill in the air bit his cheeks. He was still breathing hard, trying to catch his breath, his lungs burning from the cold air. I can do this. He muttered. Both of the large yeti stared down at him, each noting his determination. Looks like he's gonna try Cory. Emofabuki said with a small smile. Fiona suddenly burst forwards into a sprint, planting his hands onto the massive doors as he tried to open them with all of his might. Arg! Fiona screamed as the veins in his head bulged, looking as if they would burst. Well, the kid sure has guts. I'll give him that, Corey said, looking down as he gave a sign. They both watched for a while as Fiona continued to push and push until his body had almost burned out. Corey turned to his fellow Yeti, smiling at him. Think we should tell him? He said as he shrugged his shoulders. Emofabuki crossed his arms as he pretended not to care. Do what you want, Corey. I don't care. Fiona had finally burned out now, his face bright red from his effort. He felt exhausted, and his muscles were burning and throbbing in pain. Having no chakra made him realize just how weak he was without it, making him feel powerless. Fiona fell to his knees as he tried to catch his breath. It's impossible. I can't open these blasted doors. He said, his anger getting the better of him. Corey walked over to him, sighing as he knelt to get a better look at Fiona. Look, kid. You can't open these doors with brute strength alone. Why do you think the old man sealed your chakra away? Corey said as he pulled Fiona to his feet. Use your head, Yuki child. You must know the answer by now. Fiona let the Yeti's words sink in for a moment before the answer slapped him right in the face. Sage Mode Fiona realized now that only with Sage Jutsu could he open the doors and get his chakra back. Now the only question was how he would go about learning Sage Mode. Suddenly the doors flung open, and Fiona was blasted back by the force alone. It sent him flying towards the massive set of stairs. However, he was saved by Cory as he grabbed the back of his shirt, stopping him from falling down them. Hayoketsu slowly walked out of the hall, the massive doors closing behind him. Sorry about that. Sometimes I forget my own strength. The little yeti said, giving a small chuckle. Cory put Fiona back onto the ground, and he dusted himself off. What the hell is with this old geezer? He thought. Hayoketsu walked over to Fiona, so you know now that you can only open these doors with the use of natural energy, little Yuki. The old yeti said. Fiona was about to speak, but Hayoketsu started to walk down the large steps as if he was ignoring him. Wait! Fiona shouted as he ran after him. Please teach me how to use sage mode. I can't give up. Fiona shouted, almost begging. Hayoketsu turned to study him and gave a long pause before he answered. I will teach you how to use Sage Jutsu, little Yuki. But I promise you it will not be easy. With that said, he turned and started to walk down the steps, beckoning Fiona to follow him. Time passes. Fiona had followed Hayoketsu down the mountain until they reached a frozen lake. The old yeti didn't say much of anything and Fiona had to wonder what the hell they were doing here. Wondering what we are doing here yet? Hayoketsu said as if reading his mind. Fiona had to say that it did seem strange, but so far, everything the old yeti had done was just that. Now then, little Yuki, Hayoketsu said, turning to face him. Your first test is to cross this frozen lake and fetch me my walking cane. Without it, I might fall. Fiona looked at the old yeti. But your walking cane is in your hand. Fiona said, pointing to it. 
Is that right? Hyokitsu said as he suddenly tossed the stick all the way over to the other side of the lake, where it stuck into the snow. Of course. Fiona thought, wanting to slap himself in the face. He turned to look across the ice weighing up the distance with just a glance. Fiona took his first step onto the frozen lake, testing the ice's strength to see if it would hold his weight. So far, so good. The ice was holding under Fiona's weight as he took each step with grace. He was starting to wonder just how this would help him learn sage mode, but he had guessed maybe it was just a test before they started the real training. Even so, Fiona wouldn't let his guard down. Fiona took another step and suddenly, the ice cracked under his foot. He froze on the spot as he tried to distribute his weight onto his other leg. However, the ice under his other foot cracked as he did. Oh shit! He said as the ice beneath him gave way and he fell into the freezing cold water. Fiona slowly pulled himself out of the water, shivering as he stood. The air was so cold that his wet clothes had almost frozen in an instant. If not for his bloodline ability and resistance to the cold, Fiona's body would have already given into hypothermia. You will have to try harder than that if you don't want to fall in. Hyoketsu shouted, chuckling. Fiona wasn't pleased and turned around, ready to keep moving across the ice. Laugh it up, old man. Fiona said, looking down at the ice once more. This time, Fiona decided to break into a sprint, thinking that he wouldn't fall in if he didn't give the ice time to break. He was still moving quickly even with his chakra sealed, his lungs were burning from the cold air, but he continued to push as hard as he could. The ice started cracking under his feet. Each time his feet moved, the ice gave way, seeming as if it was chasing after him. Fiona could see that the breaking ice was catching up with him. Deciding that he had to act swiftly, he jumped, avoiding the ice-cold water and landing on a small piece of ice that was floating. Fiona had managed not to fall into the water, but now he was stuck on a small floating island of ice with nowhere to go. Didn't think that one turn now, did you little Yuki? Hyoketsu shouted, mocking him once again. Without his chakra, Fiona was helpless at the moment. He had no way to jump off of the ice without landing in the water. He knew this and so decided to take the plunge into the freezing cold before climbing out onto a fresh sheet of ice. He was breathing hard now, his body working on overdrive to try and keep warm. He could tell something was off. Typical, the cold would have never bothered him. I forgot to mention little Yuki. Even though you possess the Yuki clan's blood and are resistant to even freezing temperatures, these waters are different. A normal person not of Yuki blood would have died as soon as they fell into this water. However, with your blood, you should be able to withstand it about three or four times before you die. Fiona was shocked and turned around, enraged. What? He shouted. The old yeti just smiled before waving his hands. Now. Now don't get all stroppy. Hurry up and fetch my cane. Fiona knew he had no choice. He was already halfway across the lake and his chances were about the same either way. However, he had to choose between giving up and learning sage mode. Fiona took another look over towards Hyoketsu, who gave him a toothy grin and then over towards the cane. Looks like it's do or die. He said quietly under his breath. Fiona closed his eyes and filled his lungs with the freezing air. I can do this. I have to. Fiona said as he took another step. The ice cracked under his foot again and he winced. Blast it. Fiona thought as he looked down at the ice. What am I supposed to do? Every time I take a step, this bloody ice cracks on me. Come on, Fiona think. What should I do? Think damn it think. Fiona thought as he closed his eyes, trying to think. His mind was blank as he tried to draw in anything that he thought could help him now. Suddenly the memory of Naruto's sage mode training entered his mind. He remembered that in order for him to draw in nature energy, he had to remain still. The only question now was how did that apply to this exercise? Be one with nature. Fiona suddenly thought, his eyes popping open. I have to be on with nature he said, looking down at his feet. He took another deep breath as he tried to let his body relax. 
Again and again, he took more deep breaths, allowing all of his worries to fade into the cold. Fiona lifted his leg, taking another step, slowly placing his foot onto to the ice. This time the ice didn't crack and so he moved again, slowly and gracefully, until it seemed he was gliding across the ice. Hayoketsu looked on from a distance, impressed, to say the least, that Fiona had managed to figure out what he needed to do. That boy. Maybe he stands a chance. Fiona had now reached the other side and took a step onto the snowy bank's safety off of the ice. Walking over, he picked up the cane and turned to face Hayoketsu, waving the cane at him to emphasize that he had got it. Hayoketsu smiled and clapped his hands together. Not bad, little Yuki, not bad. He shouted over, his voice surprising clear from the other side of the lake. Now comes the real challenge. Make it back before there is no ice. Hayoketsu said, cracking his knuckles. Fiona was once again confused as to what he meant. What do you mean? He asked. Hayoketsu slowly walked over to the edge of the frozen lake taking his time, of course. He lifted his arm into the air and smashed his fist down onto the ice, causing a massive crack to form, splitting the ice that covered the lake in half. Fiona now knew what the old Yeti meant and he was starting to panic. Oh, crap! He shouted as all of the ice started to break apart as the water became violent from Hayoketsu's strike. Fiona had no choice and made a break for it, dashing as fast as he could from one bit of ice to the other. He had no time to think about it, no time to be one with nature, he just had to haul it as fast as possible or be swallowed by the icy waters below. Fiona flipped and jumped, trying his best not to slip on the ice. His footing was everything now and if he didn't play it right, what was left of the ice would break and drop him into the water. Fiona jumped onto another piece of solid ice and started to run. Suddenly the ice split and he was forced to stop, skidding all the way to the edge. The lake was getting more and more violent now as the waves started to grow larger. His next footing was a long jump away and he wasn't sure if he could make it, but with the size of the wave that was heading for him, he didn't have much choice. Fiona jumped, pushing off with his legs as hard as he could, willing himself to make the jump. However, it was too far as it looked like he was about to hit the water. A small sheet of ice suddenly floated to the surface of the water, Fiona could tell it wasn't strong enough to hold his weight and it left him with only one option. One with nature. He thought as he tried his best to relax his body, his foot hitting the ice. Fiona used the same foot to push off the ice hard and with perfect timing, allowing him to spring over the remaining water onto the safety of more ice. I made it! He shouted as he skidded along the ice before jumping onto the bank, where he dropped to his back, trying to catch his breath. Hayoketsu slowly walked over to his and Fiona lifted his arm in the air holding the cane up for the small yeti to see. Well done, little Yuki, well done. I wasn't sure if you would make it there, but hey ho. The yeti said as he took his cane and started walking off slowly. What the hell? Fiona shouted as he stood up, still trying to catch his breath. Hayoketsu turned around slowly. I thought I warned you this wouldn't be easy. Fiona remembered his words before they had started, he was still determined to finish his training and master sage mode. He knew it wouldn't be easy and had to deal with that. Now stop whining like a baby and follow me, Hayoketsu said as he continued to walk off. Fiona slowly pulled himself up and started to follow him, giving a small laugh as he did. I'm not whining, he said under his breath. Fiona followed Hayoketsu back into the village, where they entered a large wooden cabin. He couldn't help notice that all of the other yeti stood so much taller than Hayoketsu and younger. All of them showed him mountains of respect wherever he went, all of them seeming to wait on his hand and feet. He never expected it and he was always kind to his younger yeti. Fiona was determined to find out his history one of these days. Hayoketsu has taken him to stay with Fuyu, who was charged with looking after him while he was not training. It was now mealtime. Moreover, Fiona was glad to hear it. Luckily they had special seats for small people so that they could fit around the huge table. Hayoketsu was also sat in such a chair on the huge table as he himself was only small like Fiona. Fuyu and it turns out Fuyu's wife had laid out a massive feast of all sorts of food for them. 
Fiona was more surprised that Fuyu had a wife, to be honest. They all sat around the table and started to eat, telling Fiona to dig in. Of course, he did so and stuffed his face full with as much as he could eat. I always say Fiona, it's the one who eats the most who will always win in a fight. Fuyu shouted between mouthfuls of food. His wife didn't seem impressed and instead turned to Fiona. So Fiona, Fuyu has told me much about you. How is your training going with Lord Hyoketsu? She asked. She was much smaller next to Fuyu but seemed just as well built with just as much hair. If not for the softer features, Fiona would honestly not have recognized she was a female yeti. The boy has much to learn. But he's not dead yet, so that's a plus. Hayoketsu said, interrupting. Fuyu's wife looked at Hayoketsu and gave a small smile. Now, now Lord Hayoketsu you mustn't joke about such things. She said, almost telling him off. The more Fiona got to know the old bastard, the more he reminded him of some crackpot old geezer. But he knew he was much, much more than that. Make sure you rest well tonight, little Yuki. Your training only gets tougher from here. The little yeti said, his eyes seeming intense. It didn't help the fact that everyone else in the room also became a little tense, as if they knew what was to come. Fiona decided to ask for you to see if he could work anything out. How come you can't use sage mode, Fuyu? Fiona asked. Fuyu almost choked on his food and he had to bang on his large chest with his fist. Once he recovered, he swallowed the food and took a deep breath, putting the large slab of meat back on his plate. To become a sage takes years of intense training and focus Fiona. Most who try usually don't make it and will. He seemed to struggle to get the rest of his words out. They die, Hayoketsu said, finishing Fuyu's sentence for him. Fiona didn't seem shocked and continued to eat his food. What about the ones that don't die? I mean, there must be more than one of you that can use sage mode? He asked. Fuyu laughed as he picked his food back up. We are a proud clan Fiona. Those of us who decide to take that path don't give up. Fuyu said, taking another large bite of his food. Fiona went quiet for a little while, taking a sip of his water. He remembered that Shimo, his grandfather, had apparently tried to learn the sage arts but had failed. Can you tell me what happened to Shimo? Fiona asked. Fuyu looked at him and then to Hayoketsu, who took a sip of his tea. Ah, yes. Where to begin with little Shimo? He said, placing his teacup back down. It was around twenty-five years ago now. Shimo was a young man, a great warrior among his people if I remember. He had proven himself among the Yuki clan earning the right to form a contract with our clan. Believe it or not, back then, we had a very close relationship. He said as he took another sip of his tea before he continued once again. Little Shimo seemed smarter than the others. He was very aware, always picking up on things faster than others. Then one day, he came to me to ask for power. A power that could help his clan and change the land of water for the better. If I remember correctly, it was not long after the First Great War. The world was hostile and battles raged everywhere, especially in the land of water. The Yuki clan were one of the more powerful clans at the time, but that made them a target. Others would form alliances to fight them. What is the saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend? Something like that. The old yeti said. Our kind were feared and battled hardened warriors. For such, we became a prize for others to slay. My father knew your grandfather well and fell in battle. Fuyu said with a heavy sigh. Fiona was astonished at what they were telling him. He had no idea about any of this and found it very interesting. So that's why you went into hiding? Fiona asked. Fuyu nodded. The more and more time that pasted, the more conflict that followed and soon our kind had taken many casualties, our home had been invaded, and we had no choice but to flee. Hayoketsu nodded, showing sorrow as he did. Those were dark times. He said, the air becoming heavy from the despair in the memories. Fiona decided to break the silence by asking more about Shimo. So what did Shimo do? He asked. 
Hayoketsu collected his thoughts and continued with his story. Yes. Little Shimo. He came to me asking for power, the kind of power that could change the Yuki clan and bring peace to the land of water. You see, little Shimo wanted to put an end to the fighting. He tried to raise up and stop the blood that had been spilled between clans. But his current powers and position could only sway others so far. But as I have said, trying to learn the arts of sage mode is no easy task. Little Shimo failed the tests and chose to leave, deeming that his life was not worth the risk. Hayoketsu said. After that, he promised that he would lock the secrets of summoning our clan away, only giving it to those who were worthy. We have not seen a member of the Yuki clan since. Until you appeared on my doorstep, asking the same as your grandfather. Hayoketsu said, giving a smile. Suddenly Fuyu's wife stood up from her chair. Now, now that's enough of this. I think it's time we finished our food and got to bed. Fionan needs his rest, after all. She said, putting an end to the conversation. The others agreed, and Fuyu also stood to his feet. That's right. Nothing will come of talking about the past. I suggest you rest up, take a hot bath and get some sleep, Fiona. Fuyu said. Hayoketsu also nodded his head. That's right, little Yuki, get some rest. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? He said, almost menacingly. With that said, Fiona went and took a bath allowed his body to soak in hot water. His muscles were aching like never before and he had to say he missed having chakra. After his bath, he went to his room, where he had a bed and blankets provided made of soft fur. They were even better than his own back home and he was adamant he would take them back with him when his training was complete. All that was left now was to sleep. He had to relax his mind and body to be ready for what was to come tomorrow. For he knew his training would not be easy and he had to be prepared for anything. Chapter 31 Fiona tossed and turned in his bed. Something was bothering him, but he wasn't sure what it was. He opened his eyes to see what the reason was. That being that, he was no longer in Fuyu's house and found himself at the peak of the mountain. The wind was so cold that his pants had already started to freeze over and his body was shivering violently. What in the frozen hell is going on? He shouted as he took a look around, trying to find out what was going on. Hayoketsu suddenly appeared out of the blizzard leaning on his cane. This is the next step of your training. If you can survive this, then you will be ready to start learning to take in natural energy. Fiona looked at the old yeti like he was crazy. How in the hell am I supposed to survive this? I'll freeze to death up here. He shouted. Hayoketsu simply smiled, showing his fangs. If you want to learn sage mode, then you must survive on this mountain top for three days and nights without freezing to death. Fiona has wrapped his arms around his body to try to keep warm, but it wasn't helping. He looked around to try and take in his surroundings to see that he could leave and get down to safety if he wanted to. With that said, the old yeti started walking down the steep path back down the mountain. Fiona shouting out to him as he did. Just how am I supposed to survive up here? He asked. You must become one with the elements, one with nature itself. Good luck! Hayoketsu shouted as he finally faded into the blizzard, leaving Fiona alone with nothing but the howling wind to keep him company. One with nature. Fiona said as he sat down on the ground, he was still shivering, and his teeth were even chattering from the intense cold. He crossed his legs and closed his eyes as he tried to remain calm. Whatever he did, panic wouldn't get him very far. He had to relax his body and let himself become one with the elements around him. In this case, it was the freezing cold, befitting the Horned Yetis and the Yuki clan. However, that was easier said than done. Fiona had been at it for almost thirty minutes now, and all he had achieved was getting colder with small icicles hanging from his face. His teeth were non-stop chattering now as the cold was taking over, his body reaching its limits. I can't do this. I'm going to freeze to death, Fiona said through his chattering teeth. Saiken's voice snapped at him suddenly. You have to hold on Fiona, you have already come too far. You can't give up now. 
the six tails said from inside him. Fiona closed his eyes and entered his inner world so he could see the tailed beast. Saikan was sat in the snow in Fiona's inner world, looking quite comfortable. Fiona was that cold that he couldn't stop shivering even inside his inner world. What am I supposed to do, Saikan? If I can't learn how to become one with nature, I'm going to freeze to death, he said, pacing around trying to get warm. The six tails looked at him with a worried expression. I don't know what to tell you, Fiona. I can't even lend you my chakra to help due to Hyoketsu sealing your chakra. It's as if he is trying to get you to swim up a river without being able to swim. Saikin said. Fiona was quiet for a moment when suddenly Saikum's words sparked something in his mind. That's it. He shouted suddenly. Turning to look Saikin in the eyes, he almost jumped up at him. Saikin, you're a genius. He shouted. The six tails was confused and asked Fiona to explain. It's so simple, Saikin. What do you do when you can't swim against the current? He said, making it around simple. Saikin stayed quiet as he still didn't understand. If you can't fight the current, you go with it instead. Fiona said as he turned around. Saikin watched as Fiona disappeared from his inner world and he took a back seat, watching what he had planned. Fiona opened his eyes and took a sudden sharp breath as his body was starting to shut down from the cold. His fingers had even started to go blue, and if his idea didn't work, then he would not have another chance. Here goes nothing, he said as he exhaled and gave into the cold around him, relaxing his body, letting it succumb to the freezing temperatures. His body suddenly stopped shivering, and his teeth stopped chatting. He was so still that you would walk right past him, not seeing him. The snow started to pile on his lap and shoulders, ice forming around his body, seeming as if he had been frozen on the spot. Yet Saikin could see that his vitals were improving. His body was getting warmer, his pulse slowing down to almost undetectable levels as he became one with his environment. That's when Saikin saw it. Saikin could see the natural energy surrounding Fiona's body, encasing him in a cocoon of warmth that protected him from the freezing temperatures. Saikin has never met another being other than his father, the sage of six paths that could withstand such a large amount of natural energy. From Saikin's experience, if someone took in too much natural energy without mixing it in a perfect ratio with their chakra, they would die, usually being petrified. Yet here sat Fiona Yuki surrounded in nothing but natural energy with no chakra in the mix, and he was fine. In fact, he was more than fine. He was thriving. The sensation was hard for Fiona to explain. He was fully aware of everything around him as if all of his senses had been amplified. He no longer felt any pain and could no longer feel the cold, in fact, he felt as if he was sat on a tropical beach with the sun shining brightly. He remained in that same spot for the next three days, braving the weather without so much as a shudder. Time passed faster for Fiona as if he was in some sort of enlightened trance, and before he knew it, Hyoketsu had returned. Fiona could sense his presence before he even got anywhere near him. Hyoketsu could see that Fiona had passed the test, and he was very pleased, he was displeased, however, about his lack of manner in greeting him. So you survived little Yuki, he said, trying to get his attention. However, Fiona remained in his meditative trance, seeming as if he was ignoring the old yeti. Hyoketsu could see the vast amount of natural energy that was surrounding Fiona, and he was shocked. Never before had he seen anything like it, for he knew with that much natural energy he should be dead, yet his body was somehow absorbing it like vitamin D from the sunlight. Time to wake up, little Yuki, the old yeti shouted as he went to whack Fiona on the head with his cane. Fiona could feel his movements so clearly it was as if he was using his eyes to see. His body was in such a relaxed state that it moved on its own, and he caught the cane in his hand before it could strike his head, to Hyoketsu's surprise. Fiona opened his eyes and smiled at Hyoketsu before letting go of his walking stick. I don't think so, he said, getting a little big for his boots. Hyoketsu laughed and leaned his way back on his cane. Very good, little Yuki, very good. You have survived the second test but now comes your final test. He said, 
his expression becoming hard. Fiona couldn't help feel the atmosphere around the old Yeti change as he suddenly developed a very intense killing aura. Your final test is to face me in battle, he said as he dropped his cane to the ground. Don't worry. You will have full use of all your abilities. You will need them. Hayoketsu said as he formed a few hand signs and released the sealing jutsu that was blocked Fiona's chakra. Fiona could feel the sudden rush of his chakra igniting throughout his entire body, feeling stronger than ever. Fiona stood to his feet as his body almost felt weightless. But his focus quickly shifted to Hayoketsu as it seemed the old yeti was powering up. I won't go easy on you, little Yuki. He said as his eyes suddenly glowed in ice blue as his small body grew larger and larger in size. All of his muscles had expanded, and the old frail-looking yeti that had been stood before him was gone. Instead replaced by a monstrous-looking demon. Fiona took the initiative and allowed bones to form all around his body, encasing himself in a shield of razor-sharp spikes. Hayoketsu smiled, showing his large fangs as he finished powering up. Here I come, little Yuki. He shouted, his voice now deep and intimidating. Saiken, I need your chakra now. Fiona shouted as he watched Hayoketsu vanish. Already on it, Fiona, the six tails shouted as he allowed his chakra to spread out all over Fiona's body, covering him in a thick red chakra clock with six tails right off the bat. Hayoketsu suddenly appeared, slamming his fist into Fiona so hard that the force sent him flying. His bone had taken the impact, but they were not strong enough to deal with Hayoketsu's incredible power breaking from the force of the blow. Fiona was still flying through the air and quickly slipped into an ice mirror, falling out of another not far from Hayoketsu. I'm not wasting any time here. I'll go all out from the get-go. He shouted as he formed a load of hand signs with astonishing speed. Hayoketsu knew where Fiona had gone as he could sense him thanks to his sage powers. Turning around, he charged head-on at him getting ready to unleash another powerful attack. Secret Bone-Style Jutsu Lightning Graveyard Fiona shouted. In his head, remember, haha, Fiona slapped his hands on the floor, letting as much chakra as he could muster pump into the jutsu. Suddenly giant bones, some as large as a house, shot from the ground, each of them sprouting more and more razor-sharp bones like branches from them all with a severe current of electricity flowing through them. Hayoketsu had been surrounded by the jutsu and encased in the bone forest, trapping him as well as electrocuting him, getting a mighty roar of pain from the yeti. Fiona looked on as he tried to catch his breath. That jutsu had coated a massive amount of chakra, taking him down to only one tail of his chakra cloak, but it was worth it. That should stop you, Fiona said, seeming confident. However, the giant bones were suddenly smashed into pieces as Hayoketsu smashed his way through them with brute force. Fiona was gobsmacked and couldn't believe his eyes. He had no time to react as Hayoketsu was on him again, not giving him any time. It will take more than that to stop me, boy. He roared as he slammed his fist down towards Fiona, trying to crush him. Fiona jumped back at the last second but was blown around by the force of the blow. He had never encountered such a monster before, and he almost felt helpless. Still, he tried his best to avoid being crushed as he dodged and was able to slip into another ice mirror, giving him a little time to come up with a new plan. He is a monster. Fiona thought as he slipped into another mirror, trying to put some reasonable distance between Hayoketsu. I don't have any other jutsu that will work on him. We have to enter tail beast mode. Fiona said, speaking to Saiken. The six tails nodded in agreement. I agree, Fiona. This is not a battle you can win alone. However, your body is still not used to this form, so we won't have much time. Fiona nodded. It will have to do, Saiken. Let's do it! Fiona slipped out of another mirror, expecting to hop into another one, but Hayoketsu pulled him down, catching him by surprise. Did you think you could run away? He roared as he pulled Fiona to the ground slamming him into the side of the mountain. Hayoketsu watched as the force of Fiona's body hitting the mountainside caused a massive avalanche that buried Fiona underneath it. 
Hayokatsu wasn't even phased by the force of the avalanche and simply crossed his arms as he waited for the snow to stop. Are you really done already, little Yuki? I thought you had more fight in you than that. Hayokatsu said, letting his arms fall to his side, waiting for a response. He waited a little longer, and deep down, he wasn't sure if maybe he had killed Fiona. Perhaps I was wrong about you, kid. He said as he turned his back, thinking the worst. Suddenly the snow that held Fiona exploded as a massive body with six tails emerged in the powdered blanket. Fiona had entered tail beast mode, fully taking the form of Saikin. Hayokatsu watched with a smile on his face as he started to charge towards him, now you're getting serious. He roared as the two of them clashed. Fiona didn't waste any time trying to compete in a battle of strength. He quickly let loose a massive blast of corrosive gas, planning to trap Hayokatsu inside it. Hayokatsu wasn't so naive, though, and used his frost breath to counter the gas, quickly taking the assault back to Fiona as he slammed a punch into his gut. Nevertheless, his fist simply passed straight through Saiken's body, trapping his arm inside. You can't block this. Fiona shouted as he let loose his corrosive slime, spitting it right into Hayokatsu's face. Hayokatsu had managed to block the acid with his free hand, it taking the brunt of the attack as the acid started to eat away at the flesh on his arm. The Yeti let out a roar of pain as he quickly used his frost breath to freeze the acid on his arm, managing to neutralize its effect. Take this! Fiona shouted as he used all six of his tails to grip Hayokatsu, each of them sliding around one of his limbs, with the other two engaging around his waist and neck, holding him in place. Saiken opens its mouth as concentrated chakra started to build and build until it formed a mighty tailed beast bomb. Hayokatsu was now the one on his back foot, he felt surprised that Fiona was capable of such extraordinary power even without sage mode, and he almost feared what he could become once he mastered it. Hayokatsu smiled as he tried to pull Saiken's tail from around his neck so he could speak. Impressive boy, but did you really think it would be that easy? He shouted. Sage Art. Great Hailstone Jutsu. Hayokatsu roared as he unleashed a massive jutsu. Massive car-sized hailstones suddenly started to fall from the sky, striking Fiona and Saikin. They were that large that they even interrupted his tailed beast bomb as a massive hailstone struck him in the side of the head, knocking him down. He lost control of the beast bomb and it suddenly exploded, hitting both him and Hayokatsu. The explosion was massive, and it even took out part of the mountaintop, taking a large chunk out of it. The blast could be seen from the Yeti village, and they wondered what the hell was going on. Fuyu had not seen destruction like it and decided to rush to the top so he could assess the damage. Oh, no! Lord Hayokatsu must have gone too far, he shouted as he jumped and ran as fast as he could. Fuyu arrived at the top of the mountain, and it would seem that Kori and Emofabuki had the same thought and had also rushed to where the battle had been taking place. Blast it, Lord Hayokatsu. He always goes overboard. Koro shouted as he joined the others. How much you want to bet he killed the kid? Emofabuki said, chuckling. Fuyu didn't seem amused and told them to pack it in. The smoke was still thick in the air when the three Yeti arrived, and all they could do was wait to see what the aftermath would bring. As the smoke faded, the small shadow of a hairy yeti could be seen, and the others realized it was Hayokatsu. I knew it. He killed the kid. Emofabuki said, slapping Kori on the shoulder. Fuyu seemed worried and ran over to the small yeti. He could tell he was tired and worn out, having used a lot of strength. Lord Hayokatsu. What happened? Fuyu asked as he went to aid him. Calm down, little Fuyu, Hayokatsu said as he slapped the larger yeti's hand away with ease. Fuyu looked a little further and could see Fiona led unconscious in the snow. Yes, he is alive, Fuyu, Hayokatsu said as he sat down, taking in a breath. Kori and Emofabuki looked on from a little further away. Looks like the kid managed to survive against Lord Hayokatsu. Kori said, astonished at the result. Even Emofabuki was impressed as he whistled. Damn, I didn't think he had it in him. He said, surprised. That boy is truly amazing. 
even when faced with such overwhelming odds, he could still do so much and at such a young age. He is the first of his clan to pass this test. You should be proud of his Fuyu, Hayoketsu said as he stood back up slowly. Fuyu sighed relief at the fact Fiona was still alive. Now pick him up. It's time for a feast. Hayoketsu shouted as he started walking away as if nothing had happened. Fiona woke later to the warmth of an open fire and the smell of good food. Fuyu and the others surrounded him and he shot up the memories of his past battle quickly entering his mind. Calm yourself, little Yuki, Hayoketsu said, taking a sip of his tea. The battle is over. You passed the test. He said. His words calmed Fiona down and he relaxed only to feel the pain that was left, his body still in rough shape from the battle. That's right, kid, you put up one hell of a fight there, Fuyu said, smiling at him. Hayoketsu suddenly cleared his throat, getting everyone's attention. His eyes grew serious as he placed his teacup down on the table. Now look here, little Yuki. You have passed the tests, but the real training is yet to come. Give me three years. Yep, that should about do it. Three years of training and I will have taught you everything I know, giving you power beyond your wildest dreams. Fiona was shocked, and he had to take time to think about the old Yeti's proposal. After all three years away from the village was a long time, plus his absence would not go unnoticed. But the more he weighed up the pros and cons, the more he decided he didn't have anything to lose. After all, he needed more power if he was to achieve anything in this world, furthermore now he was in the perfect place to obtain it. Fiona stood to his feet and looked the old Yeti in his eyes. I accept your offer, Lord Hayoketsu. Please teach me everything you know. Fiona said, bowing as he did. Hayoketsu smiled a toothy grin as he looked at Fiona. Good choice, little Yuki, let the training commence. Chapter 32 Three long years had passed by for Fiona as he trained to master sage mode. He was now eighteen years old and no longer a boy. Not that he ever considered himself a child. His body had grown and matured over the last three years, now standing at six foot one. His muscles had also filled out a little more, adding more meat to his frame. Fiona's hair had also grown and was now quite long, still with two bangs on each side of his face. All in all, he was now a man. Today was the last day of his training with Hayoketsu. It wasn't so much training anymore but a test to see the fruits of his labor. Fiona was sat meditating on top of a large ice spike. Atop, he perfectly balanced on another slab of ice, even the slightest movement would cause him to fall, yet he remained perfectly balanced. Hayoketsu stood on the ground below as he sensed the natural energy flow all around Fiona's body, mixing in with his chakra before he opened his eyes. Fiona took on little physical traits when he entered sage mode, indicating he was a perfect sage. His eyes turned crystal blue with a black fong slit for an iris. His entering sage mode's main trait was that his hair turned white, and two large horns grew from his head the same the horns yet he possessed. Hayoketsu had quickly found out through Fiona's training that he could absorb a massive amount of natural energy with next to little consequence. Something he had not seen since his early days. He was convinced it was due to his Kagaya bloodline and Hayoketsu shuddered at the memory of the evil princess. Fiona opened his eyes and dropped to the floor, greeting the old yeti as he allowed the natural energy to flow out of his body. Hayoketsu smiled as he let the thought exit his mind. Today is your last day of training, little Yuki, the old yeti said. Fiona had never gotten used to being called little Yuki, but he knew it would never change. Yes, Lord Hayoketsu. I am ready, he said, his voice much deeper now. Follow me to the ice lake, there I will give you your final test, Hayoketsu said. Fiona smiled as he created an ice mirror without any hand signs. Race you there, he said as he slipped into it, instantly falling out of another one onto the frozen lake. Hayoketsu sighed and jumped into the mirror himself, also slipping out onto the frozen lake. I will never get used to that he said as he tossed his walking stick to the side. So what have you got planned for me today, Lord Hayoketsu? Hiking up the mountain on my hands? Or maybe today we will build a snowman? 
Fiona said jokingly. Hayoketsu laughed a little at the joke before getting serious again. As good as that sounds, I'm afraid we won't be doing that. No, today, I want you to fight with me. The old yeti said, cracking his knuckles. Fiona smiled as he took a fighting position. I thought you would never ask. Hayoketsu also smiled as he entered his fighting pose, getting ready to battle. Don't hold back. He said as he concentrated chakra into his small fist. H.A.A. Hayoketsu shouted as he punched forwards, unleashing a blast of concentrated wind with the force of his fist. Fiona instantly jumped into the air to avoid the blow, watching as it hit the side of the surrounding mountains ripping through the hard ice that surrounded it. He didn't have time to react as Hayoketsu was on him, attacking with full force. Fiona didn't seem pressed, though, and was quickly able to block each attack as the two of them fell back down to the frozen lake. It was the same lake that Fiona had first had to cross three years ago, and the ice was still just as unstable. However, each of them was so skilled that they could move freely across the ice without so much as a crack. Something that had taken Fiona a long time to learn during his training. Is that all you have, old man? Fiona shouted as he pushed the old yeti away before flipping back into a handspring landing back in a fighting pose. Hayoketsu was impressed and simply smiled as he crossed his arms over his chest. Did you really think I was out of tricks? The old yeti said as he whistled. Fiona gave a small smile as he watched Fuyu, Kori, and Imofubuki all land on the frozen lake, acting as Hayoketsu's reinforcements. Fuyu roared, letting his icy breath freeze the entire lake to reinforce the ice allowing the three large yeti to put all their weight on it. You're going down this time, Fiona. Kori shouted as he spun his susumina around before pointing it at him. Imofubuki smashed his kanabo into the ground, resting his large hand on it. You may have bested me last time, but it won't happen again. He said snarling. Fuyu started cracking his knuckles as he smiled, looking Fiona dead in the eye. I hope to give you a better challenge than last time. I won't hold back. He said, a large smile coming to his face. Fiona had battled each of the large yeti in one-on-one -on -one combat during the past three years of his training. Eventually, he had bested each of them, overcoming every challenge they set. I guess I can't afford to hold back then, Fiona said as he lowered his arms, seeming to concentrate for a moment. Attack! Imofubuki shouted as he moved first. The others quickly joining him, each of them attacking at full force, slamming their attacks and weapons down upon Fiona. The attack's force caused the thick layer of ice to crack under the weight and kick up powdered snow blinding everyone to what had happened. Suddenly Kori and Fuyu were sent flying, slamming into the side of the mountain with tremendous force. Emofabuki had been able to block Fiona's counterattack at the last moment with his kanabo. Though the power of the blow had sent him sliding across the ice. Emofabuki looked down, shocked to see that his kanabo had cracked from the force of Fiona's attack. Blast it. We were too late. He said, watching as the smoke settled. Fiona had entered sage mode, seeming to do it almost instantly. His eyes had turned crystal blue now and his hair white as bone, two horns atop his head as his powerful aura radiated around him. What's the matter, Emofabuki? Too much for you to handle? Fiona said his very voice emitting power. The large armored yeti wasn't happy but refused to surrender. Don't get cocky, Emofabuki said as he tossed his large kanabo to the side. Fiona smiled in confidence as he extended his hand, pointing his index finger at the large yeti like a good. Sorry about this. Emofabuki's eyes went wide as he quickly crossed his arms across his body, trying to defend against the oncoming attack. Sage Art Ice Bullet Barrage Fiona said as he fired multiple ice bullets at the large yeti. Each hit its mark, ripping through Emofabuki's armor and causing massive damage to his body. He winced in pain and tried to fight through it, but his body just wasn't strong enough, lowering his arms, he was breathing heavily now as he smiled at Fiona. Is that all you got? He said slowly before he toppled over, slamming into the floor with a crashing thud. Sorry big guy, believe it or not, I did hold back, Fiona said as he lowered his arm. 
Suddenly a massive blast of fire consumed him like a giant flamethrower. Corey was breathing fire intensely as he tried to catch Fiona off guard. However, the flames did nothing, not even tough his as he had created an ice shield in the air that was blocking the fire. Not a bad idea for you, Fiona said, startling the giant yeti that had tried to use the distraction to attack him from behind. He never stood a chance, though, with Fiona's enhanced sensory abilities and sage mode, he could sense everything happening around him with ease. Fuyu quickly attacked, trying anyway as he swiped with his huge claws aiming to slash Fiona in half. Fiona quickly blocked the attack with an equal-sized hand made of bone that he had created around the outside of his arm. It was attached to his body by a large bone and then took the form of a large exoskeleton like a giant. Fuyu was stunned and watched in horror as more and more bones started to grow until a large horned yeti skeleton stood in equal height next to Fuyu with Fiona encased inside the skull where he seamlessly controlled the entire thing. Sage Art Gashida Kuro Fiona shouted as the massive skeleton grabbed a hold of Fuyu's shoulders. What in the? Fuyu shouted in shock as he had never seen this ability before. The massive skeleton picked Fuyu up off the ground with incredible strength and suddenly slammed him into the ice with tremendous force. The slam knocked the wind out of Fuyu and took him out of the battle. The skeleton then turned around to face Kori, who was the last one standing. Kori didn't waste any time and used his Susumina to trap the giant skeleton's neck as he tried to smash it into the ground. However, the skeleton wouldn't budge. What in the? Corey shouted as he could see that more bone had shot out of its back to stop it from being slammed into the ground. Quickly the large yeti dived back as the skeleton tried to grab his body. Corey had seen it coming and shot a couple of large fireballs at the joints of the skeleton to try to weaken it. They hit their targets and dropped the skeleton to the ground leaving the back of its neck exposed. Now is my chance. Corey shouted as he jumped into the air spinning his Susumina around with great skill before slamming it into the back of its neck, taking the head clean off. I did it! Now for the... Corey thought. His attention was taken away from the skeleton for a moment as he could hear a clapping sound. The large yeti turned to look and to his surprise, he saw Fiona stood to the side, simply clapping. When did you? He shouted, confused as to how he had gotten there. Fiona smiled as he formed a few hand signs brining the skeleton to life. Sorry about this, Cory, he said. The massive skeleton suddenly broke apart as all the bones attacked the large yeti at once. It was as if they had become flexible, and they wrapped around him, trapping his entire body, leaving him unable to move. Looks like that's the last of you taken out, Fiona said as he turned to face Hayoketsu, who had been watching from the sidelines. I take it you have no more challenges for me, Lord Hayoketsu? Fiona said with a slight bow, mocking him. Hayoketsu smiled as he extended his arms before pulling them down to his hips. Fiona could sense the massive amount of natural energy that he was absorbing and smiled at what was coming. No. You have passed all of the tests, little Yuki. Exceeding my expectations. The only thing I have left to offer you is my full power. Hayoketsu shouted as he started to grow in size, his form becoming powerful just as it had done the last time they had done battle. Fuyu and the others had moved over to the sidelines now, where it was safe. It had been a long time since they had seen their elder use his full power, and they were excited to see how Fiona would fare. Hayoketsu launched forward at Fiona using his full might from the get-go. Fiona also moved on and exchanged blow for blow with the large yeti. The force coming off of their attacks was so great that the ice beneath them was starting to break and finally spilt as Fiona avoided an axe kick from Hayoketsu. The Yeti's kick cracked the ice on the lake in half, letting the water from under it burst out with a vengeance. Fiona used this to his advantage as he took control of the water, molding it with his chakra, and with the added effect of material energy, the attack was even more potent. Fiona launched the water forwards, allowing it to travel at high pressure slicing through anything it touched. Hayoketsu jumped high into the air avoiding the high-pressure water. He was impressed but had a few tricks up his own sleeve. Yeti Water Style Waterbinding Jutsu Hayoketsu shouted as he made the hand signs. Water suddenly burst through the ice which Fiona was stood, 
wrapping around his entire body before it encased him in a perfect sphere. Fiona was surprised by the jutsu, and it looked like an ordinary water prison. But he soon found that it was much stronger. He punched and kicked as he tried to break free. However, every time he touched the water, he could feel it drain away his chakra. Sneaky old man. He said to himself. Hayoketsu landed back onto a sturdy piece of ice that was floating on the lake. Ha! Huh. That is only the beginning. He said as he sat down, crossing his legs. Fiona watched as he continued to form hand signs before slapping his hands together. A large smile forming on his lips as he looked at Fiona. What will you do now, little Yuki? Water started to fill the sphere Fiona was trapped inside of. The more water that flowed in, the more his chakra drained away. When the water reaches the top, you will have no chakra left, and you will die, little Yuki. Better do so something quickly. Hayoketsu said in victory. Fiona was impressed, to say th least. He had never seen this jutsu and was convinced he kept this as an ace in the hole. All Fiona's natural energy had been absorbed by the water first, and now it was starting to drain his chakra. But Fiona simply smiled. I didn't think I would need to resort to this so soon. He said as he closed his eyes for a moment. A considerable amount of red chakra suddenly burst from his body as he entered stage two of tailed beast mode. His body was now covered in a black and red chakra as all six tails became visible. Fiona opened his mouth and started to expel a tremendous amount of acid, letting it mix in with the water. The acid began to do its job, and before Hayoketsu knew what hit him, Fiona burst free from his water prison jutsu. Hayoketsu watched a Fiona flew through the air, and he wasn't surprised by his counter-attack. Many tailed beast bombs suddenly scattered from Fiona as he fired concentrated chakra balls at Hayoketsu. The Yeti was able to jump and flip, avoiding them as they exploded against anything they touched. Water from the frozen lake was blown into the air from the explosions giving the battle a raining effect, soaking Hayoketsu. Now is my chance. Fiona thought as he stripped away his chakra cloak and started to form hand signs. The water had soaked Hayoketsu's fur, and he had to wonder if Fiona had made those shots almost too easy to avoid. You are crafty little Yuki, but not as crafty as this old geezer. Hayoketsu said as he made a few hand signs. Lightning style. Sage art, wind style. Each of them shouted at the same time as they unleashed their jutsu. Hayoketsu let loose a massive tornado of wind that covered his entire body like a shield. His thinking was if Fiona was going to try and zap him, then he would counter it with a wind style. Fiona had already thought this through and was now a step ahead of the old yeti. His jutsu was a dud that he used to bait Hayoketsu into using a wind style. You have played right into my hands. He shouted as he made a few more hand signs, changing his jutsu completely. Water style water vortex jutsu. Fiona shouted as he finished the hand signs. A large amount of water shot up from the frozen lake and mixed into Hayoketsu's wind vortex, creating a massive water tornado trapping him inside. Hayoketsu was very surprised but then started to bellow in laughter. Not bad, little Yuki, not bad. But you must know that this cannot hold me. He shouted as he lowered his stance, getting ready to focus his chakra. Fiona suddenly appeared from an ice mirror above Hayoketsu. The Yeti was surprised and attacked him with a quick swipe of his claws. Fiona blocked the attack with bones that took the impact, the force of it sent him flying back into the water tornado where he suddenly started to glide along the water as if he was surfing it. Don't think I will let you off so easy. Hayoketsu shouted as he started forming hand signs again. Fiona smiled also and dived headfirst straight at him. Hayoketsu was once again forced to stop his hand signs and deal with Fiona, who was quickly becoming a thorn in his side. It's over! Hayoketsu shouted as he launched his first forwards with serious intent to kill. Hitting Fiona head-on. Hayoketsu's massive fist hit Fiona head-on, but instead of his body crumbling against the force, he turned into pure lightning. The sudden jolt of electricity from the clone hit. Hayoketsu hard, the added effect from the water tornado made things worse, and it suddenly crashed down onto him, mixing with the lighting and frying him, doing a lot of damage. 
If not for the large amount of natural energy within the old Yeti, he knew he would have been done for. It seems his luck had run out, though, as his body started to shrink as his own sage mode was fading. It would seem that the massive combined jutsu had done enough damage to stop Hyoketsu from taking in any more natural energy, leaving him vulnerable. Fiona slowly appeared out of an ice mirror behind the old yeti with a bone blade drawn. Give it up, Lord Hyoketsu. He said, pointing the blade at him. The old yeti breathed a heavy sign and raised his hands in defeat. It would seem I have nothing left to teach you, little Yuki. He said, turning to face him. Fiona put his blade down, giving the old yeti a big smile. You train me well, Lord Hyoketsu. The old yeti nodded as he lowered his head. Not well enough, it would seem. He shouted as he suddenly launched forward, striking Fiona hard in the stomach with a powerful blast. It was the same attack he had used the first time they had met. Or perhaps I trained you better than I thought. Hyoketsu said as he smiled. The Fiona in front of him turned to ice and shattered into pieces as the real Fiona once again stepped out of an ice mirror that formed behind the old yeti. You did, Fiona said as he handed the old yeti his walking stick. Well, that settles it. Fiona Yuki, I hereby declare you a sage of the Horn Yeti clan. He said proudly. Fiona smiled as he nodded his head. Thank you for everything, Lord Hyoketsu. Fuyu and the others all walked over to him, congratulating him as they did. Fiona, I always knew you were important since the moment I met you, Fuyu said proudly. Cory also chipped and squatting down. You are the first since the old man to master sage mode. I still can't believe it. Emofabuki crossed his arms over his large chest, still sore about his loss. Don't get too cocky now that you're a sage kid. It doesn't mean you can tell me what to do, got it. He said. The others laughed at him, and Fiona joined them. Hyoketsu cleared his throat, getting everyone's attention before he spoke. It's time for one last feast before little Yuki here leaves us. He has endured three long years of hellish training to master his new abilities. The old yeti said in a serious manner. So let's celebrate. He suddenly said, breaking the serious atmosphere. Everyone agreed, and all laughed it off, Fuyu picked Fiona up, placing him on his shoulder, and they all marched off to the village to prepare the party. Sometime later. It was dark now, yet the Yeti village was full of life. Fires lit the sky, and song and dance took place throughout as the entire town had gathered to give Fiona his farewell. There was plenty of food, Huge fish and slabs of meat could be seen roasting on the large fires. The yetis even had their own alcohol, some kind of yeti mead that was very strong. Fuyu was drinking it like water as he wiped the remains off his chops. Have some Fiona. This stuff will put hairs on your chest. He said, laughing hard. Fiona did have some, and he had to say Fuyu wasn't kidding, the mead was seriously strong. So strong he spat it everywhere, getting a huge laugh from everyone watching. Fiona decided not to have any more and laughed it off, deciding that stuff wasn't for him. Not long after, the food was ready, and Hyoketsu stood up, getting the entire village's attention. Here marks the end of little Yuki's time with us. He started everyone remaining quiet as they waited for him to continue. Never has a human being able to learn our sage arts that were passed to us so long ago. With great honor, I have passed the teachings down to a Yuki clan member that you all know we have had a good relationship with for many, many years. I can only hope that with Fiona's rise to sagehood, he will once again bring greatness to our clan and his own. To Fiona Yuki. The sage! He shouted as he raised his mug of mead. The entire village joined him as they, too, lifted their horns in mugs, repeating the words. Fiona Yuki! They cheered. The party quickly continued, and the drinking and eating began, lasting well into the early hours of the morning. Fiona couldn't help think about his past three years here, and he had to admit he would miss this place. Even though it had been the most challenging thing he had ever done, he really had enjoyed himself. He only hoped that when he returned to the village, he could change things for the better. Chapter 33
After three long years of training with the Horn Yeti clan, it was finally time for Fiona to return to the Hidden Mist Village. They had spent most of the night celebrating, and Fiona was very tired and a little hungover. It was now morning, and the sun was shining over the top of the mountain. All of the Yeti stood together behind the elder as they bid him farewell. I can't thank you all enough for looking after me, Fiona said, bowing to all of them as a sign of respect. Hyoketsu nodded back to him and struck his walking stick into the snow. Good luck, little Yuki. And farewell. The old Yeti said, smiling at him. Fuyu and the others also nodded to him. We will get stronger, Fiona. Fuyu said, grabbing his massive bicep. Cory also nodded, don't hesitate to summon me if you ever need help. Me too. Emofabuki said as he crossed his arms over his chest. Fiona nodded and made a few quick hand signs summoning an ice mirror behind him. Well, see ya. He said once more as he slipped inside the ice mirror. It was undoubtedly an emotional time, but he knew he had to remain strong, as now was the time for him to return home and make a difference. The Yetis watched as he disappeared, and the ice mirror turned to water, falling to the floor. They, too, were sad. But they knew that Fiona would go on to achieve great things. Fiona stepped out of his ice mirror, facing a somewhat surprised-looking elder woman. She stood frozen for a moment before grabbing a frying pan waiting it around in panic. Just what the hell are you doing in my house? Get out before I knock you silly. She screamed. Fiona dodged the swipes at his head and quickly disappeared out of the window and onto the building's roof in an instant. He was slightly taken back by the event and had to wonder if he was in the right place. I should have known better. It has been three years after all. Of course, they gave my apartment to someone else. He said as he took a look at the village from the rooftop. Not much had changed building-wise, and Fiona couldn't see any massive changes to the village overall. Well, I better have a peek about. He said as he vanished and slipped down into an alley unnoticed. Fiona walked into the main road of the village, and he was shocked to see how much of a mess it looked. No one was out and about, other than shady-looking individuals. Rubbish littered the streets, and most of the market stalls were closed or boarded up. What happened? Fiona said, not believing his eyes. Before he had left to train, the village was much more lively than this. People walked the streets feeling safe, market stalls were open, and trade was shipped in from all over. It was as if the village had reverted back to what it had been like when the third Mizukage held the reins during the war. Fiona suddenly felt a sense of danger as he could feel a cold gaze fall upon him. Three Umbu suddenly appeared out of the shadows, two of them using a water-style whip to restrain each of his arms. I thought I recognized you. Ice Devil of the Mist. The leader said from behind his mask. Fiona wasn't too surprised and decided it would be best to try and talk this over before resorting to violence. Come on now, fellas, I'm sure we can talk about this misunderstanding he said, trying to ease the tension. You're a rogue ninja that disappeared three years ago. Listed an S-rank criminal in the bingo book. Wanted alive. Or dead. The umbu shouted as he launched forwards with his blade drawn. Fiona didn't even move as he let out a sigh. Willing a few bones to shoot from his forehead, he stopped the blade with ease. It's true he's a monster. One of the other umbu said, trying to pull tighter on his water whip. Sorry, but I don't have time for this, Fiona said as he froze the water around his arms, shattering them in an instant and breaking free. Get him! The leader shouted in shock. However, both of his men fell to the floor unconscious as Fiona suddenly disappeared. The umbu stumbled backward, frantically looking all over for where he might appear. Show yourself, you monster! He shouted in fear. He took another step back, placing his feet into small puddles of water, and suddenly they were frozen to the ground. What in the? He shouted as Fiona appeared in front of him, emerging out of the mist as if he were a part of it. Time to sleep for a little while. He said as he struck a couple of pressure points in rapid succession knocking the umbu unconscious. 
Fiona breathed a sigh of relief and took another quick look around. It was quiet, but he guessed that even with the noise, most people would be too scared to look out of the window. He turned his head, looking towards the Mazukage's large building that was in the center of the village. Hopefully, you will understand. He said as he once again vanished into the mist. Yagura was currently sitting in his office, attending to some paperwork. A list of the current rogue ninja was spread across his desk as he tried to sort them in order. The list was quite big. Among them was also two of the seven swordsmen of the mist. Juzo and Raiga had left the village and gone rogue, refusing to serve him any longer. Yagura bit his lip in anger as he moved their pictures into a large file. However, the next image was Fiona's, and Yagura grew even angrier. Fiona had vanished from the village without a trace, and he had heard nothing of his name in the last three years. It was extraordinary, to say the least, but the Mizukage put his picture into the file nevertheless. Suddenly his office doors were slammed open as two of his personal umbu guard came flying through, crashing onto the ground. He didn't move from his seat as he waited to see what was going on. Fiona had come across more resistance and was forced to deal with them before he could finally come face to face with Yagura. Though he was a little worried about the last two as he might have overdone it with them. Yagura could not believe his eyes and rose from his chair, knocking it over as he did. You dare show your face to me. He shouted, letting his chakra flare to life, making the room heavy. Fiona was unaffected by the heavy chakra and simply bowed toward him, taking Yagura off guard. Please forgive my rude intrusion, Lord Mizukage. Fiona Yuki reporting for duty, I believe you will have questions for me. He said, not taking his eyes off the Mizukage, unsure how he would react. Yagura could tell that Fiona was unaffected by his powerful chakra and instead sat back down, wanting to see how this would play out. You have grown, Yagura said as he took in Fiona's full appearance. You are listed as an S-rank Rouge Ninja in the Bingo Book. I should kill you now for deserting the village. Yagura spat. Fiona raised his head and looked the Mizukage in the eye. You must believe me, Lord Mizukage. I never abandoned the village. I was simply away training to hone my abilities. Now I have returned ready to serve once again. He said, adding the little twist onto the end. Fiona knew this was his only hope of not being branded a rogue ninja. Although he was now more powerful than any other ninja in the village, his life could still be made worse by leaving. Fiona had also taken a liking to his village and classed it as his home, with plans to make it a great village. Maybe even his own. Yagura crossed his arms over his chest. He could clearly see that this was a Fiona who was on another level than the boy he had seen three years ago. Now he was a grown man, and Yagura could only guess how strong he had become. You expect me to believe that? He said, not looking impressed. Why else would I return? Fiona said. The room fell silent as the two of them entered a standoff, neither of them speaking anymore. Finally, Yagura gave a heavy sigh as he scratched his head. As your luck would have it, your return is somewhat good timing. We need powerful shinobi in this uncertain time. Yagura said, letting his killing intent fade away. Fiona also let his guard drop a little as he listened to what the Mizukage said. I will drop the charges of you being a rouge ninja Fiona. However, the deal will only stand if you do something for me first. Fiona could smell some sort of trap, but he had no choice. I will summon you tomorrow for a top secret mission. If you fail to show, then I will kill you myself. Yagura said without hesitation. Fiona nodded and gave a bow. I won't let you down, Lord Mizukage, Fiona said. We will see. Yagura said as he dismissed him. Fiona left the Mizukage's officer, leaving him alone to his thoughts. As he walked outside of the Mizukage's office, he was met with a large amount of ninja that had come as reinforcements. All of them froze as they looked Fiona up and down a few of them, realizing who he was. They started to whisper among themselves, the ones who knew who he was, spreading fear among the others. That's the ice devil of the mist. He's a monster. We should kill him now. One of them said. 
he's an S rank in the bingo. No way we can take him. Another said. Didn't he kill the Kazakage? The whispers carried on and on, and Fiona was starting to wonder just what the hell they were doing. Suddenly, a man pushed his way to the front, a large smile forming on his face. Well, well. If it isn't Captain, Yuki. He said, placing his hands on his hips. Fiona recognized him instantly and also smiled. Long time no see Hatsu. He said as he lowered his arms, getting a reaction from the rest of the shinobi. Hatsu laughed and raised his fist, signaling for the small battalion to halt. All right, you lot, bugger off. Hatsu shouted. All of the shinobi looked confused, and some even spoke up, causing Hatsu to turn around. That's an order, you sorry shits. If you think you stand a chance here, then you're living in a fantasy world. Piss off before Captain Yuki here kills you all. Hatsu wasn't just saying this because he was Fiona's friend. It was the truth. Also, he had seen the message come from another Umbu who has hidden above on the Mizukage's building, giving clear instructions to stand down. The force of Shinobi did as Hatsu commanded and slowly disappeared. Leaving only Hatsu, and Fiona stood in the street. It's been a long time Hatsu, Fiona said, smiling at him. Hatsu nodded. Come with me, Captain, let's talk away from prying eyes. He said, leading the way. Fiona nodded, and the two of them disappeared, leaving no trace they were ever there. Fiona had followed Hatsu back to what he guessed was his house. It was the right size and in one of the nicer areas of the village. Come in, Cap. Hatsu started but was cut off. Please, Hatsu, call me Fiona. I no longer hold the rank of captain. Hatsu nodded as he opened the door. Come in, Fiona. The two of them stepped in and were suddenly greeted by a beautiful lady with long black hair. Ah dear, you're home. She shouted as she ran over and hugged Hatsu. I'm home dear, safe and sound, Hatsu said as he hugged her back. Fiona was surprised that Hatsu had a wife, but he was happy for him. Hatsu had been his closest subordinate and closest friend during his time here so far. Hatsu released his wife and turned to Fiona, making the introductions. Cap. He started before quickly changing his words. Fiona. This is my wife, Yua. He said. She was a pretty woman with long black hair like silk, her eyes were a dark brown, and her skin white as snow. She stepped forward and bowed her head as she greeted him. It is a pleasure to meet you, Fiona. She said with a soft voice. Fiona returned the greeting and bowed back. Please, Yua. The pleasure is all mine. He said as he raised his head. Hatsu smiled and placed his hand on her shoulder. Dear, make us some tea. Fiona and I have a lot to talk about. Hatsu took Fiona into a private room and sat him down as he filled him in on everything that had happened over the last three years. The Mizukage is out of control, even members of the Seven have left the village. The villagers are unhappy and scared, trade has stopped, and he has even started up the old ways of the academy. Fiona could tell that Hatsu was angry. After all, who could blame him? It sounded like the Mizukage had changed for the worse, going back on his word and everything he had promised to do for the village. Yua had brought the two plenty of tea, and they continued to talk, catching up on everything. Hatsu also had to break the bad news about more of his old teammates being killed in action and that only himself and Kaga remained. Fiona was sorry to hear it and felt responsible for their deaths. I should have been there. He said, angry at himself. Hatsu sighed. There was nothing you could do. Not with the way the Mizwakage has been. The conflict with the sand seems to have pushed him to the edge. Yet again, something Fiona felt terrible about. He had been the one to kill the fourth Kazakage and almost started another war. The sand has sworn revenge against our village, cutting off our trade routes and terrorizing our lands. Yet Lord Forth does nothing. Hatsu spat in disgust. Fiona never imagined things would get so bad, and he could only think of one reason why. Abito. He said to himself. 
He knew that if the future played out as it was meant to that Abito would eventually take control of Yagura with an almost perfect Jinjutsu. However, Fiona hadn't realized it would be so soon. Anyway, with you back, I'm sure the village will bounce back, after all, we need all the help we can get. Fiona nodded as he sipped his tea. I promise Hatsu. I will do everything within my power to help our nation. Suddenly the sound of loud bells could be heard ringing all over the village, signaling that it was under attack. Both Hatsu and Fiona jumped up to their feet as they rushed out of the room to see what was going on. Yua ran to Hatsu's side. Are we under attack? She shouted as she pointed out the window to a large plume of smoke. Hatsu grabbed his weapon's pouch from the side and strapped it onto his leg, looking at Fiona. Let's go, Fiona said, giving the nod to move out. The two of them rushed to the village center, where the primary battle was still ongoing. Both were shocked to see that it was, in fact, the Kagaya clan which were attacking. All of them were large and wore the white robes of their clan. The trademark red dots and zigzag line through the hair, giving them away. Why are the Kagaya attacking us? Hatsu shouted, confused. Fiona was also confused as he didn't think they would attack the village for a few more years. His thoughts were suddenly interrupted as three large men charged at him and Hatsu with their kunai raised. Kill them, the one in the middle shouted. Hatsu didn't waste any time and dashed in head-on, taking the one on the left out with a quick strike to the back of his neck. The other two charged at Fiona, each striking with all of their might. Fiona grabbed each of their arms, stopping their attacks with ease. To each of their surprise, Fiona's body turned into ice, trapping each of them in an icy grip. What in the hell is this? One of them shouted. Fiona appeared behind the leader, asking him why they were attacking the village. Why are you attacking us? You are supposed to be allied with the mist. Fiona said, trying to reason with him. The Kagaya laughed hard as his eyes gave a crazy look. You think we are allies? He said, laughing hard. We will kill all of you and show you the true might of the Kagaya. He said as he broke free from the ice, swinging his weapon at Fiona's head. Fiona allowed bones to grow from his body, stopping the man's attack and pushing him back with ease. The Kagaya looked at him in shock and then anger as he realized who he was. You! You are an abomination and a disgrace to your clan. He shouted as he charged back in for the attack. Fiona realized there would be no more talking as he decided to end it here simply. With one quick swipe of his arm, the man dropped dead, riddled with holes. Fiona turned to look at the other but quickly realized he felt the same way. You mongrel, I'll rip your throat out with my own. He screamed before Hatsu slit his throat, putting an end to his bickering. Fiona had only ever come into contact with the Kagaya once before, and he knew how much they were feared and hated by the others in the village. It seems that the Kagaya felt the same way and had finally had enough. The sounds of battle could be heard coming from the distance, and Hatsu grabbed Fiona's attention, snapping him out of his thoughts. Let's go, Hatsu, he said as they both dashed off to the front line. The center of the village was a battlefield as Kagaya, and the Mist Shinobi battled all over the place. The Kagaya was indeed a mighty clan, but with the Mist Village's combined organization, they stood no chance. It was quickly becoming apparent that the Kagaya was losing, and soon, only a small handful remained. What was strange was that among them was a little boy with white hair, and although he looked small, he was deadly. Fiona clocked him from a distance almost instantly and watched as he danced around, killing anyone who attacked him as his bones sprouted from his body and changed to his command. Kimimaro Fiona said in surprise as he watched the child kill with expert skill. Hatsu looked at the child with surprise as he noticed his abilities. That kid. He's the same as you. We have to stop him before he kills more of our men. Hatsu said, drawing his kunai. No, Hatsu. I have a plan. Fiona said, raising his hand. Hatsu trusted Fiona with his life and did as he asked. Not long passed, and the last Kagaya had finally been killed, leaving none of them alive. All except for Kimimaro, who had managed to escape unseen. Are you going to let him escape? 
Hatsu asked, not sure what Fiona had planned. No, he said as he stood to his feet. Both of them had taken a position high on a roof so they could watch the battle unfold and keep a close eye on the kid. Don't follow me, Hatsu. I'll handle this. Fiona said as he disappeared, leaving Hatsu alone. Hatsu just gave a small chuckle and decided to go down to help with the cleanup. Always doing what you want. Some things never change. Fiona followed Kimimaro out of the village and towards the outskirts atop a cliff. The smoke from the village could still be seen, and Kimimaro placed his back against a tree as he tried to catch his breath. Fiona decided not to waste any more time and appeared in front of him, causing him to jump in for the attack. Fiona was impressed with his reflexes and quickly grabbed his arm, tossing him against the tree stump hard. Kimimaro didn't even have time to react and was so shaken back by the sudden stranger that he allowed bones to grow all around his body as a reflex. Fiona smiled and raised his hands in a non-threatening manner. While there, kid settled down. I'm not here to fight you, Fiona said. Kimimaro looked at him cautiously, still not letting his defenses drop. Fiona knew it would take more than that and gave him a small smile. Fiona allowed his bones to also grow out of his body just as Kimimaro's had with the two horns on his head as he always did. Kimimaro was speechless and just stared at Fiona with wide eyes. See, kid. We are the same you and I. Fiona said, letting his bones return inside his body. Kimimaro did the same and let his defense drop looking Fiona in the eyes. You are the same as me, mister. Fiona nodded and walked over to the child, placing his hand on his shoulder. I watched what happened in the village. I know you were forced to do what you did and that you only fought for your survival. Fiona said as he knelt down so he could look Kimimaro in the eyes. If you come with me, I will keep you safe and teach you how to control your power. He said, smiling at him. You will be safe, and nobody will hurt you. Kimimaro was no longer scared and instead embraced Fiona, almost diving into his arms. It was the first time he had met someone that didn't fear or hate him. It was also the first time he had met someone with the same abilities as him, which made him trust Fiona even more. How touching! A voice said from the shadows. Fiona turned on his heels as he was surprised he hadn't sensed anyone there. The man stepped out of the shadows, and Fiona was shocked to see Orochimaru of the Hidden Leaf Village standing before them. I'm afraid you will be handing the boy over to me. He said, almost hissing. Fiona stood to his full height and placed Kimimaro behind him as he looked the legendary Sanin in the eye. Why do you want the child? Fiona said, already knowing the answer. He possesses abilities I wish to add to my arsenal. But then again, so do you. He said with a devilish smirk. Fiona knew this wasn't an opponent he could play around with, and even with his new powers, Orochimaru was not someone to take lightly. I am afraid that won't be happening. I suggest you look elsewhere, Orochimaru. Fiona said, letting his chakra flare a little. Orochimaru could feel that Fiona was not an opponent he could best easily. Then it clicked, and the snake master recognized who Fiona was. Ah yes, I believe you go by the ice devil of the mist, Kavya Killer. He said, hissing. Orochimaru had remembered hearing of the boy who had killed the fourth Kazakage and taken an interest in his profile in the bingo book. I'm afraid I must insist you leave. Or else. Fiona said, threatening him. Orochimaru didn't take many threats seriously, but he knew this one was one to watch out for. Perhaps you can back up those words. Perhaps you can't. There is only one way to find out. All right, that ends this chapter here. I hope you enjoyed it, please leave a like if you did. Chapter 34 Fiona stood face to face in a standoff with Orochimaru of the Hidden Leaf Village. Kimimaro looked worried as he could feel the intense pressure coming from both of them. Fiona noticed his worries and placed a hand on his small shoulder, smiling at him. Don't worry. I won't let anything happen to you. Suddenly Orochimaru attacked as he appeared in front of Fiona, unleashing a snake thrust attack from his hand. Ten snakeheads jumped forwards, 
trying to bite Fiona and poison him, but Fiona didn't even turn to face them as he had already predicted he would do something like this. Fiona allowed razor-sharp bones to grow from his body, each slicing through the snakes rendering Orochimaru's attack useless. Fiona counterattacked with a barrage of bone bullets that seamlessly shredded through his body with ease. Orochimaru's mouth opened, and out slivered another Orochimaru in perfect health. It would seem your abilities can do more than meet the eye. How interesting. He said, showing great interest in Fiona's abilities. You have no idea, Fiona said with a smile as he raised his fingers. Suddenly a large burst of ice shot from the ground and encased itself around Orochimaru, trapping him inside. But of course, Fiona knew it wouldn't be that easy. Suddenly a burst of high-pressure wind cut through the ice dome, freeing the snake inside. Orochimaru stepped out of the ice and crossed his arms over his chest. How remarkable. Not one, but two Keki Jinkai. Fiona allowed bones to grow out from all over his body, with two horns on his head as he was about to get serious. I suggest you leave now. I'm done playing around here. Fiona said, letting his massive chakra flare up. Orochimaru could see and feel the cold coming from the pressure of Fiona's chakra. It was massive, and he was starting to realize this wasn't a battle he could win. To think someone like this would exist. Orochimaru said as he slowly backed off. This is not the end boy. We will meet again. The snake said as he disappeared into the mist, his presence disappearing altogether. Fiona allowed the bones to return into his body and turned to face Kimimaro. He was glad his show of force had forced Orochimaru to back off. It wasn't that he couldn't defeat him, it was more the fact he didn't need the attention. It's all right now. He's gone. He said, kneeling down to look the boy in the eye. Kimimaro was surprisingly calm after witnessing two monsters facing off against each other. But Fiona remembered the kind of character he was. And now, he had an opportunity to forge him into an even greater monster. Follow me, kid, Fiona said as he turned around, leading the way back to the village. He wasn't on the best of terms with the Mizukage at the moment. But he was sure he could smooth this over. After all, his abilities were a dying bloodline, and Fiona was sure he would have need of his skills in the future. Fiona leads Kimimaro back to the hidden mist village. Sneaking him through every guard post as the village was still in a state of emergency after the Kagaya attack. Having nowhere else to go, Fiona decided to take the boy back to Hatsu's house, believing that would be the safest place for the time being. Once there, Fiona knocked softly on the door and waited for someone to answer. Hatsu opened the door, already knowing who it was but was shocked to see who was with him. Cap Fiona, what is that child doing with you? Hatsu asked, quite surprised. Never mind that for now. I need a favor. Fiona said. Hatsu sighed and opened the door fully, inviting them in. Fiona walked inside, telling Kimimaro to follow him. Once inside, they sat down, and Hatsu asked what Fiona was planning. He knew it was crazy after the attack and that no one in the village would take kindly to him being alive. Tensions were already high enough as it was. Relax, Hatsu. I intend to take young Kamamaro here as my student. He will report to me directly, and I will oversee all of his training. Hatsu was confused, but he knew it must have something to do with sharing the same Kekiai Jinkai. What about when Lord Forth finds out? Hatsu asked. Leave that to me, Fiona said. Hatsu picked up more than Fiona had meant to give away there, but he decided to remain silent. After all, he owed him his life and would follow him until the end. I need you to keep an eye on the boy for me. Keep him safe and out of sight for a little while just until I manage to settle things in the village. Fiona said as he stood up. Hatsu nodded and stayed seated. As you wish. Fiona smiled at Hatsu as he nodded to him. Thank you, Hatsu, you are a true friend. With that, Fiona went to talk to Kimimaro, who was sat with some food that Hatsu's wife had given to him. Kimimaro, listen to me closely. I need to leave for a little while. Hatsu will look after you until I get back. Do as he asked for me and wait until I return. Kimimaro nodded, 
understanding. Fiona placed his hand on his shoulder and smiled. When I get back, I will teach you how to use your powers best I can, he said, bringing a smile to Kimamaro's face. Hatsu crossed his arms over his chest. Don't worry, kid, you're safe here, he said, reassuring the boy. Fiona smiled and nodded over to Hatsu. I'll take my leave then, he said. Hatsu nodded and bid him farewell before Fiona vanished from the room, leaving Hatsu and Kimimaro alone. Fiona was headed right for the Mizukage's office to find out what had happened for the Kagaya to attack and what he would do about it. He was starting to get sick of the poor leadership that the Mizukage was displaying, knowing that something had to be done about it. The only problem was nothing could be done without staging a coup d'etat, which would end badly for the village and the land of water. Fiona arrived at the Mizukage's office and could instantly see that there were no guards around. He found it strange but didn't think much of it. He knocked on the door to his office and waited for permission to enter. Come in. A voice said, Fiona did as he was told and opened the door. The room was full of all of the most powerful shinobi in the village. Yagura, the fourth Mizukage, sat in his large chair. Zabuza was present and didn't look impressed, as always. May stood with her hands crossed behind her back, her hair had gotten longer, and she looked even prettier than last time Fiona had seen her. Fuguki, who was the only original member of the seven swordsmen left in the village was stood next to the Mizukage, his sword Samahana strapped to his back. Fuguki was accompanied by two others who Fiona had never met but recognized. One was Mangetsu Hozuki, he was only young, but his reputation spoke for itself. The other was a woman whose name Fiona didn't know. Ao was also present, as well as Kisame, who had a standard sword strapped to his back meaning he had yet to kill Faguki and take Samahana for himself. Fiona was greeted by surprise and silence as all of the strongest shinobi in the hidden mist weighed him up head to toe. Fiona bowed his head towards the Mizukage and then raised it as he shut the door behind him. No one else said anything as they waited for the Mizukage to speak first, everyone waiting for his reaction. Last they had heard, Fiona had disappeared and been branded a rogue ninja after killing the Kazakage. Ah yes, Fiona. Your timing is perfect. The Mizukage said. Everyone looked surprised by his response. What are you doing here? I thought you had gone rouge, I should kill you where you stand. Zabuza said, placing a hand on his blade. He wasn't wielding the executioner's blade yet, meaning Juzo hadn't been captured yet either, helping Fiona setting the timeline a little better. But still, the attack from the Kagaya was early and, to his estimate, should not have happened yet. Enough, Zabuza. The Mizukage said as he raised his arm. Zabuza did as he was told but wasn't happy. Fiona, perfect timing. I was about to summon you, Yagura said. He turned back to the others and started speaking once again. I want a full report of the battle. Casualties on both sides. I also wish to a squad sent out to the Kagaya clan village to dispose of any survivors. I will not stand for an attack on my village like this. They will all die. Yagura spat. Everyone else in the room remained silent. They all knew the real reason the Kagaya had rebelled, but no one dared to say anything. Fuguki, take your men and deal with the report. Ao, take Fiona, Mei, and Zabuza to the Kagaya village and make sure they are all dead. He said, barking orders. All of them nodded and didn't waste any time disappearing to get away from Yagura's temper. Fiona looked at Ao and the others, who nodded to him, signaling to get a move on. They all removed themselves from the Mizukage's office and regrouped in a quieter Umbu meeting spot. Of course, the others were still surprised Fiona was back, and it was the first conversation subject. Zabuza didn't waste any time and grabbed Fiona by his collar, trying to pin him up. Zabuza was tall and tried to lift him from the floor, but Fiona slapped his hand away with ease. What the hell are you doing still alive? Always the favorite doing whatever you like. He shouted, clearly pissed. Zabuza, calm down. May shouted as she stepped between them. Zabuza gave her a dirty look but backed off. 
If Lord Forth has allowed Fiona to return, then it must be for a reason. Ao also spoke up as he placed a hand on Fiona's shoulder. That's right, glad to have you back, kid. He said with a grin, noticing how much stronger he had clearly become. Whatever, Zabuza said as he turned his back on them. I'll see you at the village, he said before disappearing. The others simply ignored his rudeness as he always acted like that. It was nothing new. Both May and Ao turned their attention back to Fiona, both keen to learn more about where he had been and what he had been up to. May especially as she took in his new manly appearance. My Fiona, you really have grown in all of the right places. She said as she placed a finger on her lips. Ao sighed, will you stop trying to flirt with the poor lad and leave him be? He said. May was not impressed and gave off a killer aura towards Ao, who realized he shouldn't have said anything. Ao, dear. She said calmly. If I want your opinion, I will ask for it. Next time you give it, I'll kill you. She whispered in his ear, sending a cold chill down his spine. She's always like this. He thought to himself as he nodded and back off slowly, both his hands raised key in defense. Fiona had to hold in a laugh as the scene reminded him of his time watching Naruto back in his other life. He quickly changed the subject, however. I think we should focus on the mission and meet with Zabuza at the Kagaya village. He said, getting both of their focus. You're right. Who knows what Zabuza will do by himself? May said, getting serious. All right, let's move out, Ao said, leading the other two out towards the Kagaya clan's home. Not much was said along the way as both May and Ao remained focused key in the mission at hand. Fiona was thankful for this as he didn't want to detail where and what he had been up to. The trip was short, and they arrived after an hour of high-speed travel. Zabuza had already arrived and was leaning against a tree waiting for them. About time you got here he said, not bothering to uncross his arms. Nice of you to wait for us, Ao said as he walked over to get a better look at the village. He raised his fingers as he concentrated, activating his Byakugan. Fiona could still remember the day he got that eye as he was glad to have met him for it. Do you see anything? May asked. Ao remained quiet for a moment longer as he finished scouting the full area. There are no men left here, just woman and children, Ao said, lowering his hands and deactivating his Bikugan. No matter. Our orders are to kill them all. Zabuza said as he pulled the sword from his back, his blood lust starting to get the better of him. May wasn't happy about it, but he was right. Fiona, on the other hand, was outraged and quickly voiced it. Put your sword away, Zabuza. No one else needs to die today he said in a deep voice. The others all turned to him in surprise, Sabuza giving him a stern look. I don't take orders from your deserter. He spat as he pointed his sword at him. Fiona, this is an order from Lord Mizukich himself. We can't disobey him, Ao said. May remained silent as she watched the situation growing more tense. These women and children are innocent. They don't deserve to die. Fiona shouted as he pushed Zabuza's blade away from his face. Orders are orders. Get with it, or I'll kill you myself. Zabuza said as he jumped down from the cliff they were standing off into the village. Fiona turned to Ao and May, trying to reason with them. Are you going to follow these orders and kill more innocent people? Look at where his leadership has got us. Look at what he has done to the village and its people. May had to admit she wasn't happy about the whole thing. She, too, had asked herself the same question but had never voiced her opinion. Ao sighed and put his hand on his head. Fiona, you know we have to follow the Mizukage rule. You know what happens to those who don't. Please don't put me in this position. Fiona was trying to get angry and decided now was the time to try and convince them about Yagura being under Abito's control. Haven't you noticed that Lord Forth has been acting strange as of late? He's not himself anymore. He no longer has the village and its people's interests at heart. Yet you follow him blindly anyway. Ao and May both listened to his words, 
but Fiona could tell he still wasn't getting through just yet. I won't follow a tyrant any longer, Fiona said. Ao drew his sword and pointed it towards Fiona. That's enough, Fiona. What you are saying is treason. Ao! Lower your sword, May spoke clearly outraged that he intended to resort to violence. You can try to stop me if you wish, Ao, but I am not the enemy here. I have reason to believe that Lord Forth is under the control of someone else. He said, getting a shocked expression from the other two. What do you mean by that, Fiona? May asked. I believe that someone is controlling the Mazukic and using him and our village for his own gain, completely disregarding our people in the process. Ao lowered his sword as the words started TK get through to him. That is a very serious accusation, Fiona. Do you have any proof? Ao asked. May agrees with him. Lord Forth is a perfect Jinchuriki, and Jinjutsu doesn't work on him. How could someone be controlling him? If you don't believe me, use your Bikugan to see for yourself, Fiona said as he turned his back on them. Now, unless you are willing to stop me. I'm going to stop Zabuza and put an end to this needless slaughter. Fiona said as he dashed off the cliff, chasing after Zabuza. May and Ao were left speechless as they watched him dash off. Ao put his sword back into its sheath and turned to May. What do you think? He asked. May crossed her arms over her chest, and she closed her eyes. I agree that Lord Forth has been acting strange these last three years. I, too, want our village to be great and our people to no longer suffer. Perhaps Fiona is speaking the truth. Ao nodded. I don't want to admit it, but I can't stop him. He has become too strong. We had better go and make sure those two don't kill each other, May said. Ao agreed with her, and the two of them jumped off the cliff, headed after Fiona and Zabuza. Zabuza had already headed into the village. It was only small, located at the base of a large cliff with some houses built up the cliffside. Zabuza was strolling through the center of the town dragging the tip of his blade through the ground as he did for effect. He could already smell the fear as a few of the women had already seen him and started to run away. Where do you think you're going? Zabuza shouted as he lunged in, ready to slice one of the women in half. The woman turned around in horror as she watched the monster charging towards her, his killing aura thick in the air. No, please! She screamed as she fell over, clutching her baby in her arms. I suddenly sprung out of the ground and stopped Zabuza's sword in its stride. Zabuza growled heavily as he slowly stood to his full height, turning to face Fiona. It's over, Zabuza. The mission is off. Fiona shouted, trying TK get him to see the reason. Zabuza spun his sword around, resting it on his shoulder. You dare get in my way? He spat. The woman didn't waste any time as she got back up and started to run away, still fearing for her life. Zabuza noticed her running, and Fiona caught the glint in his eye. Don't do it, Zabuza. Zabuza didn't listen as he dashed away, chasing after the woman intent on finishing his prey off. Die! He shouted as he raised his sword again, ready to split her down the middle. Fiona rushed in and blocked Zabuza's black with his arm, which had three bones surrounding it for protection. I won't let you kill an innocent woman and her baby for sport. Fiona shouted, his rage building. Zabuza was also pissed and grabbed his sword with both hands, putting as much pressure as he could down onto Fiona. You blasted pest. This time I'll kill you. He shouted as he attacked with a flurry of strikes from his blade. Fiona blocked and dodged each attack with ease and countered with a powerful sidekick that hit Zabuza in the ribs, sending him flying before he crashed into the cliff sidewall. Fiona turned around to the woman, who was shocked to see his abilities. Get out of here. It's not safe. He said. She didn't waste any more time and quickly got up, running away as fast as she could. Zabuza pulled himself out of the rubble and dusted himself off. He was tough and even though Fiona had kicked him hard, it wasn't enough to put him down. That's it. I'm done playing around now. Zabuza said as his demon aura suddenly came to life. 
Fiona had never seen it in person before, and he had TK admit he was worthy of TBS named Demon of the Mist. Fiona nodded his head and allowed bones to ground all around his body with too hard on his head, his chakra was making the area cold, and the ground started to freeze over. I won't hold back either, Fiona said. Arr! Zabuza screamed as he charged in, ready to try and kill Fiona. Zabuza attacked with all of his might, swinging his sword with serious force. However, Fiona blocked every strike with ease making Zabuza's attacks seem like child's play for him. Stop mocking me! Zabuza shouted as he jumped back, forming some hand signs. Hidden Miss Jutsu! Zabuza shouted, summing a thick mist to form around them. Fiona knew that Zabuza was one of the greatest hidden mist killers in the entire village. But he had something no one else did. This mist won't be enough to defeat me, Zabuza, Fiona said mockingly. We will see about that. Zabuza said, his voice echoing around. Fiona closed his eyes and kept his defenses up just in case of an attack as he concentrated on absorbing natural energy. A moment later, Fiona opened his eyes and suddenly disappeared too fast for Zabuza to track his movements. Where did he go? Zabuza thought to himself as he had never seen anyone move so fast. Suddenly he felt a tingle up his spine and he tried to turn around as quickly as he, but Fiona was so fast that he struck Zabuza in the stomach the force was crazy, and Zabuza dropped to his knees, unable to breathe. With a simple wave of his arm, the mist vanished, and Fiona stood over Zabuza in victory. Fiona had just his senjutsu to track Zabuza and then went on the counterattack. He didn't attack using sage mode as he didn't want TK to kill him. Instead, he struck him with a powerful blow to the solar plexus winding him. Fiona formed a couple of hand signs and trapped Zabuza's arms and legs in ice handcuffs, ensuring that he couldn't escape. I didn't want to have to do that, but you left me no choice, Fiona said. Zabuza was still struggling TK breathe and had even been sick. He could feel his diaphragm spazzing out as it tried to reset itself and get some oxygen back into it. H.O. Zabuza said through staggered breaths. Fiona looked down at him as he struggled to hear his words. How are you so strong? Said, clearly still angry at him about the whole situation. May and Ao arrived to see Zabuza defeated on the floor in the ice handcuff, and they were shocked. After all, Zabuza was no pushover, and it looked as if Fiona hadn't even broken a sweat. Listen up, Zabuza. There is something we all need to talk about. And I won't let you leave until I have finished. Chapter 35 Hello, here is the next chapter. Just a warning, this chapter is rated 18 and over. You have been warned. There is something that we need to discuss together, Fiona said, getting everyone's attention. Zabuza was still wheezing from the hit he took, and his arms and legs had been bound with ice so that he couldn't escape. Let me go! He roared, still outraged. I will but you need to calm down first, Fiona said. Zabuza, this is important. I think you will want to hear it. May said. Shut it, you bitch. Or I'll kill you too. He shouted as he tried to break free from the ice restraints. May got angry very easily and walked over to him, crouching down to face him. Say that again, and you will be the one who dies. She said in a very intimidating tone. Zabuza went silent for a moment but scoffed. Whatever. He said, looking away. Back to the matter at hand then, Fiona said. As I said, I believe that the Mizukage is being controlled by someone else. I think it's a Jinjutsu of some sorts, but I would like you to confirm it with your Bikugan. He said to Ao. Zabuza turned back to face them and was actually shocked by the news. That can't be. He said. He's right. That would take an extraordinary Jinjutsu caster to be able to trap Lord Forth. Only the Uchiha clan of the Hidden Leaf could do such a thing. Ao said, still unsure. Fiona nodded. I'm afraid that may well be the case. He said, deciding to withhold Madara's name for the time being. And what are you planning to do if you are right? May asked. 
the others all waiting for Fiona to give his answer. I will. No. We will stop him either by breaking the Jinjutsu or... Or... May asked, already knowing the answer. What you are saying is treason, Fiona, Ao said as he crossed his arms. Fiona walked over to Zabuza and released the ice that was holding him. I know asking you to trust me is a big risk, but if we don't act now, I fear it will be too late. Zabuza slowly stood up as he dusted himself off, still not happy about this whole thing. All I ask is for you to look with your Bikugan. Ao closed his eyes for a moment as he thought about the whole thing hard. I will do as you ask Fiona as a favor to you. He said. Fiona nodded his head in appreciation. But know this. If you are wrong, I will turn you in for treason. He said, not giving the threat lightly. So you are plotting to overthrow the fourth, Zabuza said with a sinister smile. I underestimated you, Fiona. He said, turning his back on them. Where are you going, Zabuza? May asked as he started to walk away. Mind your business. He snapped. May was pissed and was about to charge at him, but Fiona stopped her. It's okay, May. Let him go. He said, giving her a nod. She looked at Fiona, his face was close enough that she could see all of his features, and she liked what she saw. They watched as Zabuza walked away and finally disappeared into the mist. Ao turned to them and placed his hands on his hips. We had better get back and report to Lord Forth, he said. And don't worry. I'll play your little game, for now, Fiona, but remember what I said. I understand, Fiona said. With that, the three of them left the Kagaya village behind as they started to make their way back to the Hidden Mist village. However, unknowing to the other two, Fiona left one of his ice clones behind so that he could thoroughly scout out the area for anything of value. Fiona, Ao, and May all returned to the Mizukija's office, and Ao reported the mission was complete. There are no Kagaya clansmen left Lord Forth, Ao reported. Good work. I knew I could count on all of you. Yagura said as he locked his fingers together over his desk. You are dismissed, for now, report to me in the morning. I might have something else that needs taken care of. He said. All three of them bowed and made their exit from his office. As the three of them walked down the hallway and out of the eyes of any Umbu guards, Fiona gave Ao the go-ahead to activate his Bikugan. Ao nodded, and he raised his fingers. You better be right about this. I'll be killed if he finds out I did this. He said as he activated his Bikugan. May and Fiona waited in anticipation to see what Ao said. A moment went by and time seemed to slow down before he reacted. Al's eye went wide as he deactivated his Bikugan. What is it, Ao? May asked, eager to know. Ao turned to the two of them and shook his head. Fiona is right. Meanwhile, Zabuza had taken his loss to Fiona pretty hard. He had done nothing but train and train to become stronger, honing his skills and forging them in the fires of combat. Yet, he had been made to look like a child before Fiona. Zabuza had never felt so weak. Never had he felt so worthless, as if all his efforts had been in vain. He had wandered through the land of water for the rest of the night until he came to a half-decent-sized town. With nothing else to do, for the time being, Zabuza decided to head to the local bar where he could have some peace and drown his sorrow alone. Zabuza walked in as he pushed the door open. Welcome. The maid said as she suddenly went quiet, the look on her face one of fear. Zabuza was still dressed in his everyday hidden Miss Joan in attire, complete with his flak jacket and headband. His presence had silenced the entire place, but it wasn't anything he wasn't used to. A table and a sake. Better make it the bottle. He said with his gruff voice. The barmaid nodded and offered him a small table in the corner of the room so that he would have some privacy. I'll be all right back, as sir. She said, clearly nervous. After all, hidden Miss Shinobi were very feared, and ordinary people tried to stay well clear of them. The girl returned with a full bottle of sake and one cup. Placing them down on the table, 
she lifted the bottle and attempted to pour some into his cup, spilling a little by accident. Give it here! He yelled as he snatched the bottle from her. The girl couldn't help but flinch, and she backed away a little too quick. Zabuza wasn't bothered, and he started to chug the rice wine, hoping to forget his misery. He drank all night, easily polishing off four full bottles of sake before the night was done. His temper still hadn't improved, but eventually the alcohol took effect and he passed out on the table. The place's owner was too scared to wake him and instead decided it would be best to leave him until morning, hoping he would leave without causing any trouble. Back in the hidden mist, Ao was shocked to see that Fiona had been telling the truth. There was no mistaking the chakra color that signaled he was indeed under a powerful Jinjutsu. Only his Bikugan eye could even detect such a Jinjutsu, and Ao had to wonder how Fiona had found out. The three of them decided to leave the Mizukage building before they discussed anything further, and the three of them returned to May's house as it was the closest place. So, Lord Forth is really under a Jinjutsu, May said. Ao nodded as he took a sip of his tea. I am afraid Fiona was telling the truth. It's a powerful Jinjutsu at that. One I don't think I can break. May was surprised by that as Ao was a specialist in that area, to begin with. Then how are we supposed to break it? She asked, confused. Fiona was stood staring out of the large window that overlooked the Mizukage's mansion with his arms crossed behind his back. He was trying as hard as he could to remember any information at all from the show that could help them here. But nothing came to mind. There is only one way. He said, not turning to face the others. Ao and May turned to look at him, waiting for him to continue. We have to force the Jinjutsu to break from the inside. He said, finally turning to face them. Just how are we supposed to do that? Ao asked. He's right. If we try to force him, we will face a battle to the death, and Lord Forth is in a pushover. May said, sipping her tea. As she did, she spilt a little bit, and it landed on her breasts. May flinched a little at the hot liquid and started to rub it off. The action not going unnoticed by Fiona. He cleared his throat and his mind from the view before he got serious again. As I was saying, I would need to get close enough to enter his inner world and converse with the three tails inside of him. If I can break the Jinjutsu on the three tails, it should be able to do the rest. Ao whistled. That doesn't sound easy. He said. No. Fiona said. Would it not be easier to kill him? May said, not even batting an eyelid as she did. Ao slapped his hand on the table in protest. We can't do that. He shouted. May didn't flinch. Why? It would be much easier that way. Fiona thought about both possible outcomes. On the one hand, they faced a battle against Yagura and the three tails where they would have to hold back in order to save him, putting themselves and potentially the entire village in danger. While on the other, they could kill him and avoid massive casualties and potentially a life-threatening battle. Fiona knew there were only two others besides himself in the village who were strong enough to challenge him in a one-on-one -on -one battle. May was one of them. The other was Kisame. But Fiona already knew what his path was. Yagura was no pushover, and if push came to shove, he could do a lot of damage. Fiona also had to worry about what Abito would do if he found out they were trying to break the Jinjutsu. He highly doubted he would attack them, but he had to consider the possibility. Ao finished his tea and placed the empty cup onto the table. Well, there is nothing we can do for the time being. Not until we have come up with a plan on how to deal with this. He said. I agree. We should take more time to gather allies and plan accordingly before we act on this. Fiona also nodded. Yes, that is the most logical plan of action. But, we will have to be careful who we trust with this information. Remember, we aren't trying to stage a rebellion here. The other two nodded. He's right. There are too many who would use an opportunity like this to enact their own gains. May said. Only people that you truly trust can be made aware of this. For now, we will treat it as an S-class top secret until we come up with a better plan. 
For now, we should go about business as usual. Ao said. Fiona and May nodded in agreement and brought the conversation to a close. I think it's time to take my leave, Ao said as he stood up, thanking May for the tea. Fiona nodded. Yes, for now, we do nothing. He said, also walking towards the door with Ao. May stood up from her seat as she watched Ao open the door to leave. Wait, Fiona. She said just before he stepped out. I was wondering if we could talk alone before you left. She said. Ao didn't look surprised and simply nodded. I'll take my leave then. He said, bidding them good night. Fiona said goodbye to Ao and shut the door walking back into Mai's house. What is it you want to talk about, May? He asked, not sure what was happening. May walked over to the fridge, bending over as she opened it. She pulled a bottle of sake out and gave it a little shake. Will you have a drink with me? She asked, putting on a seductive smile. Fiona was taken back by her boldness, but he had to admit, he kind of liked it. The two of them sat down, and May poured them each a cup. She sipped her slowly, and Fiona noticed how full and soft her lips looked. Cheers! She said before she finished the whole cup. R she said as she wiped her mouth. Cheers, Fiona said as he, too, took a large drink of sake. Woo! He shouted as he finished the drink, trying not to cough his cuts up. The sake was more potent than he had thought, hitting him almost instantly. May poured them both another drink as she places the sake bottle back down on the table. So, Fiona, she said, looking into his eyes. Yes, May? he said, trying to pretend the sake wasn't affecting him. You still haven't told me much about yourself. I mean, I only know what little comes through the grapevine. She said, taking another sip. Fiona also took another drink, not wanting to be rude by letting her drink alone. Not much to know, May. He said, putting his cup down. I could say the same about you, though. He also added, May smiled. Well, why don't we play a little game? Fiona wasn't sure what she was getting at, but his curiosity got the better of him. What do you have in mind? Why don't we play a game where we ask each other a question? Your answer. However you want, and we try to guess if it's a lie or the truth. She said, finishing her second drink. Fiona had to admit that sounded quite fun. After all, he did want to know more about her backstory as he didn't know much. Okay, who starts? Fiona asked. May rubbed the edge of her cup with her finger slowly as she gave a smile. I'll start. She said, placing both her hands on the table gently. How old were you when you graduated from the academy? She asked. Fiona had to take a moment to work it out, so much had happened since then, after all. I was eight, Fiona said. May smiled. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Now it's your turn. She said. Fiona nodded as he finished the rest of the sake in his cup, slamming it down on the table. All right. What is your dream? Fiona asked, taking her by surprise. My dream? Said asked, filling his cup back up. No one has ever asked me that before. She said softly. Fiona noticed the look on her face as she blushed a little. My dream is to help build our village and nation so it is a healthy and peaceful place for the people to live. She said. And also find a good man. She added, giving him a cheeky grin. Fiona almost spat his sake out as he caught the last bit of that. What? He managed to blurt out as his face started turning a little red. I'm saying that I want you, Fiona. She said, leaning over the table, letting her large breasts hang for a better view of them. Fiona almost choked this time. This can't be real? He said to himself. Come on, May, I think that's the sake talking. He said, batting it off as a joke. May wasn't joking, though. I'm not joking, Fiona. You have grown into such a fine man, one who I would happily let have me. She said, 
rubbing her hand down her body. Fiona was gobsmacked that this was happening, and honestly, in his deepest dreams, he had always wished it had. Fiona put his sake down onto the table, and he looked her in the eyes. I have to warn you, May. I'm not the man you think I am. May shushed him as she placed her finger to his lips. We have all done things, Fiona. There is no need to explain to me. She said as she took his hand. Fiona let her pull him from his chair and his body pressed against hers. He was taller than her, and she had to look up into his eyes. Fiona couldn't hold back anymore, and he leaned in, kissing her with heated passion. May returned the kiss, and the two broke into a heated battle for dominance over their lips. It didn't take long for Fiona to wrap his arms around her waist as he pulled her in closer, getting a slight moan from her. May let him as she enjoyed every second. Fiona had to admit he was a little rusty, but he could still remember a few moves. He moved away from her lips and started to kiss down her neck, biting and sucking softly as he did. May couldn't contain her pleaser as she let out a moan, her legs getting weak from the sensation. Fiona broke the kiss away from her neck, and May wrapped her arms around his neck as she pulled him back in for another kiss. She continued to pull him with her as they crashed and banged into the furniture and walls before finally reaching the bedroom. They fell onto the bed with Fiona on top as he broke the kiss, looking into her eyes for a moment. May smiled and wrapped her arms around his neck once more, pulling him in for another kiss. May ripped Fiona's jacket and mesh undershirt, throwing them onto the ground. She noticed how strong and hard his body was as she ran her hands down his back, digging her nails into his skin. Fiona also ripped her blue suit off, exposing her bare upper body, enjoying every part of it with his hands and mouth. May was holding his head and pulling his hair as he sucked and flicked her nipples with his tongue, spending ample time on each of them, getting May hotter and hotter until she couldn't contain it anymore. May flipped him over, using her strength to mount him. She rubbed his chest, letting her hands travel lower and lower before finally taking his and her own pants off. Neither of them could contain their lust for each other any longer as May guided him inside of her, letting out a loud scream of pleaser as she moved her hips back and forth, joining the two of them together as they made love for the rest of the night. Morning came all too fast for Zabuza as the sun shone brightly through one of the small windows. His head was pounding, and he realized he had passed out, spending the night here. Zabuza stood up slowly and noticed the owner and his daughter, who was the maid. Thanks for the sake. He said as he dropped three times the amount of money the bottle was worth on the table. They bowed to him in thanks, clearly still nervous until he left. Zabuza walked out onto the street. It was a cold morning, and the snow was falling heavily with a light mist in the air. Zabuza growled a little as he put his hand on his head. The cold was always good for a hangover, and he turned as he started walking down the street. The trees in the village had a thick layer of snow on them. Zabuza had guessed the snow hadn't let up all night as his footsteps crunched with every step. It was busy as people rushed around going about their business. Of course, Zabuza paid them no attention as he headed over to one of the bridges so he could cross the river. His battle with Fiona was still fresh in his mind, and the sake had done little to make him forget it. Anger filled him as his chest started to get tight. Curse you! Fiona. He growled under his breath as his chakra flared a little. He had been so blinded by his hate that he had failed to notice a small boy who was sat staring at him. The boy appeared to be homeless and had snow piling on his body, indicating he had been there for a while. You have the same eyes as me, mister. He said as he stared into Zabuza's soul with no fear. Zabuza looked at the runt for a moment longer, taking pity on him. He could tell he was weak from hunger and would probably die if he stayed out in the cold much longer. He had medium-length black hair and a black collar around his neck. Zabuza was about to walk away when the boy smiled at him with no fear, triggering something in his cold heart. Well, little one, will you stay here and die a beggar's death? Or will you come with me and be of a little use by serving me and submitting to my will? Zabuza said, waiting for the boy to respond. The boy didn't respond, taking a moment to think about the offer. Finally, he stood up and walked over to Zabuza, looking up to face him. He nodded. 
Zabuza gently placed his hand on the boy's head, rubbing his hair a little. Tell me your name, boy, he said. My name is Haku. Haku Yuki, he said with a blank face. Zabuza's eyes snapped open at the name Yuki. From this day forwards, your abilities belong to me, Zabuza said as he pulled the boy into his side with his hand on his shoulder. Haku could feel the warmth from Zabuza, and at long last, he felt safe. Knowing he was willing to do anything, this man would ask of him. Time to take you home, Zabuza said as they set off, heading back towards the hidden mist. Wait until you see my new ace. Fiona. Zabuza thought to himself as he walked through the village with his new apprentice in hand. Chapter 36 Fiona slowly woke up as the morning sunlight shone through the crack in the blind. His head was pounding from the sake the night before, and he slowly took a look to see where he was. Where am I? He thought to himself as he turned his head to the side. His face suddenly went a little red as his first sight was Maya's exposed chest. Fiona then looked around the room, and the memories came flooding back. Good morning, May said as she stretched, smiling at him before she placed her head on his chest. Fiona smiled back and realized it wasn't a drunken mistake. Good morning, he said, placing a hand on her head. May giggled a little bit before sitting up. Of course, she didn't bother to pull the blanket to cover herself up as she stood, stretching her arms into the air. Would you like some breakfast? She asked, giving him a wink. Fiona couldn't take his eyes off her body, and May had to repeat the question to get his attention. Why yes. Sorry. He said, giving a small laugh. May wasn't bothered, and she walked off, placing a robe on before heading into the kitchen, leaving Fiona alone in the bedroom. What have I done? He thought as the memories of the night before played over and over in his head. It wasn't like he regretted it. In fact, it was the complete opposite. His only worries were where it would lead. It could make things very difficult or awkward between them if he hurt her feelings. After all, Fiona wasn't looking for a relationship right now. Fiona threw the covers back and slowly stepped out of bed as he got out of bed and pulled his pants back on before he joined May in the kitchen. She was currently cooking some eggs while humming to herself as she noticed Fiona enter the room. I put some orange juice on the table for you, oh, and I hope you like scrambled eggs. She said, very cheerfully. Fiona gave a big grin and sat down at the table. Thank you. He said as he poured himself a glass of orange juice, taking a large gulp. May put two plates out and placed some of the eggs on them. They look perfectly cooked, both soft and fluffy. Well, dig in. She said with a smile. Fuyan did just that, and the two of them ate breakfast together with a smile. May pushed her plate away from her a little once she had finished her breakfast and placed her elbows on the table, resting her chin on her hands. I want you to know Fiona. Just because we slept together doesn't mean you have to make a decision to be with me right away. She said, rubbing the edge of her glass slowly. Fiona was still eating and almost choked on his eggs at what she said. He quickly recovered and looked May in the eye to give her a response. I'm glad you think that May. He said. I'm not looking for a relationship at the moment, and with everything that is going on, I have to focus on myself and the village first. I hope you understand. May had to admit she was a little hurt. But she understood, after all, they had the same goal, and the village came first. For the moment. I agree. She said. I want the same thing you do, Fiona. I really do. But mark my words. You will be mine one of these days. She said with a playful wink. Fiona gave a playful smile before he nodded and finished his eggs. He stayed for a little while longer, and the two of them ended up sharing a shower together. Use your imagination. It was around midday now, and it was time for Fiona to take his leave. After all, he had his own business to attend to. He bid May farewell, and she waved to him in her robe. Fiona had thoroughly enjoyed himself, but now it was time to focus on what he needed to do. The first thing on his list was to go and see Hatsu. After all, 
he had left Kimimaro in his care for long enough. Next on his list was to find himself a house to stay in, which shouldn't be too hard giving all the money he had saved over the years. Last was to enroll Kimimaro into the academy. Again it wouldn't be too hard. Once, he visited the head instructor, that was. Fiona arrived at Hatta's house not long after and knocked on the door. Hatta's wife answered and let him in, greeting him and showing him to where Kimimaro was. The kid was currently sitting in the garden as he played with the birds, he looked happy, and Fiona smiled at the sight. Kimimaro noticed his presence and turned around, running over to him. You're back, Lord Yuki. He said with a big smile on his face. Fiona was taken back by his greeting and put his hand on his head, rubbing his hair. Good to see you again, kid, but what's with the Lord Yuki? He said. Kimimaro laughed as he pulled away to sort his hair out. It's what Mr. Hatsu said I should call you. Fiona sighed but smiled. Well, Fiona is just fine. Kimimaro was surprised by how relaxed Fiona was with his name but did as he asked. Where is Hatsu? Fiona asked, noticing that he wasn't around. He has been summoned for a mission. He said he could be away for a week at most. His wife said, Fiona nodded as he grabbed Kimimaro's shoulder. Thank you for taking care of him for me. We will get out of your hair for now. When Hatsu returns, tell him to come and see me. Fiona said, giving her a small bow. She returned his bow. Please, it was my pleasure. She said with a warm smile. With that, Fiona took Kimimaro and left, heading into the village. First thing was first, he thought as he looked at Kimimaro's clothes. We need to get you out of those clothes, Fiona said, knowing that wearing the Kagaya symbol was not a good idea around here at the moment. For the time being, Fiona had given the lad a black cloak to wear over his other clothing as he took him to a clothing shop. Kimamaro was amazed to see what life was like inside the village. He had spent most of his youth locked in a cage due to the others. Being scared of his abilities. This way, kid, Fiona said as he noticed Kimamaro was getting distracted. Kimamaro took his eyes off what he was looking at and ran after him to catch up. Fiona had taken him to one of the only other shops that were still open or one that could still afford to be open. He was baffled at the extortionate prices they were currently charging, but he could understand that they had no other choice. Fiona picked a couple of sets of essential training gear and regular clothes for the kid to wear and took them to the till. Once he had paid for them, he made Kimimaro get changed into a set of black training gear consisting of a black t-shirt with black three-quarter pants, as well as some black training shoes. This way, no one will recognize you are from the Kagaya clan. Fiona thought to himself as he gave Kimimaro a nod of approval. Kimimaro was more than excited. It was the first time anyone had ever given him a new pair of clothes, and Fiona could tell how happy he was. All right, kid, calm it down a little he said. Kimimaro nodded as he stopped running around in excitement. Let's go, he said as they left the shop. Fiona noticed that Kimamaro had been looking at one of the shop vendors who was selling sweets before they went into the clothes shop. He couldn't help himself, and he went over to get one. It was a two-handle ice pop for sharing, and Fiona snapped half off, giving it to Kimamaro. Here, kid, enjoy, he said, smiling at him. Kimimaro was shocked at how kind Fiona was. So shocked, in fact, that he almost started to cry. Now, now, kid, let's not start the waterworks. I told you I'd look after you now, didn't I? Kimimaro nodded as he took the ice pop. Now follow me, Fiona said as he continues to walk down the street. Keep up, kid, I won't tell you again. Fiona didn't have to look to recognize that gruff voice. Fiona turned the corner and stopped as he suddenly came face to face with none other than the demon of the mist. Zabuza, he said. Zabuza noticed Fiona right away, and he also stopped as they entered a standoff in the middle of the street. I'm sorry, Master Zabuza. A small boy said as he ran to catch up, stopping behind Zabuza, as he noticed Fiona. Kimamaro also stopped behind Fiona, still licking his ice pop as he noticed the two staring at each other. Fiona. 
Zabuza said, not impressed to see him as usual. Fiona took a good look at the boy he was with, and the clods in his mind started to turn. Haku. He almost said out loud, surprised that Zabuza had still found the boy. Zabuza noticed Kimimaro, who was standing behind Fiona, and scoffed. You taking on street rats now? He said mockingly. Fiona smiled. I could say the same to you. Not like you to adopt a kid. Zabuza smirked from behind his mask. This one is special. Once I have trained him, he will be a weapon, unlike any other. Fiona looked at the child and sighed. I can tell he is special, all right. He said as he raised his hand slowly. Zabuza looked at Fiona, cocking an eyebrow at him. What are you playing at? He said, confused. Fiona allowed eyes to suddenly form on his hand slowly as they molded it into a small sculpture of Haku. Haku was shocked. Can you do this too? He asked as he extended his arm towards Haku to show him. Enough! Zabuza shouted as he slapped Fiona's arm away, the ice sculpture of Haku hitting the ground and shattering. In almost the blink of an eye, Kimimaro had dashed towards Zabuza, attacking him with full force. Zabuza had, of course, seen the attack coming and was about to counterattack. However, Kimimaro stopped in his tracks as Haku did the same thing, countering Kimimaro's advance towards his master. Kimamaro was shocked that Haku had been able to counter him, and the two of them jumped back, each landing next to their masters. That's enough, Kimimaro, Fiona said. Kimimaro allowed his bones to slide back into his skin, getting a surprised reaction from both Sabuza and Haku. Pull back, Haku, you don't stand a chance against that kid just yet. He said, looking at Fiona. So you found yourself an apprentice, did you, Zabuza said, giving a slight chuckle. Fiona was surprised at Haku's speed. He could tell the boy had had no training yet and acted on pure instinct to protect Zabuza. Zabuza, Fiona said in a deep voice, getting his attention. Why do you want this child? He said. Zabuza was surprised by his question but could tell Fiona had gotten serious. What does it matter to you? Without me, he would have died already. He belongs to me now, so mind your own business. Fiona took a breath to calm himself as he looked at Haku and then back to Zabuza. My name is Fiona Yuki. He said, getting a small reaction from Haku as it was the same as his name. As the last living member of the Yuki clan, I have a right to claim that child with you, Zabuza, and you know it. Zabuza's hand twitched as the hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. He knew he couldn't defeat Fiona. The last time they had fought was evidence enough of that. Not going to happen, Zabuza said, getting ready to defend himself if it came down to it. Fiona looked at Haku and could tell he was scared. He took another breath as he withdrew his anger and let his seriousness settle in an attempt to put the lad at ease. Haku, is it? Fiona said, getting the boy's attention. Haku Yuki. Like me, you are one of the last of your clan he said. I can teach you how to use your abilities far beyond Zabuza could. Together we could rebuild the Yuki clan. I will give you a choice. You can either serve a cold existence under this man, or you can come with me and be cared for, being taught how to use your abilities to their best. Fiona said, putting the choice in his hands. Haku was shocked beyond belief. He had no idea that there were other people that could use the same power as him. He had no idea he came from a clan and was one of the last remaining members. The memories of his mother flooded his mind as he remembered her reaction to his abilities. Then the memories of how his father killed her for having them and almost killing him before he used them to save himself. He had been told he was a monster, that he was cursed and would burn in hell. He was told that he was wicked and that he should never use his abilities again. You dare try and steal my slave from me. Zabuza shouted in anger. He is not a slave, Zabuza. He is Haku of the Yuki clan. And he is under my protection. Even from you. Fiona shouted as his chakra flared to life. The pressure was so strong that Zabuza felt like his body was made of lead. 
Haku and Kimimaro dropped to their knees from the weight of it, and Fiona quickly allowed it to settle, having proved his point. Zabuza growled as he backed off a little, knowing he couldn't win. Take him if that's what you want. But know this, Yuki. One day I will kill you if it's the last thing I do. Zabuza shouted as he suddenly threw a smoke bomb to cover his escape. Haku covered his eyes from the smoke in surprise. Once it cleared, he was clearly in shock as Zabuza had disappeared, leaving him here alone. Master Zabuza! Haku shouted as he turned around in every direction, looking for him. Where did you go? He shouted again as he wasn't even sure where to look for him. I'm afraid he is gone, kid, Fiona said with a heavy sigh. He said he would look after me. I was supposed to be his weapon. Haku said in disbelief that he had abandoned him so quickly. Fiona felt terrible for the kid. He felt awful that he had split him up from Zabuza, knowing how important their role together should have been. He wasn't just being selfish. No. He was doing what was best for himself, the village and Haku. Zabuza never cared about you, Haku, Fiona said, getting his attention. He only wanted to use you as a tool. Haku fell to his knees, feeling as if he had been abandoned once again. Kimimaro walked over to Haku, surprising Fiona. If he remembered correctly, they were the same age. Kimimaro offered his hand to Haku, who looked up at him confused. Mr. Fiona is kind. He is strong, and he will take care of you, just like me. He said, smiling at Haku. Haku was taken back by his compassion towards him. Fiona walked over to the two of them and placed his hand on Kimimaro's shoulder, offering Haku his other hand. I promise you both. I will look after you and teach you everything I know. Together you will help me change this nation into a place that is safe for all to live. Haku could see Fiona in a new light as he listened to his words. Slowly he reached his hands out to take Kimimaro's and Fiona's at the same time. They pulled the boy to his feet, and Fiona placed his hand on his shoulder just like he had done with Kimimaro. All right, boys, what say we go and find a new house where we can stay, eh? With that said, Fiona took Kimimaro and Haku with him. He had never planned to take them in as his students, but then again, he had not planned for a lot of things that had happened in this world. Fiona headed to the housing clerk, the one that dealt with Shinobi leaving quarters. Now that he had two others that would be staying with him, he would need a bigger place than his last apartment. Fiona entered the office and could see the head clerk sorting out some paperwork. He was also a hidden Miss Shinobi, yet he rarely saw combat these days. Fiona walked over to the desk and cleared his throat. The clerk didn't bother to look up as he kept writing whatever he was writing. The office is closed at the moment. Come back later, he said. Fiona cleared his throat once more and crossed his arms over his chest. The clerk looked up, seeing that whoever it was, wasn't going to take no for an answer. Look, pal, I said the officer is Klaus. He started before he realized who Fiona was. Ay, ay, ay. You were saying? Fiona said as he crossed his arms. Ice devil of the mist. Fucking kage killer. Of all the people to come into my office. He thought to himself as he quickly closed the documents in front of him. And my apologies, sir. How can I help you? He asked, being much more polite. I need a house, one with at least three rooms, Fiona said bluntly. Right. Let me take a look at what we have. He said as he pulled out a large document with the current houses available. He started to flick through them, using the index to find what he was looking for. Ah yes, as luck would have it, I have just the place. He said, showing Fiona a picture of it. The place looked a little run down, but the outside grounds were extensive, with plenty of space. It was an old livestock storage area that was converted into a house. Complete with three bedrooms, large outdoor space and a large indoor hall full of junk. However, it is a little on the pricey side. Fiona checked the pictures and then looked at the price. He wasn't kidding. It was currently listed at 750,000 Rio. Fiona sighed and thought about it hard. All right, I'll take it. 
he said as he summoned an ice mirror, reaching his arm through it and pulling out a large bag of money. A few moments later, once they had counted out the money, the clerk filled the paperwork out and signed a couple of documents before asking Fiona to sign a couple of times. All right, that's all complete. Congratulations on your new home. He said as he gave Fiona the paperwork proving that he now owned the property as signed by the clerk of the village hidden in the mist. Fiona took it and walked out of his office to find Kimamaro and Haku waiting for him patiently. All right, boys, how about we go and see our new home? He said. Both of them nodded in excitement, and the three of them went off to see their new home. Meanwhile, Zabuza had retreated, leaving Haku with Fiona. He knew he couldn't defeat him, yet the rage he felt towards him was burning hotter and hotter. Curse you, Yuki! He said as he punched a tree he was sat by, shattering its bark with one blow. Zabuza was no pushover. He had mastered all of the seven swords that the village still had access to, yet, choice to wild none of them as they didn't suit his current fighting style. He was currently twenty years old and already considered an S-rank ninja. But for all his power, he still paled in comparison to Fiona. I have learned all I can hear. This village is doing nothing but holding me back now. He said as he stood to his full height, overlooking the village from the hillside he was stood on. Mark my words, Fiona. One day you will pay. He said before he disappeared into the mist, leaving the village once and for all. Fuen, Haku, and Kimamaro arrived at the house and could see it was a little run down. It had clearly been vacant for a while now and needed a good clean. It was very large with a large front and back garden as it was located on the village's edge. It had a large living area, a huge kitchen and three very spacious bedrooms with two bathrooms to boot. All in all, it was perfect. Fiona walked through into the back garden and could see the large storage unit. It looked like an old barn that had just been used to throw a load of crap into. But Fiona saw it for more. He saw it for what it could be. He knew that once they cleared all of the crap out of it, he could turn it into a training hall, one where he could train the boys in secret. Okay then, Fiona said, getting Haku's and Kimamaru attention. First thing is first, boys. It's time to get cleaning. He shouted as he made the hand signs to create some ice clones. Chapter 37 Fiona along with the help of his clones and Haku and Kimimaro, had cleaned the entire house in record time. They had also gotten rid of all of the junk and rubbish, painted, sanded and even added a few extras to the place. Fiona stood outside as he admired his handiwork looking at what had been a large barn full of crap. He had now turned into a large dojo and training area that he would use to help train the boys. Take a good look, he said to both of them as they stood by his side. You will be spending a lot of time in this dojo, Fiona said as he opened the large doors to enter inside. The space was large and wide, the floors a smooth wooden surface with plenty of room to move. It was empty for now, but Fiona could add more things in time. For now, there was no rush. Haku and Kimimaro followed him inside as they, too, took a good look around. What are we doing here, Master Fiona? Haku asked. Please. Haku. It's just Fiona. But if it makes you feel better, you can call me Sensei. Haku nodded with a smile, yes, Fiona Sensei. Fiona couldn't help but smile. The word Sensei was something he never thought he would be called. All right then, boys, today will be your first test so I can see where your current strengths lie. He said as he made the hand signs to create an ice clone. Haku and Kimimaro looked amazed and watched as the clone walked to the center of the dojo. You will fight one of my ice clones until you cannot fight anymore, or you win. He said, giving them a smirk. Haku looked a little nervous, and Kimimaro had a blank expression on his face. Feel free to attack me any time you are ready. The clone said as it crossed its arms. Haku took a ready stance as he wasn't sure how to approach, but Kimimaro simply charged in without any concern. So you're first, Fiona said as Kimimaro charged in, jumping into the air as he attacked with a spinning kick. Fiona dodged the attack and sidestepped, creating some distance between them. 
Kimimaro followed it up with another charge as he attacked with a flurry of different attacks. Fiona dodged and blocked them all as he slapped Kimimaro hand away before using a small burst of wind-style chakra to send him flying across the room and sliding across the smooth wooden floor. Not bad, Kimimaro, but too hasty, Fiona said. He quickly turned around as he blocked a heel kick to his head from Haku, who flipped back, landing in a squat before he ran in, throwing a small handful of punches. Fiona could tell he was acting out of pure instinct and didn't know how to fight just yet. Fiona easily batted Haku's punches away and grabbed his wrist before sweeping him to the ground. Haku hit the floor and clutched his chest as he tried to get his breath back. Maybe I should have started by teaching him how to fight before throwing him in the deep end. Fiona thought as he turned back around to deal with Kimimaro. Kimimaro had charged in again. He had bones sticking out of his body as he twisted in the air, trying to hit Fiona with them. He also slashed at him with his arms as he held two blades, one in each of them. He was fast, and Fiona could tell he was already stronger than most Jinin and even churning level ninja. Fiona allowed a bond blade to appear in his own hand as he blocked and parried each of Kimimaro's attacks before he kicked him back with a bit of force. Kimimaro used the bones of his ribs to block the attack and flipped onto his feet. He's a natural. Fiona said, impressed at his ability. Suddenly his senses kicked in as he jumped out of the way of a large formation of ice spikes from Haku. Fiona flipped through the air and quickly blocked another assault from Kimimaro as he tried to catch him off guard by attacking Madeira. Fiona blocked three swipes at his body before he grabbed Kimimaro's training shirt and threw him over to the other side of the dojo. Kimimaro landed hard but was eagerly able to flip back to his feet unharmed. Fiona landed back onto the ground, and Haku rushed in, attacking again as he refused to give up or lose to Kimimaro. Kimimaro joined him, and the two of them fed off each other's attacks as they got faster and faster. Fiona was amazed at their ability but decided enough was enough. Quickly Fiona booked a kick from Haku with his shin and stopped Kimimaro's bone blade with his own, using his free hand to create a couple of quick hand signs. Suddenly ice froze around Haku and Kimimaro's feet as the two of them became stuck on the spot. Not bad boys, not bad at all. The clone said before it melted into water. Haku and Kimimaro looked surprised and then turned around as the real Fiona walked over to them and released the jutsu, freeing their legs from the ice. That is enough sparring, for now, boys. He said as he crossed his arms. The best thing I can do for them is to get them enrolled into the academy. That way, they will learn all of the basics without me having to be here all the time. He thought. Right, you two stay here. He said as he made another clone. What about you, Fiona Sensei? Kimimaro asked. I have some important matters to attend to but my clone here is going to give you some training to work on while I'm gone. He said as he patted each of them on their head. Both of them smiled, and Fiona left the boys with his clone as he headed out for the academy. Fiona hadn't been here since he had graduated at the same age Haku and Kimimaro were now. The place had changed a lot over the years, and the kids here looked a lot happier than they had when he was there. Fiona walked through the grounds and could see a few of the classes that were taking place. Some were practicing taijutsu while others were training with shuriken. He had to say the training seemed a lot softer than he remembered, but that was probably for the best. Fiona entered into the academy's main building, where he knew the instructors spent most of their time. He walked all the way through the hall without bumping into anyone until, finally, he reached a large office that was labeled head instructor. Fiona didn't bother knocking and opened the door, to the head instructor's surprise. What are you doing? He asked as Fiona walked in unannounced. The head instructor's eyes opened wide as he realized just who it was that had walked into his office. Why you? He said in shock as he recognized who he was. Good to see you again, Fiona said, remembered the man. He had met him long ago, back during the war. Leaving a powerful impression as he was pretty sure he had threatened to kill him. What does the Kage killer want with me? He asked, not standing from his chair. Fiona smiled as he sat down across from him on one of the other chairs. Long time no see. Fiona said as he tried to think if his name. 
It's Shibata Yuji. The man said, jogging Fiona's memory. Yes, Shibata. Well, I need a favor. Fiona said as he crossed his legs. The head instructor felt very nervous but decided to play along. What kind of favor? I would like to enroll two students at the academy, Fiona said in an innocent tone. Shibata almost breathed a sigh of relief after hearing the request. However, he couldn't help ask questions. So, how old are these students? He asked as he grabbed a pen and paper. They are eight years old, Fiona said. Perfect age. Do they have names? Shibata asked. Kimimaro and Haku, Fiona said, leaving their last names out. Right. He said as he finished writing the request forms out before handing them to Fiona to sign. I can't help but wonder, just why do you want these boys to enter the academy? Shibata asked. Fiona signed the part to say he was their guardian and looked at Shibata in the eye. Let's just say I owe them this much, Fiona said, giving him a stern glance. That was all Shibata needed to know as he decided his life wasn't worth the risk. That's all done. When are you looking for them to start? He asked. Tomorrow, Fiona replied as he left the office. Shibata leaned back in his chair and wiped the sweat off his brow. That was the first time he had seen Fiona since all those years ago, and if anything, he felt more threatening now than ever before. Fiona left the academy grounds pleased with his handy work. All of a sudden, Ao appeared next to him as he greeted him with a nod. I've been looking all over for you, Fiona. He said, placing his hand on his hip. What's the matter, Ao? He asked. We have been summoned by Lord Forth. He wants to see us now. Ao said, seeming concerned. Is that right, Fiona said. You think he knows? Ao asked. Fiona shook his head. No. Let's go and see what he wants. Fiona said, convinced that Abito wasn't on to him. Both of them reported to the Mizukage's office and reported for duty. Ah yes, Ao, Fiona. Come in and shut the door. Yagura said. All of the elders were also present, along with Faguki and Kisame. Now that you are here, we can get down to business, Yagura said as he stood up and looked out of the large window. I have received word that Zabuza Momochi has left the village and gone rouge, Yagura said, turning to face them. Fiona was shocked by the news and knew it was his actions that must have driven him to leave. So, the demon of the mist is a traitor now. Kisame said, as a previous Umbu captain and member of the Seven Swordsmen. This is unacceptable. Fuguki said, outraged. Imagine the secrets he could sell to our enemies. He continued to say. Yagura raised his hand for silence before he spoke. That makes three members of the Seven Swordsmen that have gone rouge now. Luckily, only two of them took their swords. The Mizukage said. I want a full squad sent after him to track him down and kill him. Is that understood? Yagura said, his voice serious. Ao, I leave that in your hands. He said before he sat down. Ao nodded. Right away, Lord Mizukage. He said as he left the room quickly. Yagura sighed as Ao left the room. I'm afraid there are more pressing matters to attend to. He continued. The San have attacked our borders once again, targeting villages that are under my protection. If we are not careful, this could result in a full-scale war between our villages. He said, interlocking his fingers. The others in the room remained silent as they listened to the news. The only reason they were here now was that they were the strongest shinobi in the entire village, and clearly, Yagura trusted them the most. I have arranged a meeting between myself and the fifth Kazakage. It will take place in one week's time. Fiona, I want you by my side as well as you, Faguki. He said, looking at them. Kisame couldn't help himself and stepped forwards. What about me, Lord Forth? He asked. Don't worry, Kisame. I have another mission for you. He said with a smile. With that, they were dismissed, and all of them left the room. 
Fiona couldn't help wonder just how powerful of a Jinjutsu had been placed on Yagura. Most of the time, he seemed like his usual self, but Fiona knew that Abido was controlling him, using him and the village for his own gain. Fiona couldn't help think that Abido would want this war to erupt between the sand and mist. No doubt the conflict would draw others in, which could lead to another great ninja war. I have to stop him before the meeting with the Kazakage. Or else we could end up at war. Fiona said to himself as he tried to think of all of the possible outcomes. It was no good though, as all of the thinking and planning started to give him a headache. All he knew was that now the plan to rescue or kill the Mizukage had to be brought forwards. As if on K.A.O. arrived to talk with Fiona. Perfect timing A.O. He said as he greeted him. We have to move up the plan. We can't afford for the Mizukage to be controlled and end up taking us to war. Fiona said, clearly worried about it. A.O. was shocked. What are you talking about? He asked. Fiona told him about the hidden sand attacking and that the two Kage were meeting in secret and trying to settle it. Ao was shocked by the news and came to the same conclusion as Fiona. I didn't think we would have such little time to act. But we can't allow this to go on. He said. Fiona agreed. That settles it. Tomorrow we will attempt to rescue the Mizukage from the Jinjutsu. He said. Ao nodded. Right. I guess I better hold off on capturing Zabuza until this is all sorted out. He said. Fiona nodded. You know Fiona. If this goes south and we can't save him, the village will need a new Mizukage. Ao said, looking at him. Fiona raised an eyebrow as he looked at Ao. What are you trying to say, Ao? I think you know what. He said before he gave him a small nodded and vanished. Fiona hadn't thought about that. He had to be careful how he handled this whole situation as he could easily be seen for grabbing power himself. Hopefully, it wouldn't come to that. Fiona headed down the street as he made his way home. He walked past one of the few children playgrounds as he did. To his surprise, it was empty, without a child in sight. Fiona almost felt sad at the sight and turned away. Fiona! Is that you? A soft voice called out from behind him. Fiona turned around slowly as he recognized the voice but couldn't place it. He turned and took in the sight of the person as they ran over to him to say hello. It is you, Fiona. I heard you were back in the village. I always knew there was no way you had gone rouge. The woman said as she brushed her blonde hair out of her face. Esuerin. Fiona muttered as he remembered who she was. You remember me. That's good. I was hoping you would. It has been years since we have seen each other, though. She said with a bright smile. Fiona was very surprised, to say the least, as he took in all of her features. Swearin. He said, smiling at her. It has been a long time. How are you? He asked. Swearin returned his smile as she couldn't help notice how handsome he had gotten, her cheeks turning a little red as she got a better look at him. I'm well, thank you. She said, brushing one of her bangs over her ear. Fiona ended up walking all of the way home with Swearin as they talked about the past and what they had been up to over the years. I have just got back from a mission, and well, of course, I already have another mission a few days from now. She said, sighing. Fiona laughed a little. It sounds like you have been busy, Swearin. He said as he stopped outside his house. Swearin didn't realize and kept walking as she continued to talk. Yeah, something about a mission to do with the Cypher Division, apparently we even need a member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen to be our bodyguard. She said before turning on her heels, realizing she had walked off. Oh, I'm sorry. She said as she walked back over to him. I was in my own little world. She said with a shy smile. Fiona couldn't help but think about what she had said. Something about the cipher division just didn't sit well in his head. Hey Swearin, why don't you come in for some tea, and we can catch up, Fiona said as he opened the gate. Swearin looked at the large house and almost had to close her mouth. Is this your house? Yeah, I just got it. 
So how about that tea? He said as he opened the front door. Swearin took a moment but quickly nodded her head as she followed him inside. Fiona took her to the kitchen, where they could sit down around the table and chat for a while. He placed the kettle on the stove and prepared the teacups before sitting opposite Swearin and giving her a smile. Swearin was a little nervous and tried her best not to blush at his smile. So, Swearin, you were saying something about a mission with the Cypher Division? Fiona asked. Swearin nodded as her shyness went away. Yes, sorry. I know I'm not supposed to tell you, but I feel so at ease around you it just slipped out. She said. What about the part where a member of the Ninja Swordsman will be your bodyguard? Fiona asked, leaning towards her a little. She was a little taken back by his advance, and she leaned back a little, not sure what to do. Well, rumor has it that our bodyguard will be Kisame Hashigaki. She said, giving him the information. The clogs inside his brain turned and twisted as his memory suddenly flared to life. When did you say you were going on this mission? Fiona asked, trying not to seem too panicked. It's not tomorrow but the day after, Swearin said. Fiona was about to say something, but the whistle of the kettle cut him off. He looked over to the kettle and then back to Swearin. I'll get the tea, he said with a smile. Fiona turned the stove off and started to pour the boiling water into the cups. If you were right, Kisame would kill the entire team on this mission at the orders of Fuguki. Then he would kill him and take his sword before Abito would reveal himself to him and recruit him into the Akatsuki. This information changed his whole plan, and he would have to notify Ao about it. If Abito would reveal himself to Kisame, then perhaps he could set up an ambush to undo the Jinjutsu. His choice now was between a battle against the Mizukage and the Three Tails. Or potentially Abito and Kisame. He would have to think long and hard about his decision before he came up with a plan. However, first thing was first. He had to stop Swearin from going on that mission. Fiona had finished pouring the tea and placed Swearin's cup next to her on the table. Make sure to blow. It's hot, he said as he sat back down. Swearin's eyes opened a little wide as her cheeks went red before she grabbed her teacup. Tea thanks, she said. Fiona didn't think anything of it and sipped his tea slowly. So, how are your teammates? Do you see them much? Fiona asked. Swearin regained her composure and sipped her tea. Yes, they are doing well. Gonryu is in the Umbu tracking unit now, and Junsai is an instructor at the academy. She said with a smile. Fiona was glad to hear they were doing well. After all, Swearin and Junsai had both been killed in the original story. How long have you been a member of the Cypher Division? Fiona asked. For about a month now. Lord Faguki is very strict, but my teammates are friendly. She said. That's good. It always helps when you get along with your teammates. Fiona said, placing his teacup down on the table. Swearin nodded. Yes, that is very true. She said as the conversation went a little quiet. Fiona hadn't realized just yet as he was still trying to think of a way to stop her going on that mission. Swearin sat there feeling a little awkward. She couldn't help but notice the serious expression on his face. What is it, Fiona? Is something the matter? She asked, still holding her teacup with both hands. Fiona snapped out of his daydream, realizing he had been quiet for too long, making the atmosphere a little awkward. Sorry, Swearin. I was in my own little world for a moment there. He said. Swearin waved her hands, it's all right. I do it myself quite often. Fiona noticed her smile and her perfect teeth. Unlike most Miss Shinobi, they were not filled down to use as a weapon. She was a pretty woman, and he couldn't help be attracted to her. I'm sorry, Swearin, but this is for your own good, Fiona said as he suddenly started forming hand signs. Swearin looked very surprised at what he was doing, so surprised she had failed to even move. The mission you are about to go on is a decoy, and Kisame will kill every one of you. I can't order you to go on it, but I can seal it and this conversation from your memory. Fiona said as he finished the hand signs. 
Swearin pushed her chair back as she stood to her feet, feeling a little scared of what was happening. F. Fiona, what are you doing? She shouted as she raised her hands in defense. It was no use, though, as Fiona cleared the gap faster than she could blink and placed his hand on her forehead, enacting the sealing jutsu he was using. I will seal your memories of this entire conversation and the knowledge of your mission and duty. Once the jutsu is undone, all of the memories will return to you. I only hope you can forgive me. Fiona said as he activated the jutsu. Suerin's eyes opened wide as the seal set on her forehead. Her body relaxed, and her eyes closed as she started to fall to the ground. Fiona caught her in his arms and looked at her peaceful face. I'm sorry about this, Suerin, but there is nothing else I can do to save you. Please forgive me. With that, Fiona took Suerin back home and put her in bed. She would have no memory of what had happened and no memory of her mission. This way, Fiona could save her life again. Fiona returned home and decided it was time to check on the boys. Haku and Kimimaro had been training all day now, and Fiona looked forward to seeing their progress. He entered the, the dojo and could see his clone standing over them. Guess I had better release the jutsu and see what they have been doing, Fiona said as he did just that. All the knowledge of his ice clone came rushing into his mind, and he smiled at their progress. Haku and Kimimaro had now noticed the real Fiona was back, and they rushed over to greet him. You're back, Fiona Sensei, Kimimaro said excitedly. Haku did the same, and both of them looked happy. So boys, why don't we review your progress? Chapter 38 The next day arrived faster than expected as Fiona slowly pulls himself out of bed. Today was the first day Haku and Kimimaro would be attending the academy, and they had been up late with excitement. Fiona pulled his clothes on and walked down the hall to open their bedroom doors to wake them. However, they weren't there. Where the hell have they gone? He thought as he walked down the stairs. Haku and Kimimaro were sat at the table to his surprise. Each of them sitting quietly with an empty plate in front of them. Good morning, Fiona Sensei. They both greeted with a slight bow. Good morning, boys. Have you eaten already? He asked, noticing the empty plates. No. We were waiting for you, Sensei. Haku said with a sheepish look. Fiona gave a big chuckle as he walked over to him and patted his head. Don't be silly. While you stay with me, you can eat as much as you like. No more starving. Fiona said with a severe tone. Both of them seemed as if they were about to cry, and Fiona quickly changed the subject. Now who's hungry? He said, getting a cheer. After Fiona cooked them all breakfast, he told them to go and get ready for their first day as it was almost time to head out. They did just that, and Fiona walked them down towards where they would be spending a lot of time. All right, boys, remember. Try not to use your keki jinkai as best you can, and don't kill any of the teachers or other kids, all right? Both Kimaro and Haku looked at him and gave a nod. We promise Fiona Sensei. They both said. Good. Now go and have fun. He said as he patted both of them on the shoulder, sending them inside the academy. Fiona watched as they went in with the other kids, and he couldn't help feeling like a proud father. I will do my best to make you strong. Fiona thought to himself as he watched them vanish inside. He didn't linger for long as he turned around and walked away. After all, he had more pressing matters to attend to. Today was the day he had arranged a meeting with Ao and as many followers they could gather within the village's ranks. It was tough as they had to choose those that would be willing to fight and those that would not betray them. That left mostly only the subordinate of the leading members of the coup. Hopefully, Ao would work some magic, but Fiona doesn't want to get his hopes up. Fiona headed to the secret location that the two of them had set. It was an old warehouse that had been abandoned and boarded up. Ao had scouted it out using his Byakugan, finding it had a large underground storage area that was empty. Fiona had already placed a ceiling tag inside it and entered an ice mirror, slipping out onto the platform as he joined Ao and the others. Everyone was a little shocked at his entrance and suddenly went quiet at his arrival. 
Fiona hadn't realized there would be so many here, and at a glance, he counted around sixty shinobi. Sorry, I'm late, he said to Ao. It's no bother, Ao said as he walked over to address the crowd of shinobi. Better late than never, Fiona, May said, giving him a little wink as she walked over to greet him. He hadn't seen her since their night together. And morning, and he felt a little bad. Hey May, good to see you're here. He said, not letting himself feel awkward. May smiled and crossed her arms over her chest, doing the same. After all, they were both adults. Fiona. A male voice that Fiona recognized called out. Fiona turned around with a smile on his face as he greeted Hatsu. Hatsu, glad to see you got my message about the meeting. He said with a smile. Hatsu nodded. That's right. He said as he pointed his hand to a man behind him. You remember Kaga. He said as the blonde-haired man greeted him. It's good to see you again, Captain Yuki. He shouted with a razor-sharp smile on his face. Fiona remembered that the last time he had seen Kaga was just after the whole Kazakage battle. He was glad to see he was still alive and well. Good to see you too, Kaga, Fiona said with a smile. Ao suddenly spoke up as he got everyone's attention. All right, you lot, settle down. He shouted. Now, I have asked you all to gather here at the wish of a good friend of mine. He said as he stepped aside, allowing Fiona to take center stage. Everyone in the crowd started to whisper amongst themselves as they recognized who he was. Fiona let them chat for a moment longer before he allowed his presence to spread, demanding respect and authority. Thank you, Ao. He said as he took center stage. My name is Fiona Yuki. He said, letting it sink in. I have asked Ao and the others behind me to gather you here today to speak about something that may seem hard to believe. He paused for a moment as he let his words sink in. It has come to my attention that our Mizukage is under a powerful Jinjutsu. He said, getting a hasty reaction. Everyone suddenly burst out into murmurs as they couldn't help contain their thoughts. I know this is hard to believe. But he is being controlled, doing the bidding of another who is using him and our village for their own gain. Everyone was talking louder and louder now as they couldn't believe the news. Why should we believe you? A voice shouted. Yeah, you're one of those tailed beast monsters. Another man shouted. Fiona didn't respond as everyone else in the crowd started to shout at him. That's enough. A voice shouted over them all, coming from the center of the crowd. Fiona looked to see who it was, surprised when he saw Gonryu, who was the team leader of the team Swearin was a part of. Those of you who know me know that I don't allow myself to follow others blindly. He said, getting their attention. Gonryu was a respected member of the Umbu tracking unit and had completed many missions, holding a high success rate. I have worked with Captain Yuki here before. If he says, it's true. Then it is. He said, daring anyone to challenge him. Ao also stepped forwards. It is true. I have seen it with my Byakugan. He said, getting a shocked reaction from everyone there. That's right. Fiona here is the only one of us who noticed it. Now you had better listen to what he has to say. May said as she flicked her hair, getting a glance from all of the men in the room. Fiona waited for it to go quiet again before he spoke. I have reason to believe that the one controlling our Mizukage is Madara Uchiha. He said, this time getting a seriously shocking reaction from everyone and not just the crowd. Even Ao was shocked at the news as he looked to May to see if she knew this. She shook her head and looked just as surprised as he did. I know this is hard to hear. But we must act. We must act before it is too late for our village. Before this, oppressor uses our Mizukage to start another war. Fiona said. This time no one spoke up against him, and they all eagerly awaited him to continue. Myself and the others here. He said, jesting to Ao, Mei, Hatsu, and Kaga behind him have come up with a plan to break the Jinjutsu and hopefully save the Mizukage. If we can help it, we wish to avoid a battle at all costs. 
This time Ao took the center as he spoke. Our plan is to lure the Mazukij out of the village as far as we can get him so that if things get ugly, we can limit the destruction and number of casualties. He said, crossing his arms behind his back. It will be your job to stop any who remain loyal to the Mazukij through blind trust from attempting to intervene in the battle, if it comes to that, Ao said. We wish to avoid a civil war if we can help it. But if not, we will need every able-bodied man and woman to help fight for our village's freedom. May said, stepping forward. The crowd of shinobi were starting to feel motivated as Ao and May stepped up, telling them the plan. Fiona had counted on this, as the two of them were high in the ranks and held a lot of respect among the village forces. Kaga and Hatsu had also risen in the ranks, making it to unit captains and held a lot of respect from their own troops. Fiona felt lucky to have made so many allies along his journey up until now, and he stepped forwards as Ao moved aside for him. Fiona Yuki will leave this operation as the strongest here. He is the only one who can break the Jinjutsu on the Mizukage. His word will be law for this mission. No one said a word as they already knew his reputation. Being hailed as a Kage killer at the age of 14 was no joking matter. All right. The mission will take place two days from now. There will only be one signal if things don't go to plan. I think you all know what it will be, he said. The plan's full details had been laid out, and the crowd of shinobi was dismissed, leaving only the leaders on the stage and Gonryu left in attendance. Ao turned around to Fiona and asked what was on everyone's minds. How do you know it is Madara Uchiha? Fiona was expecting the question from one of them and crossed his arms. I thought he was long dead by now, May said. Fiona nodded in response to their questions. It is true that I didn't tell you at first. I wanted to gather a little more information before we made a move. But now, my suspicions have come true. Do you remember hearing about the attack of the nine-tailed fox on the hidden leaf five years ago? He said. They all nodded as they came closer to listen to him. Well, it is beloved that Madara took control of the Nine Tails and battled the fourth Okage. The others gasped as he told them. How do you know all this? Kage asked. While I was away for three years, I wasn't just training. I was gathering as much intel as I could about the current events of the world. That is how I stumbled upon this information. Fiona said, telling an excellent lie. He didn't want to lie to them, but he had no choice. After all, they would never believe the truth even if he told them. If it comes down to it, I will be the one to battle against Madara or the Mizukage. He said. But Fiona, I can, May said. No. He said, cutting her off. If the mission goes south and we have to fight, I will need you and Ao to keep the others busy. We still have a few members of the Seven Swordsmen who remain loyal to the Mizukage and could pose a problem. May didn't like it, but she backed down, knowing she wasn't as strong as he was. Ao agreed with Fiona and listed the potential best matchups in case it came to a fight. Lord Faguki and Kisame will pose a huge danger. May is the only one here other than Fiona who would stand a chance against them. Ao said, Don't forget about that kid. Mangetsu Ozuki. Hatsu said, reminding them. He was one of the only members of the Seven who had mastered all of the swords he had used and was considered an S rank ninja, not to be taken lightly due to his age. Fiona remembered who he was and had yet to cross paths with him just yet. What about Zabuza? May asked, noticing he wasn't here today. Fiona sighed as he turned to look at her. We found out that Zabuza has gone rogue leaving the village. I doubt he will be a problem. Fiona said, surprising those who didn't know yet. He went rogue? May said in a surprised manner. I never thought he would do that. That should be the only other ninja in the village we will have trouble with, Ao said, unable to think of any more else who would get in their way. That settles it then. I will take the Mizukage. May and Ao, you will handle Faguki and Kisame. Fiona said, knowing it wouldn't come down to that as Faguki would be dead, and Kisame will have left the village by then. That just leaves Mangetsu. Ao said, 
sounding worried as he looked at the others. Even if all of you fight him at the same time, it could be a close one. He said. Fiona placed his hand on Ao's shoulder, calming him down. Don't worry, Ao. I can vouch for Hatsu and Kata's strength. Besides, I don't think they will be alone. He said. Everyone nodded and agreed on the plan that had been set out. Fiona knowing that Mei and Ao would also be able to deal with Mengetsu if needed, and against all of them, he wouldn't stand a chance. They ended the meeting, and each of them left, going their own way. Mei, however, ran over to Fiona, trying to see if he wanted to hang out for a little while. You haven't called around in the last few days, Fiona. Should I be worried? She asked playfully. Fiona gave a nervous laugh as he couldn't help notice her large breasts getting closer and closer to his face. Well, you see. You can touch them if you want Fiona. She said, saying his name slowly in a sexy manner. He had to admit he was very tempted and had to stop his hand from reaching out to grab them. I'm sorry, May. He said as he placed his hands on her shoulders instead. May had a puppy dog expression on her face and pulled her lip down with her little finger looking sad. What's the matter, Fiona? Don't you want me anymore? She said, clearly teasing him. It's not that, May. I just think we should focus on the next few days before we decide to, well, fool around. May sighed and pulled away. You're no fun, Fiona. She said, crossing her arms. She turned back to face him quickly, though, as her expression changed again. But you are worth the wait. She said with a wink as she blew a love heart-shaped vapor cloud into the air at him. Fiona smiled nervously and realized she could melt him if he upset her and decided now was a good time to say goodbye. With that, he gave her a wave before slipping into another ice mirror and stepping out into the kitchen of his new house. It was already late afternoon, and Fiona hadn't realized how long that meeting had gone on for. He still had a lot to plan and think about. He was sure he could take the mazukage. The only question was, could he do it without killing him? Yagura was also a perfect jinchuriki and could cause a lot of damage if he got the chance. Fiona pushed his thoughts to the back of his mind trying not to think about it anymore. He would do what needed to be done, and that was that as if on Keihaku and Kimimaro walked through the door into the house. Sensei, we're home. Haku shouted as he ran into the kitchen, hoping he was there. To Haku's disappointment, Fiona wasn't there. That's strange. I thought I could hear him. Haku said, turning to Kimimaro, who also walked into the kitchen. Kimimaro suddenly turned around and blocked an attack from a bone club. Haku hadn't been so fast to react, and he got hit on the head. Ouch! Haku shouted as he grabbed his head with his hands. Fiona gave a small chuckle as he took a step back. Haku, what did I tell you about always being aware? He said as he crossed his arms. Kimimaro lowered his arm and smiled at the sight of his sensei. Well done, Kimimaro. Your reactions are already impressive. I expected nothing less. Kimimaro couldn't help but smile. Thank you, Sensei. No fair, Haku said. Now, now. How was your first day at the academy? Fiona asked as he rubbed Haku's head to make it feel better. Haku forgot all about the pain and smiled instantly. It was really fun, Sensei. We got to practice with some shuriken today. He shouted. Fiona raised an eyebrow in interest. Is that so? He asked, amused. Fiona took both of them outside into the large garden. He had placed a couple of target around the area and even put one behind a barrier of ice so that it was protected by it. Show me what you have learned, Fiona said as he laid out a bunch of shuriken, kunai, and sunban needles for them to use. Both of them quickly grew excited as they took some of the weapons, ready to show Fiona what they could do. All right, Kimimaro. You're first. Fiona said as he crossed his arms. Kimimaro eyed all of the targets, including the one behind the layer of ice. He concentrated and suddenly let loose the projectiles one after the other. They all hit the targets as his shuriken made a thumping sound as they hit the wood. 
Kimimaro had tried his best to throw his last shuriken at a curve so it would glide down to the last target, but it failed and hit the ice. Kimimaro's expression dropped a little as he missed, clearly disappointed with himself. Well done, Kimimaro, not bad at all, Fiona said. All right, Haku, you're up next. Think you can hit that last one? Haku nodded his head with a smile and prepared his shuriken. Fiona noticed that in one hand, he held shuriken and the other sunbon needles. Haku started throwing them at a good speed as each of them hit dead center into their targets. Haku did the same as Kimimaro with his last shuriken sending it off at a curve to get it to spin, however. Haku threw a sunbon needle at the last second. The needle hit the shuriken and chanced its trajectory, sending the shuriken crashing into the target behind the ice, hitting the bullseye. The Sinbon needle also bounced off and struck one of the other targets, not going to waste either. Fiona was beyond impressed at Haku's display of shuriken jutsu and couldn't believe how naturally he took to it. Well done, Haku, that was very impressive. He said, walking over to him and patting his head. Haku smiled with his checks going red from Fiona's praise. While we are here, Kimimaro, I would like to show you a jutsu that only you can use, Fiona said, getting his attention. Fiona extended his hand and let them both watch as small bones started producing out of his fingertips. Kimimaro's eyes went wide with amazement as well as Haku's. Fiona suddenly turned around, spinning at a rapid rate as he fired the bone bullets, hitting all of the targets and ripping through them. Both of the boys were speechless at the demonstration, and Fiona turned to face him. Remember Kimimaro. With our Keki Jankai, every bone in our body can be used as a weapon. He said, getting a nod from the boy. Wow, Kimimaro, that's so cool. Haku shouted. Kimimaro looked at his hand and did the same thing before throwing the bone bullets at the ice, shattering it. That's it, Kimimaro. Maybe one day, I will teach you how to add an element to that. Fiona said. What about me, Sensei? Haku asked. Your Keki Jankai is Hayaton, Ice Release. It doesn't work like that for you, I'm afraid. Fiona said, trying to explain it to him. He had already told them about their abilities and Keki Jankais, but they still had many questions. Don't worry, though, Haku. I will teach you how to use it for something like this. He said as he patted the boys on their heads again. Now on to the next bit of training, Fiona said as he took them over to a large tree. This next exercise will involve the control of your chakra. You must learn how to do this as it will help in everything you do. That goes for both of you. He said, looking at them. Now pay attention. He said as he placed his hands together for effect and started walking up the tree. Both of their mouths were open wide as they watched Fiona walk all the way to the top of the tree. The trick is to focus your chakra into your feet and let it hold you to the surface, he said before he dropped back down to the ground. If your concentration breaks, you will fall. This is an essential skill, and one I want both of you to master. Both Haku and Kimimaro looked at each other as they nodded placing these hands together to focus their chakra as they tried to walk up the tree. To Fion's surprise, they both stuck to the tree line and started walking up, getting about halfway. Well, I'll be damned. Fiona said, almost not believing they were doing so well on their first time. Suddenly both of their concentrations slipped, and they fell back down to the ground. Kimimaro landed on his feet like a cat, while Haku flipped last second, managing to catch himself on a branch to slow his fall. Not bad at all, boys, not bad at all, Fiona said, impressed. Now, let's see if you can do it under pressure. He said with a smile. The boys looked at him in surprise as he threw them each a kunai. Now walk back up the tree and mark how high you can get before you fall. Make sure not to lose your kunai and watch out for projectiles. Projectiles? Kimimaro asked. That's right, Fiona said as he crossed his arms. The boys started to walk up the tree again, each of them trying their best not to lose focus. Fiona let them get back to about halfway as he threw a small number of shuriken at each of them as a surprise. Haku noticed the projectiles and tried not to panic as he blocked them. However, 
his ability to multitask was still lacking, and his left foot lost its connection. Arg! Haku shouted as he slipped a little further down the tree before managing to catch himself. Kimimaro noticed the shuriken, and instead of blocking them, he simply ducked. Fiona had already expected that, and he threw another set that was coming from behind the boy. Kimimaro didn't notice them until the last second and allowed two large bones to spike from his back to stop them. Not bad, Kimimaro. But can you do both? Kimimaro also felt his concentration lapse as he had focused his chakra on using his Kekiai Jinkai. Both of his feet slipped, and he fell down through the air flipping around before he landed in a Spider-Man pose. Haku started to run as fast as he could to try and reach the top, taking advantage of Kimimaro's fall. At this rate, I will get there first. He said. Fiona watched him go and was impressed to see how fast the boy was improving. Kimimaro didn't look impressed, and suddenly, he burst up onto the tree with impressive speed. Looks like they are getting competitive. Fiona thought as he let loose another bunch of shuriken. Haku could see the top of the tree and set his sight on it, running as quickly as he could to reach it. Suddenly a shuriken hit the tree just above from where he was, and a layer of ice spread on top of the bark. Haku stepped onto the ice, unable to react to it and slipped as soon as his foot touched it. Kimimaro was halfway now, and this time, he quickly deflected the shuriken that came his way, not even taking his eye off his goal. Another shuriken hit the tree and created a layer of ice over it just as it had done for Haku. Kimimaro didn't care and stepped onto it using the bones in his feet to act as studs, so he didn't slip. You crafty little bugger, Fiona said as he couldn't help be impressed. Haku noticed Kimimaro quickly gaining on him and knew if he fell now, he would lose. As the boy fell back, he placed his hands on the tree, using his chakra to grip onto it like his feet. Pulling himself back down, he pushed off, and both he and Kimimaro raced to the top neck and neck. Each of them slammed their kunai into the top of the tree as they each grabbed the top branch at the same time. They gave each other a hard look before they smiled and looked down at Fiona. I win, sensei. They both shouted at the same time, looking at each other again as they laughed. Good work, boys, but I'm afraid you were wrong. He said as he suddenly melted into water. I'm afraid that I won. He said from above them as he was already stood at the top of the tree. Wah! They both shouted in amazement as they turned to look at their sensei. When did you? Kimimaro said, shocked that he hadn't noticed Fiona there at all. Wow, sensei, that's so cool. Haku said as he jumped a little. Fiona smiled as he crossed his arms. Now, how about we have some food? Chapter 39 The next day passed quickly for Fiona as he laid out his gear and made the preparations for the mission at hand. He took the boys to the academy as usual and went about his day to focus on the task. Fiona had picked up some new gear and clothing that he had placed on order with one of the village tailors. His new gear consisted of black trousers and black shinobi boots, with white wrapping from his ankles up to his shins. He had a purple mist flak jacket on with a new short-sleeved long blue haori over his usual attire that had a lighter blue-like flame pattern along the bottom of it that represented the Yuki clan's eyes. He also had long black sleeves that stretched onto his hands, with them cutting off at his fingers like fingerless gloves. Cover Picture Clothing He put it all on to see how it fit, taking a look in the mirror before he pulled the haori on to see how it looked. Fiona had styled it like the fourth Hokage's jacket but had changed the color to blue rather than white. It was a great fit, and Fiona couldn't help but feel a little more badass wearing it. For the time being, Fiona had taken his headband off, no longer feeling the need to wear it as his fame spoke for itself. Once Fiona was done with his new gear, he decided to head out and do some food shopping as, of course, the boys and himself ate a lot of it. If anything, he hadn't quite had a day like this since before he had died. Everything just felt so normal, and he had to admit it felt odd. He had a lot of free time to sit and plan for every possible outcome and scenario, yet all he could think about was what he wanted to do with his life and the responsibilities that were slowly being thrust upon his shoulders. The day passed quickly, and now both Kimimaro and Haku had returned home from the academy. 
they were very excited and seemed to be enjoying their new lives with him. Something that made Fiona happy, after all, he had acquired two very powerful appreciates. They did the usual training, which involved some physical as well and mental exercises. Movements that they were yet to teach in the academy, but things Fiona felt were necessary for each of them to achieve. Haku was made to concentrate a lot more on his chakra control to master his abilities more effectively. Kimimaro already had that down and could control his keki jinkai with great authority. Fiona had him focus on its application in taijutsu, honing his combat prowess against one of his ice clones that the boy was yet to defeat. Haku had already learned to control his chakra and from ice into shapes as he molded it. Fiona had observed him as he did this. After all, it was the first step to mastering his abilities as well as an essential milestone to achieve first. Each had fantastic potential, with both of them showing fast progress in everything Fiona had shown them. Before he knew it, the night had come to an end. They had all sat at the table and eaten plenty of food as Fina told them some wild story of his past life. After all of that, it was time for bed. Both the boys were exhausted from a full day at the academy and extra training with Fiona. They had both passed out once their head hit the pillow without a second thought. Fiona left them to it and finished checking over his gear one last time before he sat down and crossed his legs. A moment later, he opened his eyes and found himself inside his inner world with Saikin, the six tails. Is everything all right, Fiona? Saikin asked. Just checking you are ready for tomorrow, my friend, Fiona said, crossing his arms. Saikin nodded. I am ready. I will follow your lead, Fiona, no matter where you go. The tailed beast said. Fiona couldn't help but smile as he looked at the giant slug. Thank you, my friend, he said before retreating to reality. The next day came around fast. Fiona woke the boys and gave them some breakfast before accompanying them to the academy. The village was quiet as usual. The ever-present mist hanging in the air. Fiona said farewell to Kamamaro and Haku, each of them unaware of what was happening today. Now that both the boys had been dropped off, it was time for him to meet with the other generals to start the mission. Fiona arrived in the meeting place, a small dark place in town where no one wanted to go. Fiona was the last person to arrive, and the others were waiting on him. Ao, Mei, Hatsu, Kaga and Ganryu were all waiting for him as they chatted amongst themselves. You made it, Ao said as he noticed his presence. Mei also smiled as she took in Fiona's new appearance. Oh my! Look at you! She said, licking her lips. The others also acknowledged his presence and greeted him accordingly. Is everything in order? Fiona asked. Ao and Hatsu nodded. The plan is in motion as we speak, Ao said. As they spoke, Gonryos and Kaga's men were busy setting up a battlefield far enough away from the village that if a battle did break loose, the village would be safe from any destruction that might take place. The idea was to make it look like a battle between the hidden mist and the hidden sand. Something worthy of the Mizukage's attention that would draw him out of the village and into the trap. My men will handle it, Kaga said with confidence as he flashed a smile. Mine too, you can count on them, Fiona, Ganryu said. Fiona nodded as he turned his attention to Mei. You know what to do, he said. She smiled, licking her lips before disappearing. May's job was to be the first response to the makeshift battleground, giving a false report to the Mizukage upon his arrival. She was well respected in the village for her ability and strength, and Fiona Nuyagura would not ignore a report if it came from her. Hatsu, Kaga and Ganryu also took their leave as their job were to place squads to ambush the Mizukage's men, keeping them trapped and unable to call for reinforcements. Fiona and Ao now had to convince the Mizukage of the attack and bait him to the battlefield. It was a risky move, but a safer one. If it came to a battle, they couldn't risk putting the village and its people in harm's way. Both of them arrived at the Mizukage's officer and burst through the door, showing urgency. Yagura was shocked at their behavior but quickly brushed it aside as he realized it was an emergency. Lord Mizukage, we are under attack. Ao said as he took a knee, bowing to him. 
Fiona also did the same as they reported to him. It's the sand. They have attacked our lands not far from the village. We have reports that a large force of elite sand shinobi have appeared and attacked. Captain May is currently facing them and was able to give a message to us. Fiona said, looking the Mizukage in the eyes. Yagura was outraged and stood to his feet as he slammed his hands down onto his large mahogany desk. They dare attack my village. They dare attack me. He shouted, letting his anger build. Fiona waited a moment to let his rage boil even more before speaking. What are your orders? Shall we send a counter-strike force? No. Yagura snapped. I will go personally. Assemble my personal guard. Both of you are coming with me. He said as he grabbed his staff. Ao bowed his head a little lower, and Fiona stood to his feet as he summoned the Mizukage's personal umbu. What about Lord Fuguki and Kisame? Shall I make them aware of the situation, my lord? Ao asked, raising his head. Yagura suddenly bit his lip, and his expression changed. Fuguki is dead. He spat. Ao was shocked as he waited for more information about how. Kisame killed him for being a traitor. He then took Samahana and has fled the village, becoming a rogue ninja. Ao was extremely surprised while Fiona had been confident that it would happen. However, he tried to act surprised so as not to give anything away. Never mind that, we must hurry, Yagura said as he slammed the bottom of his hook staff on the floor. Signaling, it was time to move out. Fiona was pretty confident that whatever Jinjutsu Abito used to control Yagura was one where he still acted as usual unless directed otherwise, cutting memories out when and as needed. It was a powerful Jinjutsu indeed, and he knew he would have to enter his inner world if he had any chance at undoing it. With that said and done, Yagura asked Fiona and Ao to lead the way as he and his Umbu guard followed. Yagura was, of course, the most powerful person in the village other than Fiona and would pose the greatest threat. His personal guard consisted of elite Umbu members and, of course, the young Mangetsu Ozuki, who was a new addition to the Seven Ninja Swordsmen along with Amuri Ringo, who had also just become the first female member of the Seven Swordsmen. Both of them could easily pose as a considerable threat to everyone apart from Fiona and, hopefully, May. Fiona and Ao lead the Mizukage and his men to the designated battle site they had chosen to ambush them. It was far enough away from the village that a battle wouldn't reach it. As they arrived, the battlefield was a mess showing the aftermath of a battle, just as planned. Mei, Kaga, and Hatsu were all stood around with their units, all of them coming to attention as the Mizukage and others arrived. What's the situation? Yagura asked as he took a good look around. Where are the Hidden Sand's forces? He added as he turned to look at Mei. The sand has retreated, my lord, but we expect them to return with reinforcements. She said, bowing her head. Yagura took a good look around as he noticed how many of his elite shinobi were gathered around him. Can you confirm any other of the shinobi? He asked, assuming they must be powerful if he was asked to come by Fiona and Ao. Fiona could tell Yagura was getting suspicious and gave Kaga a nod to take his men back. His and his unit's job was to prevent anyone from getting a message back to the village to ask for reinforcements. It was also to help keep a perimeter around the outside of the village to keep it safe, if possible. Yagura didn't miss the nod and wondered what was going on. He wasn't the only one as Mangetsu could also feel something was off. Fiona had already noticed his genius and knew he was a powerful adversary. He had to act fast, and he had to act now. Sorry about this, Fiona said as he burst forwards faster than anyone could even see, striking the Mizukage in the center of his stomach as he attempted to enter his inner world and break the Jinjutsu. Time suddenly stopped as Fiona entered Yagura's inner world. It was dark and wet, completely different from his own. Fiona walked for a while before he found the central area finding the three tails inside. The beast was a massive turtle-like creature with three large tails. He could tell the tailed beast was under control as it was wrapped in large chains, unable to move. So this is how he is being controlled, Fiona said as he took in the sight. I must say, you deserve more credit than you have. 
Fiona Yuki, a deep voice suddenly said from the shadows. Fiona turned to face who it belonged to, not surprised when he saw Abito's mask appear from the shadows. Fiona smiled as he looked Abito in the eye. His hair was currently long and black, much younger than he was in the anime. So you are the one controlling the Mizukage. He said, deciding to play along for now. Abito crossed his arms over his chest as he studied Fiona with a heavy gaze. You really are a clever one, Kage Killer. Fiona took a step closer this time. Release your Jinjutsu and leave my village. Abito. Abito had turned his back on Fiona as he spoke to him. However, once he said his real name, his head snapped back around almost too quickly. How do you know that name? He asked, not impressed. I know more than you think. You are impersonating Madara Uchiha, taking control of the Mizukage and even attacked the Hidden Leaf. Fiona said, this time really taking Abito off guard. Abito was honestly shocked that Fiona knew so much. He remained silent for a moment before he took a step closer to the Three Tails, placing his hand on its body. You certainly know a lot about me, Kage Killer. He said, turning back to face him. For that reason, I cannot allow you to live. He suddenly shouted as he clapped his hands together, activating the Jinjutsu that controlled the Three Tails and Yagura. Now you will face my wrath. He said as the Three Tails suddenly let loose a mighty roar, one that banished Fiona from Yagura's inner world, forcing him out. Fiona opened his eyes and was quickly forced to dodge an attack from Yagura himself as he spun his hook staff around in an attempt to strike him. Of course, he managed to jump back to safety and avoided the attack taking a ready stance. Everyone else had been so shocked at the moment that they had failed to act. However, they now knew what was transpiring. Treason! Yagura shouted as his eyes faded, showing he was now entirely under Abito's Jinjutsu. Mengetsu and Amuri drew their blades, each wielding one of the village's seven great swords and each being extremely deadly with them. Mei, Ao, and Hatsu also took their own battle positions on Fiona's side as they all faced off. What happened? Ao asked as he activated his Byakugan. I was forced out by the masked man and the three tails. He has them entirely under his control. Fiona shouted as he eyed up all the potential threats. So, now what? May asked. I need to get him still enough again to re-enter his inner world and break the Jinjutsu. Hatsu sighed. Looks like it's a fight then. I want them all dead. Kill them all. Yagura shouted as he grew more outraged, seeing that they had all betrayed him. Mengetsu and Amuri gave an evil smile as they readied their blades, as if they were itching to test them against a worthy opponent. Kaga had done as he was told, and he and his men had managed to retreat so that they could hold back and prevent anyone from getting back to the village. Gonryu held the last of their reinforcements, and they were currently holding the area ready to ambush Yagura's Umbu unit at Ao's command. Mei, Ao. I want you both to handle Mangetsu and aim Yuri. Think you can handle it? Fiona said. They both waved their opponents up and nodded. No problem, dear, Mei said with a confident smile. Ao simply nodded, knowing how strong Mangetsu was, not sure if he could match his abilities. Hatsu, back them up if you can. Have you got anyone among your units that can match these umbu? Fiona asked, almost sounding worried. After all, the Mizukage's umbu guards were elite ninja and no pushovers. Most of them Fiona didn't know about as he had been away for three years, meaning that they could have skills or abilities he didn't know about. Actually, there is one that comes to mind who will be able to hold his own, but, Hatsu said as he drew his sword. But? Fiona asked. Well, he's Mangetsu's cousin. Kogetsu Ozuki. Yagura was getting tired of talking and pointed his staff towards them. Kill them all. He shouted as his squad of Umbu charged forwards, going in for the attack. Now! Ao shouted as he gave the signal for the ambush. Suddenly Gonryu and his unit of 30 shinobi appeared from all over the area and attacked the squad of 15 umbu, taking them on with twice the numbers. Clashes between steel broke out, 
water and fire clashed in the air as ninjutsu was unleashed and the scarring of the land was set as the cries of battle erupted. In the middle of it all stood Yagura, the fourth Mizukage in Fiona Yuki, the Kage killer of the Hidden Mist. Fiona already knew he couldn't talk to Yagura as Abito's hold over him was too strong. I'm going to put an end to this quickly. Fiona shouted as he quickly charged towards Yagura, allowing his bones to spike out, ready to attack. Yagura quickly countered by extending his arm as he created a large water mirror. He then grabbed it with the hook at the end of his staff and pulled it, realizing a clone of Fiona who charged to meet his own attack. Fiona was matched strike for strike by his mirror image and was forced to jump back before he fired a barrage of lightning-style bone bullets. The clone didn't react to his second attack and was shredded by the lightning bullets, along with the water mirror. Yagura jumped out of the way as he started to form hand signs quickly before releasing a huge water-style dragon. Fiona smiled as he was impressed by the jutsu. Not good enough. He shouted as he, too, made a few quick hand signs. Quickly releasing a massive ice-style dragon from his body letting it consume Yagura's water dragon before crashing down on him. That's not all. Fiona shouted as he clasped his hands together. Secret Jutsu, Ice Mirror Trap. He shouted as he formed ice mirrors all around the Mizukage, allowing the razor-sharp ice spikes from the dragon to explode and cause an almost never-ending rain of projectiles. The second Hokage's infinite exploding paper bombs inspired this Jutsu. Fiona had just tweaked it over the years until he had come up with a cool name. Fiona could sense that Yagura had been unable to avoid the attack and now was his chance to hold him. If I can trap him in my ice style, I should be able to hold him for just long enough to break the Jinjutsu. He thought to himself as he rushed towards Yagura, forming hand signs. Wind style. Gale storm. Yagura shouted as he unleashed a massive blast of wind style chakra, waving his staff around with expert skill, blasting all of the ice away from him with ease. Fiona stopped in his tracks and smiled, realizing that this battle wouldn't be a walk in the park. Looks like it won't be that easy, Fiona said as he waited and watched to see what Yagura did next. I'm done playing around. Yagura shouted as he struck his staff into the ground before he clapped his hands together to focus his chakra. Yagura suddenly became covered in a cloak of red chakra as three tails formed behind him. He had entered stage one and was now getting serious. Fiona was almost excited to test his new strength against another Jinchuriki, but he had to remain serious and handle this without killing him. Meaning he would mostly be fighting while holding back. Yagura charged towards Fiona, raising his fist as he intended to attack with all the chakra cloak's force. Fiona was prepared for this and quickly allowed his bones to spike out from all over his body. Fiona attacked with his body and countered Yagura as he tried to attack him. Flipping and spinning too fast for Yagura to keep up with, he was unable to dodge any of Fiona's attacks, realizing he was seriously outmatched. If not for his chakra cloak, he would have been filled full of holes already, but Fiona didn't intend to kill him from the start and was just trying to damage him enough so he could break the Jinjutsu. Time to test out my new Jutsu. Fiona thought as he dodged into a back handspring before he lunged forwards with a thrust of his arm, letting a bone blade appear when and where he needed it to. The bone blade hit Yagura in the stomach and was a clean blow, proving that Fiona was too quick for him. Suddenly ice started to form from where the attack had landed, blossoming like a flower petal until it covered almost half of Yagura's body. I call it the frozen flower dance, Fiona said as he flicked his blade down through the air for effect as he watched the ice fully cover the Mizukage's body head to toe. Fiona took a moment to look at his handiwork and walked over to the frozen Mizukage, placing a hand on the ice to try to concentrate. Did you think it would be that easy? A deep voice said. Fiona quickly recoiled back in surprise as the ice exploded from the force of the chakra that Yagura suddenly let out. His body had turned into a mini version of the three tails, covered in a thick red and black chakra. He's already resorting to stage two. Fiona said as he covered his face from the intense chakra blast. Yagura suddenly let loose a blast of concentrated chakra and Fiona was forced to go on the retreat. Not good. He shouted as he dodged the first one. 
The explosion it created caused a colossal shockwave that even affected the battle between the Umbu and the rest of Fiona's forces. Fiona turned to look at Yagura as he was starting to get ready to create more mini-tailed beast bombs. I have to stop this. He said as he formed the hand signs, creating ice mirrors in an attempt to absorb the attacks. Yagura fired all of the mini blast bombs at once as he was trying his best to kill Fiona in one hit. Fiona's ice mirror was able to hold as it absorbed the full tailed beast bombs. Yagura was very confused as he watched on in shock, wondering how Fiona had done it. A huge explosion suddenly shook the ground from the distance as the blast bombs had been sent far away so that they would not harm any of his men that were currently battling Yagura's forces. I can't let this go on. He said as he watched Yagura growling on all fours, clearly enraged that Fiona had stopped his attack, making it look easy. Are you ready, Saiken? I'm going to borrow your power. Fiona said to his own tailed beast. I'm ready, Fiona. Take as much of my chakra as you need. The six tails said. All right. Time to go a little wild. He said as he let the red chakra cover his own body. I won't hold back anymore. Chapter 40 The battle between the Mizukij's Umbu and Fiona's forces continued to rage as the sound of steel echoed through the air. Even though Fiona's forces outnumbered the Umbu unit two to one, they were outmatched. Most of Fiona's troops were at Chunin level, with a small handful being Jonin. Meanwhile, the Umbu were all elite shinobi who had been tried and tested, forging their skills on the battlefield over and over again. It's no good. They are too strong. One of the ninjas shouted as he fell back with the others. The Umbu had formed four-man teams that kept a tight circle formation to cover every blind spot. The Umbu attacked with perfectly timed taijutsu and ninjutsu combinations, leaving no time for a counterattack. Look out! Someone shouted as a large fireball and showers of shuriken rained down upon them. The explosion shook the ground, and bodies dropped to the floor as the deadly missiles showered them. The men's morale was dropping rapidly as they quickly realized the Umbu Shinobi outclassed them in almost every way. No surrender! Gonrya shouted as he pulled his men back from the brink, forming a rapid counterattack. The others followed his lead, and were able to hold their own, surviving another attack from the Umbu units as they continued to blast them. We can't hold out much longer. We need reinforcements. Gonrya thought as he blocked an attack with his sword, pushing the Umbu back before cutting him down. You! He shouted at the first ninja he could find on his side. Why yes, sir, the lad said. Get yourself back to Captain Kata's squad and request for reinforcements. Gonrya shouted at him. He didn't need to tell him twice as the lad gave a swift nod and turned on his heel to retreat. The Umbu, however, were no fools and noticed their plan right away. Kill that one. The leader shouted as he pointed to the messenger. Don't let them attack. Gonrya shouted. Another battle broke out as his forces tried to defend their messenger, and the Umbu wished to kill him. Meanwhile, Mei was in a standoff with the young Mengetsu. She was amazed at his ability and could see why he had climbed the ranks so swiftly. Give it up, kid. The Mizukage is being controlled. You are fighting for the wrong side. Mei shouted as she ducked under one of his attacks. Manjesta was quick, though, and countered with a spinning kick that Mei was forced to block with her arm. I follow Lord Mizukage's orders. He simply said as he placed his sword over his shoulder. Manjestu was wielding Hiramakariai, the twin swords, and it was still wrapped in bandages, meaning he hasn't even gotten serious yet. Mei knew her best bet was keeping her distance and using her ninjutsu to overcome his superior close combat prowess. She already knew that taijutsu wouldn't work, thanks to his Hozuki clan ability and she would have to be careful when he got close. Ao and Hatsu were also having trouble battling Aim Yuri. She was the newest member of the Seven, and its first female member, making her even more deadly. She held the Kiba blades and wielded them with deadly skill. The blades were thought to have been lost when Raigo became a Rouge Ninja. However, the blades had been stolen from him thanks to Hatsu and a team of Tracker Nin. Raiga had gotten away, 
but the swords had been recovered, allowing Amiri to master them with her powerful lightning chakra release. Something Hatsu was currently regretting. Amiri was a fierce opponent with her skill and wild attitude for battle, making her a severe threat to Ao and Hatsu even together. What's the matter, boys? Can't handle me two on one? She said as she licked her blade, giving them a toothy smile. Ao had already activated his Bikugan, yet for all its power and vision it offered, it was no help against Amiri's ferocious attacks. Amuri raised her swords into the air and summoned a huge lightning ball that she fired towards both of them. Hatsu and Ao jumped out of the way, avoiding being electrocuted. We need to counter with a wind style. Ao shouted. Hatsu landed but didn't have any time to react as Amuri appeared behind him, slashing with each of her blades in smooth succession. Hatsu blocked each attack with his own blade as he was forced on the defensive. Quickly Hatsu ducked and spun around in an attempt to counter. Amuri was too fast and ducked under his blade as she opened her arms wide, bringing both her blades overhead and crashing down with a powerful attack. Hatsu raised his sword to block, and his shoulders felt the pressure as they trembled from the force. Not so simple, Amuri said as she suddenly realized a massive burst of lightning chakra from her swords. The Kiba blades easily cut through Hatsu's sword and tore through his torso like butter. Amuri smiled at her handiwork. However, Hatsu's body suddenly turned into a log. Substitution, Amuri growled as she turned around to dodge a thrust attack from Ao. You dare try and fool me. She roared as she suddenly jumped off her back foot, spinning rapidly, creating a tornado of lightning that would shred anything it touched to pieces. Ao dashed back as he made a few quick hand signs before he fired a high-pressure stream of water about his mouth in an attempt to halt. Amuri's attack. It was just enough to push her back and Ao to get out of the way. Wind style, pressure slice. Hatsu shouted as he quickly blasted two large blades of wind style chakra from his mouth. Amuri saw them coming from inside her jutsu and slashed her blades, cutting them across each other to release a bolt of lighting style to meet the wind blades. Both of the ninjutsu clashed in the air and exploded as they cancelled each other out. Blast, it wasn't strong enough. Hatsu shouted, realizing Amuri's lightning style was more potent than his wind style that held the advantage. We need more firepower, Ao said as he regrouped with Hatsu, both of them facing off against Amuri as she slowly twirled her blades. She is indeed a powerful foe, Hatsu said, noting she was worthy of the Seven Swordsmen. Meanwhile, All right, Saiken, it's time to power up. Fiona said as he allowed Saiken's chakra to envelop his body sprouting all six tails from the get-go. Yagura was currently in version two of his tailed beast state and was doing his best to eradicate Fiona. Do you not think you should also enter version two? Saiken asked. I don't want to kill him if I can help it, Saiken, Fiona said as he readied himself for the Mizukage's next attack. Yagura suddenly burst forward off all fours as he lunged at Fiona, attacking him with all of his might. Yagura was little more than a beast now, and his attacks proved it. Swiping with his claws as he tried to rip them into Fiona, over and over again. Fiona was too fast for him as he jumped back to avoid all of his attacks. He must be trying to use his coral palm. He thought as he decided to go on the counterattack. Fiona stopped a right swipe from the Mizukage with his arm and countered attack with a massive punch amplified with wind-style chakra. The blast sent Yagura flying back through the air and crashing through the trees. Fiona could see the coral growing up his arm as it had taken effect. So, even if you touch him anywhere, it still gets you. Interesting. Fiona thought as he stopped the spread by growing bones out of his arm that broke it away from his skin. Unfortunately, I have the perfect counter to it. Fiona thought as he looks towards where Yagura had been sent flying. Three large red and black tails shot out of the tree line as they headed right towards Fiona. With rapid reaction speed, he jumped into the air and formed hand signs that summoned large ice spikes in a large circle around his body. The tails acted like whips as they changed direction, trying to rip Fiona to ribbons, ripping the surrounding terrain apart. Fiona flipped and used a blast of wind style to propel him through the air to avoid the tails, one after the other. Now! 
he shouted as he fired a load of ice spikes at the tails in an attempt to pin each of them to the ground. The ice hit but shattered as the three tails' hide was too strong for them to penetrate. The tails reacted and smashed Fiona through the air as he was forced to block with his arms. Even with his own tailed beast chakra cloak and his bone defense, he could feel the force behind the attack as it broke both of his arms. Damn, he's stronger than he looks. Fiona thought as he flipped backwards and landed on the ground skidding from the force. The tails hadn't stopped, and they darted after him like a homing missile. Fiona was ready for this, though, and summoned an ice mirror with one hand as he had already regrown the bones inside it. All three of the tails went right into the mirror as it absorbed them. Fiona had created another mirror for them to pass out through, causing them to crash into themselves, getting tangled up from the force. Now! Fiona thought as he saw his opportunity arise. Ice style, flash freeze. He shouted as he created the hand signs, pumping a massive amount of chakra into the jutsu. Fiona quickly unleashed a massive frozen wave that froze everything around it. All three of the Mizukage tails froze in almost an instant. This way, the Mizukage couldn't retract his tails, and they would be stuck there, giving him time to get close. Fiona had used a massive amount of chakra for the jutsu, and he was now down to three tails in his first form. Yagura let out a wicked howl of pain as he could feel his body freeze almost instantly. Instead of pulling his tails back to him, he was pulled back to them like a yo-yo as he crashed through the forest, uprooting any tree he crashed into. Fiona waited for him to get closer and fired a barrage of lightning-enhanced bone bullets to distract him. They did the job and hurt him before he stopped dead, crying in pain at his frozen tails. Now! Fiona thought as he flipped over his body and reached his hand out, trying to place a seal on his body so he could enter his inner world once more. However, the Mizukage wasn't so succumbing. At the last moment, Yagura grabbed Fiona's arm, stopping him in his tracks. Fiona was face to face with the three tails as it growled in his face preparing to do something drastic. Suddenly the beast ripped its frozen tails off to gain its freedom. Fiona couldn't pull his arm free and quickly form a few one-handed hand signs in an attempt to free himself from its grasp. Ice shards suddenly rained down on Yagura, and razor-shark bones cut into his hand, forcing him to release his grip on Fiona's hand. Yagura let his jaw break as it opened as wide as it could, getting ready to unleash a massive blast of concentrated chakra, even being prepared to hit himself to take Fiona out. If he fires that thing, he could die. Fiona thought as he was left with no other option. Fiona closed his eyes for a moment and suddenly burst full of crimson chakra as he entered stage two. His body had become enveloped in red and black chakra, and all six tails were waving about as his powerful aura flared to life. Moving at speeds far greater than before, Fiona wrapped his body around Yagura like a coil as he started to squeeze. Yagura's body was solid indeed but not indestructible, as Fiona released his acid from all over his body, making the three tails more compliant due to the burning pain. Yagura lost his concentration, and the chakra bomb dropped, causing an explosion that sent both of them flying through the air. Fiona had managed to stop him from trying to blow both of them up with a last resort move. Now he needed to stop him before he went any further. Fiona glanced as Yagura flipped in the air and opened his arms in an attempt to steady himself midair. He had a look on his face that said a thousand words, and Fiona didn't like any of them. He's going to transform again. He said to Saiken. Not good. You have to stop him before he does. Otherwise, this whole area will be destroyed. The Six Tails said. Just as Fiona had said, Yagura suddenly transformed, turning into the fully giant body of the three-tailed beast. It was an enormous turtle-like creature with a crab-like shell with spikes all over its body and three giant shrimp-like tails. This was the second-tailed beast Fiona had seen up close now. But he had no time to be impressed. He had to act fast if he wanted to stop the Mizukage from trying to destroy the entire area. I guess I have no choice. Let's do it, Saikin. All right. Saikin shouted back. Suddenly Fiona transformed into the full version and all its glory of the six-tailed beast. You know what it looks like. Now the two-tailed beasts were at a standoff, 
and everyone around them had been blown back from the power of their transformation. Meanwhile, Mei had been battling against Mangetsu in and serious life or death contest. Mangetsu was currently around 15 years old, but there was a reason he was called the second coming of the demon. His ability with the sword was genuinely unique. Along with his control over water release, he was a deadly adversary. However, Mei was just as much of a threat. Mei posse water, fire, earth and lightning release as well as two kekiai jinkai, lava and boil release. She was indeed a deadly opponent, and she was about to prove why. I have to say Mangetsu. You really are something. But, if you don't surrender now, I won't hold back any longer. She said. Mangetsu lifted his sword onto his shoulder. He could tell that she had been holding back up until now, but then again, so had he. Mangetsu dropped his blade from his shoulder as he unwrapped the cloth that was around it. Mei took note, knowing that this fight was about to get dangerous. So be it, she said as she formed a few hand signs before spitting a large amount of lava towards him. Mangetsu reacted swiftly and swung his blade with such skill that he cut through the lava style like butter. Mangetsu darted towards Mei and let his chakra surround the edge before it took the shape of a massive hammer. Mel was shocked he had easily avoided her lava and was on her in an instant. Mei had nowhere to go and rapidly formed a few hand signs in an attempt to stop his attack. Earth-style, mud wall. She shouted as she raised an earth-style wall in an attempt to absorb the blow from his sword. Mangetsu's blade smashed the earth-style wall to pieces as he passed right through Mei's defenses. However, he had fallen right into her trap. Lightning style, lightning trap. She shouted as she let her chakra surround Mangetsu in a circular lightning barrier. With his Kekiai Jinkai and weakness to lightning, Mangetsu was left helpless and trapped like a rat in Mei's Jutsu. I know all about your Hozuki clan's ability. I'm afraid this time it wasn't enough to save you. Mei said as she formed a few more hand signs. Such a waste to kill a handsome man, but I'm already taken. She said as she opened her mouth and released her acid mist. This mist will melt even you alive, Mangetsu. Mangetsu couldn't move due to the lightning-style trap he was in. He couldn't even liquefy due to the electricity running through his body. He could feel the acid vapor start to burn his skin as its effects got stronger and stronger. With one final attempt to save his life, Mangetsu pumped all of his remaining chakra into his sword, trying to get it to attack Mei. It was no good. Mei had already seen this coming and stopped his attempt with lighting style that hit his wrist, preventing him from gripping his sword. Now melt away, Mei said as she blew a kiss of deadly acid vapor. Suddenly an explosion not far away gave off a shock wave that cleared the acid mist and disrupted the ground, ending the lightning style on Mangetsu, freeing him. Both Mei and Mangetsu were blown back by the shock wave, but Mangetsu did his best to seize the opportunity by firing a clip of water bullets at Mei. Mei was so shocked by the sudden explosion that she had lost her footing even before the shock wave had knocked her back. She flipped in the air and watched the water bullets head her way to late, as one of them ripped through her left shoulder. Mei screamed as the pain set in before she crashed to the ground, rolling into a heap, clutching her wound. Mangetsu landed smoothly and regained his sword. Splitting the blade into two halves this time as he intended to finish Mei with one blow. He had already learned his lesson and didn't intend to give Mei another chance to use her lightning style or acid mist. Time for you to die! Mangetsu shouted as he raised both of his blades, covering them in chakra. Suddenly another huge shock wave hit as this time two huge tailed beasts suddenly appeared, ripping the terrain close to them to shreds and blasting everything away, including Mei and Mangetsu. Further away, Hastu and Ao were facing off against Amuri. The female swordsman proved to be a mighty foe as her control over lightning style was too strong for them to handle. Amuri could wild lightning style from her body and swords without the need for hand signs. She could even summon lightning from the clouds above. Lightning style, Thunder Gate she shouted as she struck her swords into the ground. Thunder and lightning crackled and roared, blasting down from the sky towards Hatsu and Ao. Look out! Ao shouted as he jumped back to avoid the lightning bolt. 
Hatsu did the same, and both of them took cover in the trees, hoping she wouldn't be able to see them. Ao was smart, as a leader of Tracker Ninja and Umbu Captain. He had dealt with all sorts of foes. However, he had never fought such a proficient user of lightning style and struggled to develop a plan. Hatsu could use wind style, but as shown, he wasn't skilled enough in its use to combat her lightning. Their only option was to set out a trap that would either disarm her or trap her movements long enough to get a counterattack in. Ao started forming hand signs and created three water clones. A water clone was a basic jutsu, yet more advanced than the ordinary clone jutsu, as a water clone had psychical mass. However, it was only one-tenth as potent as the user, meaning they were only good as a distraction. Hatsu caught on to what Ao was doing and decided to play along as he created three water clones himself. Ao allowed his clones to run off into different parts of the forest, with Hatsu doing the same. The clones would cover the tree line trying to confuse Amuri as to where their actual whereabouts were, becoming a valuable distraction. Hatsu's clones did the first part as they rained Kanai down upon Amuri. The projectiles served as nothing more than a pest to her as she blocked them with her swords. There you are. She shouted as she let loose a lightning strike towards Hatsu's clone. She wasn't sure if she hit her target and tried to get closer to confirm it. You won't get away from me. Ao quickly darted out of the bushes and attacked, aiming for her vitals with his Sanban needles. Amuri turned around and blocked his first strike before dodging his second attack. Amuri slashed with both blades in a counterattack and cut Ao in half with ease. Why you? No one tricks me. She shouted as she watched his body turn into a water clone. Now. Wind style, air bullet. Water style, water bullet. Both Ao and Hatsu shouted as they fired a combined jutsu mixing wind and water together. Amuri raised her swords in defense. Lightning style, Depth charge. She shouted as her body became enveloped in lightning, protecting her from the blast of water and wind. The force of the jutsu blew her back, and both Ao and Hatsu retreated back into the forest, taking cover once again. How dare you! Amuri shouted as lightning crackled off her body in her rage. I never lose my prey! She said as she crossed her blades over each other, taking a kneeling position. Amuri suddenly rushed into the forest, letting lightning bolts shoot out all over the place in an attempt to hit anyone who might be hiding. Ao noticed this and was becoming worried that his trap might not work now. Only one option left. He thought as he gave Hatsu a nod. Both of them had laid out an explosive trap that would result in her capture with conductive metal wire. But the entire plan counted on whether or not they could disarm her. Ao jumped from his cover and threw a handful of shuriken to distract her. There you are. She shouted as she let her lightning loose, zapping him on the spot as well as stopping the shuriken. Ao's body burst into water, and another him appeared further away. Over here! He shouted as he made some rapid hand signs. Water style, high pressure arrow. He shouted as he blasted arrow shaped water blasts from his mouth. The blast's pressure was strong enough to rip through a tree trunk, and Amuri didn't want to chance it by trying to block them. She swiftly jumped out of the way of the attacks and spun around rapidly in a circle towards Ao, ready to cut him in half. Die, traitor! She shouted as she zapped him with a massive blast of lightning style from her swords, dropping his body toward the ground. Another clone! She shouted as she looked up, getting ready for the next attack. Not this time. Ao said as he fired another water arrow from his mouth. The blast was no way near as powerful as the others, but it caught Amuri off guard. What? He wasn't a clone. She shouted as she had no choice but to cross her swords across her body in an attempt to block the attack. The water arrow was a direct hit, and it knocked Amuri into the air from the force. She was stunned from the blast just long enough for Hatsu to get behind her as he wrapped the metal wire around her body. Amuri realized what was going on and slashed one of her blades behind her in a desperate attempt to get Hatsu away from her. It worked as she cut his left arm, leaving a large gash in his bicep. Hatsu bit through the pain and quickly kicked Amuri in the ribs before wrapping the wire around her wrist. 
Amuri had failed to defend against his kick and fallen for his plan, but with a quick burst of lightning, she zapped Hatsu and sent him flying before he smashed into a tree. Amuri landed on the ground and tried to undo the wire that had been wrapped around her waist and left hand, but it was no good as Ao pulled it with all his might. Amuri was pulled through the air while her left sword was ripped out of her hand and stuck into the ground. Now, Hatsu, do it now! Ao shouted. Hatsu pulled himself up best he could and pulled out an explosive tag that was wrapped around a kunai. He threw it as hard as he could, and it landed on the target, just making the mark before he fell back against the tree. Amuri had been pulled by the wire through the air, and from what she could see, was towards an explosive tag filled trap. She couldn't cut the metal wire, and even her lightning style couldn't break it. With little to no time to react, she did the only thing she could. Thunder Gate! She roared as she summoned a massive amount of lightning style, pumping as much chakra into it as she could. The lightning struck the ground just as Hatsu's kunai hit its mark, and the two created an explosion that covered the entire area, taking all three of them out together in the consuming light. Chapter 41 Gonryu and his men had managed to hold their own amidst the explosions and shockwaves that littered the landscape as battles raged all over. Most noticeable was the enormous tailed beasts in the distance. The men knew that things were getting serious now and the battle was reaching its peak. General Fiona is battling with all his might. We have to hold on until reinforcements arrive. Gonryu shouted, trying to keep their morale up. The Umbu had also noticed that the surrounding battlefield had been very lively and had to wonder what had happened to both Mangetsu and Amuri. We have to hold strong until Lord Mizukage kills these traitors. The Umbu captain shouted. Attack! Each group shouted as they charged in for a battle. Both groups gave it their all, but the Umbu were just too skilled and quickly gained the advantage. Gonryu was equally as skilled, but alone he was no match for them. His unit's numbers had been reduced to equal theirs, and the odds were not looking good. Reinforcements One of the men shouted as about forty shinobi came charging out of the trees and ramming themselves into the umbu flanks. Shit! How did they get the drop on us? The umbu captain shouted as he blocked an incoming attack. The umbu's unit had been taken by surprise, and at least half of their numbers had just been cut down. Pushed through men! We can do this! Gonrya shouted as every one of them gave it their all. The Umbu were getting desperate as they huddled together, trying to fire a combined jutsu. Giryu had already seen this and was quick to counter as he barked orders at others to do the same. Water, fire, wind and lightning all crackled in clashes in the air and roared over the never-ending screams of battle. Captain, we need to fall back! One of the survivors of his unit shouted. The Umbu captain could count only four of his men left. Himself included made five, while the enemy numbered over fifty. I hate to admit it, but we have no choice. He said, keeping his sword raised. They had been surrounded on all sides by Gonryu's forces. Gonryu stepped forwards amongst the standoff. Give it up! You're outnumbered and don't stand a chance. If you surrender now, we will let you live. No more Miss Shinobi blood needs to be spilt. The Umbu seemed as if they would be willing to do as he asked, each of them slowly lowering their weapons. Never! We will never surrender to traitors. The Umbu captain barked, snapping his men back to their senses. We follow Lord Mizukage, even to the death. Gonryu nodded his head. I can see that nothing I say will change your mind. Have it your way. Men, attack! He shouted as he pointed his sword. Suddenly a burst of chakra hit one of Gonryu's men's flanks as they were sent flying into the air from the blast. What the hell was that? Someone shouted among the screams. It it's him. Another shouted as another group were smashed through the air. Gonryu could see what was going on and was forced to watch as wave after wave of his men dropped from what seemed like a machine gun fire of water bullets. It's Mangetsu Ozuki. Someone shouted as the area around the teenager cleared so he could be seen. Don't tell me this group of insects are giving your men trouble? Mangetsu said to the Umbu captain. 
The Umbu all stood a little taller as their morale lifted, seeing that one of the seven ninja swordsmen had joined them. Already men, no mercy! He shouted as he gripped his sword tighter. Mangetsu joined the Umbu and pulled his blades apart, so he had one in each hand ready to unleash his power in full. All of Ganryu's men took a step back as they knew precisely what Mangetsu was capable of. We can't beat one of the seven swordsmen. Someone whimpered. We are all going to die at this rate. Where are our leaders? Someone else shouted. Ganryu couldn't blame them. He knew they were no match for Mangetsu, even with their numbers. He knew he needed to say something. Anything. He just couldn't form the words. Water style. Hozuki scattershot. A voice suddenly shouted as its owner fired a rapid fire of water bullets that hit the ground in front of Mangetsu and the other Umbu. The owner of the Jutsu landed in front of the others and faced off against Mangetsu, and he stood to his full height. Ganryu didn't recognize him but differently recognized the Hozuki clan symbol on the back of his blue robe. Kogetsu. Mangetsu said as he snarled a little. The boy was about the same height as Mangetsu, with his hair around the same length but dirty blonde in color. Kogetsu had a dark blue robe on with black baggy trouser, the standard black shinobi footwear and fingerless gloves on. He looks about the same age as Mangetsu, and his eyes had a different color in each of them, one being hazel green and the other being a light blue. Everyone was confused about who he was but could tell that he and Mangetsu knew each other and they waited to see what would happen. What are you doing here, Kogetsu? Mangetsu said with a snarl. I am part of the rebellion against Lord Mizukij. I'm here to stop you. He said as he pulled part of his hair back. You can't defeat me, Kogetsu. Get out of here before I kill you too. Mangetsu said as he pointed his sword at him. Kogetsu took a ready stance and weighed all of the umbu around him as well as Mangetsu. I don't know how you can follow the Mizukage after what he did to our clan, Mangetsu, but I won't sit by any more and let that tyrant rule us. Mangetsu looked angry and let his chakra flow into his swords. Last chance, Kogetsu. Go home. No. He said as he pulled his own sword from his back. As the next head of the Hozuki clan, I refuse to back down. Then die. Mangetsu shouted as he rushed in with his blades held high as he cut Kogetsu in half. Kogetsu's body turned to water as Mangetsu's blades passed through his body and everyone suddenly grew tense as the battle had begun. A clone? Mangetsu said as he tried to sense where Kogetsu would attack from. Suddenly the earth under all of the umbu cracked, and they fell into it before it sealed around them, trapping all of them from the middle of their arms upward, leaving only their shoulders and heads exposed. Mangetsu had jumped into the air and avoided the attack as he looked down to see what was going on. Water suddenly started to flow within the cracks of the earth and slowly took the form of Kogetsu as five clones of himself appeared next to each of the umbu. I'm sorry it had to come to this. He said as he pointed his index finger at each of them like a gun. Secret Hozuki Clan Jutsu, Earth Trap Water Bullet. Kogetsu said as he fired the water shot at each of them, blowing all the umbu's brains out at once, making it look easy. Mangetsu landed and charged in to attack Kogetsu. However, he was too late as Kogetsu suddenly turned back into water and slowly disappeared again. You can't hide Kogetsu. He shouted as he turned to look at the others. I'll kill all of them if it means drawing you out. Mangetsu shouted as he charged at Ganryu and his men. Kogetsu suddenly burst out from the group and stopped Mangetsu in his tracks as the two of them clashed swords. Both of them pushed each other away and took a ready stance as they slowly circled each other ready for the next assault. I didn't know you could use earth style, Mangetsu said with a toothy grin. You know me, Mangetsu, expect the worst plan for the best. I'm afraid even your greatest plan won't work against me, dear cousin, Mangetsu said as he suddenly let his chakra burst into both his blades. Mangetsu could let his chakra flow freely and store inside the blades, allowing it to change to any shape he wished. We will see, Kogetsu said as he readied his sword. Ganryu and the others all looked on from behind Kogetsu as he single-handedly took out the remaining umbu and held Mangetsu at bay. Who the hell is that kid? 
someone asked. Gonryu had to think hard before it came to him. He is the youngest son of the Ganjetsu line. Currently the only living heir to the Ozuki clan. His brothers were all killed during the war and the civil war. Gabriel said, informing everyone. Should we help him? Another asked. No. I think this battle is beyond our abilities. We would only get in the way. Gonryu said as he ordered his men to stand down. Meanwhile, May found herself trapped under some debris from the shockwave that had sent her flying. Her shoulder was severely damaged, and she was lucky Mangetsu hadn't hit a vital point. How long have I been out? She asked herself as she got free and stood to her feet, taking a look around. May couldn't see anything around her and guessed she had been blown quite far from the battle. I need to get back in the fight. She said as she winced at the pain, gripping her arm. I don't know how much use I will be with my arm like this, but I have to try. Kogetsu and Mangetsu were locked in a vicious battle, and Mangetsu clearly held the advantage. Kogetsu was good with a sword that much was clear. However, Mangetsu was next level and outclassed Kogetsu with his ability. Kogetsu blocked and blocked, dodging when he could, but Manjitu was too fast as he landed blow after blow. If not for his clan's Kekiai Jinkai, he would have been dead over and over again. Mangetsu was using each blade as a perfect weapon and shield as he could change the shape of the blade at will. He would attack with one and defend with the other, consistently switching between offense and defense when he felt like it. Mangetsu was finished playing around as he knocked Kogetsu's sword from his hand before turning his other sword into a giant hammer. Let's see your body recover from this. He shouted as he swung his attack. Kogetsu couldn't defend, and the blow smashed him flying through the air. If not for his Kekiai Jinkai that allowed him to liquefy, his body would have broken from the force of that blow. Kogetsu allowed his body to turn solid midair so he could flip around and get his footing as he hit the ground. I don't think so. Mangetsu shouted from behind him. Kogetsu turned around and formed a water blade from his arm to block one of Mangetsu's attacks. But his mighty hammer-shaped chakra broke through it and smashed Kogetsu again, sending him flying. If I can't cut you, then I will smash you to pieces until you are too dehydrated to turn to water. Mangetsu shouted as he smashed Kogetsu over and over again. Kogetsu may not have been taking any damage just yet, but Mangetsu was also part of the Ozuki clan and knew how to counter their ability quite well. Water style, drilling bullet. He shouted as he fired his water pistol. Mangetsu saw the attack coming a mile away and turned one of his swords into a large shield as he let his chakra change form, blocking the water bullet with ease. I don't think so, cousin. Kogetsu was starting to get out of breath now, and he could tell his body was becoming dehydrated quickly. Not good. I knew I should have packed my water bottle. I always do this. He said to himself as if he was scolding himself for not planning sufficiently enough. I think it's time we finish this, Mangetsu said as he took a fighting stance preparing his swords for an attack. All right, everyone, we need to attack together, on my signal attack with all your might. Gonryu said to his men. All of them agreed as they could see that Kogetsu was starting to struggle against his older cousin. Mangetsu had started spinning his blades before joining them back together, letting the chakra in each of them grow even more powerful. Time to finish it, traitor, Mangetsu said as he hoisted his sword straight into the air. Now! Gabriel shouted as himself, and all of his men unleashed their most powerful long-range attack. Shuriken and Kunai, Water, Fire and Wind Ninjutsu, as well as other projectiles were launched towards Mangetsu in a surprise attack. Mangetsu turned around with a shocked expression on his face at the attacks coming his way. You dare! He shouted as he turned to face them head-on before swinging his sword as hard as he could, letting his chakra explode in a massive burst of power. However, his attack was not strong enough to stop the large assault of ninjutsu, and he was consumed by the combined attack, which exploded, creating a large shockwave that kicked up a massive vapor cloud. All of them started cheering as their combined attacks hit the mark. We did it! All right. Everyone cheered as they watched the dust from their attacks settle leaving no trace of Mangetsu. 
Gonryu also breathed a sigh of relief as the dust settled, but his gut was telling him it wasn't over. Look out! Kogetsu shouted. Suddenly a group of men and women were blown into the air by a chakra blast. Everyone turned to see Mangetsu who was crouched down, holding his sword, not looking happy. His body looked as if it had half-melted, but it was only his liquefied state. His body slowly returned to its solid state, and Mangetsu went on an aggressive counterattack. Did you really think you could stop me with that? He shouted as he jumped into the air and slashed his sword into the ground, crushing a handful of shinobi who failed to get out of the way of his massive chakra blade. Counterattack! Gonryu shouted. Several shinobi tried to engage Mangetsu in combat, but he quickly cut them down, making it look easy, showing just how powerful he was. Others tried to throw shuriken at him, but the metal stars simply passed right through his body like water. It's no good. We can't even damage him. Gonryu thought as he tried to think of a way to counter his abilities. He was put on the defensive, though, as Mangetsu set his sights on him and attacked. You're the leader, so you can die. Mangetsu said as he appeared behind Gonryu, slashing at his head. Gonryu only just got his sword up to block the attack and was taken back by his speed. Mangetsu quickly spun around and kicked Gonryu in the stomach knocking him flying before he crashed into his men. Die! Mangetsu shouted as he raised his sword, getting ready to unleash another chakra blast at them. Rezuiri Yudin Lightning Water Dragon A massive water dragon coated with lightning release suddenly roared as it smashed into Mangetsu with such force that it destroyed everything in its path until it crashed into the ground and burst, expelling a massive amount of water that crackled with lightning. Everyone turned to see who had unleashed such a powerful jutsu and found Mei stood there clutching her shoulder as it was severely injured. That should stop him. She said through staggered breaths, having used a lot of chakra. Everyone was amazed after seeing such an amazing jutsu and stepped aside as Mei walked towards her target. Mangetsu was still alive but was severely injured and unable to move due to the high voltage running through his body. It's over, Mangetsu, give up or I will be forced to kill you," Mei said as she stood over him. Kogetsu joined her side and looked down at his cousin. Please, Mangetsu, just hear her out. Ao slowly woke up after losing consciousness due to the explosion that Aimuri had set off, thanks to her Thunder Gate ability. He sat up and tried to take in his surroundings. His head was still ringing from the blast, so he took his time. Hatsu! He shouted out trying to find his ally. Did he survive? Ao thought as he looked around. Ao caught a rustling sound coming from some of the bushes and put his guard up. Good job, too, as Aim Yuri appeared. Ao noticed she was hurt and only had one of her swords. You asshole. She said, clearly pissed off. She had taken damage along one side of her body more than the other, most likely because she could only protect one side of her body with one sword. I'm going to kill you if it is the last thing I do. She screamed, pointing her sword into the air. It's over, Aim Yuri. You're fighting for a lost cause. Ao shouted, trying to get her to stop. It was no good, though. Aim Yuri had gone mad, letting her lust for revenge take over her, abandoning all reason. I will kill you if it's the last thing I do. She shouted, letting her rage spill out. Thunder Gate! Amuri shouted as she let as much chakra as she could muster pour into the attack. Ao looked up in horror as he could see the thunder clouds forming. Not good, I can't dodge it! He thought. Amuri laughed as she got ready to drop the wicked thunderbolt from the sky when suddenly a sword burst through her chest, causing her to cough up some blood. Ao was also shocked and realized that it was Hatsu. He had somehow gotten behind her and stabbed her through the chest in an attempt to stop her. Amuri turned her head a little as the shock set in. You bastard. She spat out through the blood. It's over, Amuri. You have lost. Hatsu said, digging his sword deeper into her back. Amuri winced from the pain and lowered her sword in defeat before coughing up more blood. Ao breathed a sigh of relief and dropped back onto his but taking a well-needed rest. Your prick isn't big enough to stop me. 
Amuri suddenly shouted as she used the last of her strength to lift her sword into the air. No, don't! Ao shouted as he watched, extending his arm. Thundergate! Amuri screamed as she summoned one last lightning strike that hit her and Hatsu, engulfing them in the binding light before the explosion sent Ao flying back. While all this was going on, Fiona and Yagura had been engaged in a stare-off that was about to turn into a fierce clash of titans. Both of them stood ready, each waiting for the other to make the first move. Both in full-tailed beast mode with their tails waving in the sky. Yagura moved first as he jumped into the air, curling into a ball as he rolled tenaciously towards Fiona. The sheer size of his body was enough to uproot the terrain as he rolled forwards, attacking with the total weight of his body. Saiken's body only had small arms, so Fiona was forced to use two of his tails to block the attack. Yagura continued to roll and flipped into the air before Fiona smashed him away with his other tails getting some distance. Quickly he covered the latitude between them and smashed the three tails on top of the head with his tails before unleashing a huge amount of water bubbles that exploded on its hide, causing massive damage. Yagura flinched from the explosive bubbles, and Fiona quickly used the opportunity to wrap his flexible body around his, holding him in place. The three tails roared as its movements became halted, and in a desperate attempt, it tried to fire a tailed beast bomb that would hit the ground, damaging both of them. Look out! Saiken shouted, trying to warn Fiona. Fiona saw the attack at the last second and was quickly able to wrap one of his tails around Yagura's leg, pulling him off balance and knocking him over so that, that the blast flew into the sky. Both of the tailed beasts wrestled on the ground as they thought for dominance over each other. Their tails clashed and destroyed anything they hit as the landscape around them was shredded to pieces sending shockwaves through landscape. We have to be careful not to let our battle get too close to the village. Fiona shouted to Saiken. I know! The six tails replied as he was doing his best to control the three tails. The three tails suddenly stopped wriggling, and Saiken figured out why when his coral palm started to take effect, covering his body in the tough substance unabling him to move. It's his coral palm technique. Look out! Fiona shouted as Saiken was forced to release the three tails. Quickly Saiken created as much distance as he could before the coral palm froze his movements. I guess it's time for that jutsu, Fiona said as he watched from his inner world. Saiken's body suddenly unleashed a massive amount of bones that took the shape of a large exoskeleton that formed around the six tails' body like armor, smashing all of the coral that had formed. The sight was monstrous, and Saiken looked like a demon with two large horns forming on its head. Everything, including its six tails, was covered in the bone armor that acted as defense with spikes all over making it even more forbidding. The three tails growled, showing it wasn't intimidated as it fired a barrage of tailed beast bombs that smashed into Saiken's bone armor. However, they hardly left a mark and Fiona decided to counterattack. Ice-style, freezing bubble jutsu. Fiona shouted as he let loose a barrage of water bubble towards the three tails. The bubbles hit their mark and, this time, froze on impact instead of exploding. They kept coming, and the three tails was quickly overwhelmed by the amount as they trapped its large body in a layer of ice. If I can freeze him for long enough, I should be able to undo the seal. Fiona shouted. Yagura was having none of it, though, and smashed the ice away with his tails before he jumped back into a ball and rolled out of the way of Fiona's attack. He was rolling around Fiona in a circle as he fired small blasts of chakra at him, trying to chip away at his armor. The attacks were no way near strong enough to break through his defense, though, and Yagura decided to attack with his own shell that was as strong as armor, becoming impatient. Fiona did the same thing as last time and stopped the three tails with his tails. This time though, his bone defense acted as a weapon as the bone armor came to life and attacked the three tails from all angles. 1,000 Bones Counter-Attack Fiona shouted as the bone armor continued to hit the three tails with powerful blunt strikes not to kill him. The constant barrage of attacks was too much for even the three tails' body to handle as Fiona held him close, he was continually attacked by the bone armor as if it had a mind of its own. Finally, Fiona released the three tails, looking as if the beast had been knocked out from the onslaught. Now is my chance. Secret Tailed Beast Jutsu Ice Mist 
he said as Saikian unleashed a fog that looked like dry ice over the three tails. Saikian could release a poison cloud or an acid cloud that could melt almost anything. Fiona had been able to combine his own Kekiai Jinkai with Saikian's ability and create an ice fog that would freeze anything it came into contact with. He watched as the ice fog made its way through the surrounding terrain, freezing everything before it made its way to the three tails. The mist enveloped the three tails' body and started to freeze it, instantly trapping the beast inside a solid block of ice. It worked! All right, Saikian, you know what to do, he said. Saikian nodded its head, and its large body suddenly started shrinking until it turned back into Fiona. Hopefully, that holds for a while. Fiona thought as he rushed over to the massive frozen body of the three tails. Fiona placed his hand on the ice and slipped inside of it, being able to move around freely, he traveled up towards the three tails' head and could see its eye movements to look at him. You are a tough one. I'll give you that. Fiona thought as he placed his hand on the beast's head, concentrating. Fiona was able to enter Yagura's inner world, hopefully he wouldn't have any interruptions this time. He made his way to the same place he had last time and once again found the three tails that was still chained up and trapped. Yagura was also led on the floor unconscious, and stood over him was Abito. Who didn't look pleased? You again. What use is this fool if he can't even beat you? Never mind, I will deal with you myself. Abito said as he stood over Yagura's. Body. Fiona realized that Abito was about to kill him and had to act fast. Stop! He shouted as he appeared in front of Abito and tried to kick him in the face. As expected, though, his foot passed right through his head, and Abito went to grab him so he could attack. Fiona quickly let his bones shoot from his body, and Abito was forced to use his Sharingan to avoid the attack. Fiona took the opportunity to grab Yagura quickly and get some distance from Abito. What a nuisance you are proving to be, Abito said as he weighed his options up. It's over, Abito. Release the Jinjutsu. Fiona shouted. He was thinking very hard about what he should do right now. If he could kill Abito here and now, he would stop the war and everything he would do in the future. The only problem was he wasn't sure he could kill him here. Most likely, he was just a part of the Jinjutsu, and his physical body was elsewhere. And if I don't? Abito asked. Then I will push you out and break the Jinjutsu by force, Fiona said as he allowed his bones to sprout from his body, including the horns on his head. Abito chuckled a little before speaking. You fool. You can't kill me here, and I wouldn't force the Jinjutsu if I were you. Fiona expected as much and decided to play along. Why is that? You see... I have rigged the Jinjutsu so that if anybody but me breaks it, then the seal will self-destruct, killing the Mizukage, Abito said, smiling behind his mask. Fiona hadn't realized that he had rigged the Jinjutsu so that it would kill Yagura. Do it! Yagura shouted as he was trying to sit up. Do it, Fiona! I refuse to be a puppet! He shouted. That's enough from you. Abito said as he raised his fingers, taking complete control of him once again. This time, I will have him destroy the entire Mist Village and everyone you care for. Abito shouted as he pulled out two chains from his black cloak. But first, it's time to deal with you. Six Tales Chapter 42 Time to take care of you, Six Tales, Abito said as he let two chains drop from the sleeves of his robe. Fiona recognized he was dressed the same way when he battled against the fourth Hokage, chains and all. So be it, Fiona said, having had enough of holding back. Abito was a little shocked by his speed as Fiona almost ripped through his body with a quick slash of his arm that was covered in razor-sharp bones. Abito had managed to avoid the attack with his Sharingan ability and turned to trap Fiona in his chains. Fiona wasn't impressed and grabbed the chain with his free hand, freezing the metal before snapping it in two. Abito was flung into the air and landed swiftly before being forced on the defensive. He had had to let his entire body slip into another dimension to escape Fiona's onslaught of attacks before he reappeared at a safe distance. You are indeed strong, Kage Slayer, Abito said. 
I will have to pull him in as fast as I can. Abito then thought as he took a ready stance. It's time to end this, Fiona said as he started to create hand signs. Abito smiled behind his mask as he vanished and reappeared, ready to grab Fiona, sucking him into another dimension. You fell for it. Fiona thought as he suddenly allowed bones to shoot out from all over his body. Abito was forced to let them pass through him again and couldn't grab Fiona as there was nowhere to hold. Abito jumped back, and as soon as his foot touched the ground, it froze. Ice traveling halfway up his body. How did he? Abito shouted in shock as he couldn't move. Now! Ice mist! Fiona said as he let loose his ice mist jutsu, knowing that it would follow him into his jutsu as ice mist froze the very air itself right down to the atoms. Abito slipped into his dimension to avoid the jutsu. However, his cloak and body started to freeze over anyway. He quickly tossed the robe off his body and was even forced to rip his white zetsu arm off to stop the spread. How did his jutsu reach me here? Abito asked, confused. I thought I slipped away in time. It would seem this battle is lost. I can't fight him at half strength and with only one arm. Abito said to himself. Suddenly to Abito's surprise, an ice mirror starts to form from the ice on his cloak, and Fiona dashed out of it kicking him in the chest. Abito hit the ground hard and slid along the floor before he flipped over, landing back to his feet. H. How did you? He said, clutching his chest from the blow. Fiona played with a bone blade in his hand as he twirled it between his fingers. Looks like I figured out how to counter your jutsu. Now you can't run. Fiona said as he fired round after round of lightning-style bone bullets. Abito did his best to dodge and block each barrage, but with only one arm, he was unable to. The bone bullets shredded into pieces and soon enough, he fell to his knees, exhausted and out of options. Why you? I will make you suffer for this. Abito said, extremely angry. Fiona walked over to him and placed a hand on his forehead. This should release the Jinjutsu. He said as he slapped his hand onto Abito's head, breaking the seal and stopping his Jinjutsu. Abito's body started to fade away as the Jinjutsu faded. Fiona had been right. He couldn't kill him here, hell he was pretty sure he wasn't even fighting Abito at half his power, but it didn't matter. We will meet again. Kage killer, Abito said before he entirely faded away. Fiona slipped back into the ice mirror and returned to Yagura's inner world. It was all one big complex Jinjutsu and inner mind battle, but it had been real. If Fiona had lost his real body would have suffered the same as his mind had. Fiona let the deeper thoughts of what had just happened or how it had passed over his head. No good would come of overthinking it. Now he had to attend to the Mizukage. Abito had been right, the seal had been rigged, and now he was dying. Yagura was awake and taking slow yet deep breaths. Fiona. You did it. He said, clearly weak. It's over, Lord Mizukage. The Jinjutsu has been broken. Yagura smiled. I knew I could count on you, Fiona. He was too strong for me to defeat, and now I must leave the rest to you. He said as he started coughing. I'm sorry I couldn't save you, Fiona said with a heavy heart. No. I'm sorry it had to come to this. I let you down. I let my village down, and I failed as the Mizukage. He said, tears coming to his eyes. Promise me, Fiona. Promise me you will do better than I did. Promise me you will lead and protect the village. Fiona nodded as he looked Yagura in the eyes. I will. I think knowing that the village is in your hands means I can rest easy he said with a small smile. Fiona noticed that the three tails was also waking up now, and the chains that had bound it fell away. I have one last favor to ask of you, Fiona. I know it is selfish of me, but please. He said as the light was starting to fade from his eyes. What it is? Fiona asked. Please look after my daughter. She is only young and will face so much hardship for what I have done. Please look out for her. Yagura asked with his final breath. I will, Fiona said. With that, 
Yagura took his last breath, and the life faded from his eyes, yet the smile remained on his face. Suddenly the three tails roared and attacked Fiona with pure rage as it smashed its tails down at him. This was his warning to leave, and in doing so, Fiona opened his eyes, taking in his surroundings of the real world. He was still inside the ice that had trapped the three tails. But, now its body started to shrink, and it soon returned to Yagura's structure. Fiona knew now that Yagura had passed, the three tails would also die. But he also knew it would come back soon enough. The only problem would be getting to it before anyone else did. Fiona released his jutsu, and the huge block of ice simply burst, turning into snow that blew away in the wind. It's over, Fiona said as he looked at Yagura's body lying on the ground. You did everything you could, Fiona, Saikin said. He knew that, yet he still felt as if he had failed. I had better let the others know it's over. He said as he made the hand signs to create some clones. The clones burst off in different directions to locate each group and relay the news to them. He hoped that they had all survived the battle, and he also hoped with the news of Yagura's death, it would stop the fighting. Fiona let his clones scatter as they went off to find the rest of his allies who had been fighting their own battles. Fiona could only hope that they had survived and waited for his clones to make contact. Currently, Mei, Kogetsu and Ganri were resting as they had defeated Yagura's Umbu and Mengetsu, who was now restrained so he could do no further damage. He had already killed three-quarters of Ganryu's unit, including the reinforcements from Kagas. He had been able to wound Mei and even defeat his own cousin Kogetsu who was the next head of the Ozuki clan. You won't get away with this. I'll kill you all. Mangetsu roared even though his body had an electrical current running through it so that he couldn't move. Give it up, Mangetsu. The battle is over. Mei said. Shouldn't we take more precautions and restrain him more? Kogetsu said. Mei was starting to get the impression that this kid was a real worrywart. It's fine, he can't move like that, and besides, the battle is over now. She said. Mei was sat down with her back to a tree as she let her shoulder rest. It would need medical treatment, but for now, rest was the next best thing. Ganryu was busy tending to his fallen troops, and the number was fast approaching 100. We should kill him. He's too much of a threat to be left alive. He said, letting his anger take over. Calm down, Ganryu. Our orders are to keep as many alive as possible, remember? May said, standing to her feet. He single-handedly killed one hundred of my men. I can't just let this go. Ganryu shouted as he drew his sword. Kogetsu stood in his path along with May. I can't let you kill him either. I am sorry for what he has done. He was fighting for the village, not knowing why. You can't blame him for following the Mizukage's orders even if they were wrong. Kogetsu said, actually making sense. I don't care. He must pay. Ganryu said. He wasn't the only one who agreed, as the others that had survived the battle took his side. The odds for Mei and Kogetsu were looking slim now as it was the many versus the few. Just calm down, otherwise. Mei started. Otherwise, what? You will kill us? Ganryu said, raising his sword. Yeah, get out of our way. Someone else shouted with more joining in. May knew this wasn't looking good, and unless she wanted to kill her own men, she would have no choice but to let them have Mangetsu. No! Kogetsu shouted as he took a battle stance. If you want Mangetsu, you will have to kill me first. He shouted. Ganryu and his unit of twenty others didn't seem too bothered with that, and all got ready to charge. No, you can't. Ganryu, stand down. Mei shouted. Kogetsu didn't like his chances and decided he had no choice. Turning around, he shot a water bullet at the sword that was holding Mengetsu in place. Mengetsu had remained silent this whole time, and now he was free. He jumped up into the air and faced Ganryu and the others without fear. Not so tough now I'm free, are you? If you want me dead, come and get me. He shouted as he pulled his sword from the ground taking a battle-ready position. Kogetsu, what have you done? 
Mei shouted as she jumped back away from Mengetsu. We don't have to fight anymore. It's over! Kogetsu shouted, trying to calm both sides. It's too late for that kid. Gonryu shouted. Attack! He shouted as he charged forwards, his men following him. Mengetsu let his chakra flow into his sword, allowing it to grow and grow until it became so large that it could wipe all of them out in one swing. I should have done this in the first place instead of toying with you. Mengetsu shouted as he swung his sword. All seemed helpless to Mei and Kogetsu as the two groups were determined to kill one another. That's enough. A voice shouted as the owner moved too fast for anyone to see. A forceful gust of wind blew Gonryu and the others back so hard that they flew through the air a good six meters before falling to the ground. Mengetsu had also been unable to see what was going on but had launched his attack anyway, intent on killing all of them in one blow. However, to his and everyone else's shock, Fiona could be seen as the dust settled. He was in his tailed beast cloak with six tails as he had stopped Mengetsu's attack with one arm that was protected in a layer of bone while with the other, he had pushed everyone aside to create room. Mengetsu was shocked to see that Fiona had stopped his attack with just one arm, and if anything, it pissed him off. Why you? Mengetsu shouted as he split his swords in two and went for the attack. Fiona gave him a stern look as he closed the gap too fast for Mengetsu to see, striking his chest with a palm strike. His hand went right through Mengetsu, and he smiled. That won't work on me. But to his horror, he found that he couldn't move. What what have you done? He shouted as he managed to look down to see that his body had been frozen from his chest down, unabling him to move. It's over, Mengetsu, Fiona said as he simply took his swords out of his hands before stabbing both of them into the ground. Everyone was amazed at his display of power, and Fiona let the tailed beast cloak fade away into the wind. The battle is over. Lord Mizukage is dead. He shouted, getting everyone's attention. Mengetsu was now extremely shocked, but despite his best efforts, he still couldn't move. So it came to that? May asked. I want all of you to come to my location here. He said as he shouted them. Gonryu then realized that this Fiona was only a clone, yet he had still been able to stop Mengetsu as if he were a child. And no more fighting. This war is over. He said, looking at Mengetsu and Gonryu. Gabriel bowed his head in agreement, but Mangetsu spat on the ground. You think I will follow you after this? He shouted. Fiona thought it might come to this and walked over to him, placing his hand on his head. If you don't believe me, then watch. He said as he placed a seal on his head, allowing Mangetsu to see what he had seen. Mangetsu couldn't believe it, but after seeing it with his own eyes, he gave in. So you were telling the truth. But how? Why? He said, still not understanding. Come with the others, and I will show you, Fiona said as he undid his jutsu and handed back his sword. Mengetsu took it and, after a slight pause, clicked his blades back together and placed it on his back. Very well. He said, falling in line. I will see you all there, Fiona said before his body turned to ice and broke into pieces as the clone jutsu came undone. Mengetsu watched as Fiona turned into a clone, and he couldn't help but feel weak. A clone, even physical, was not even as strong as half of the power of the original. He did know that a shadow clone jutsu of the hidden leaf was different, and just one clone would be at half the original strength. But that still didn't answer his question of just how strong Fiona was and how he could stop his attack with just one arm. Meanwhile, one of Fiona's other clones had found Kata's group, who had been stationed along the village's border to protect it. They had also provided reinforcements to Gonryu and had even had to fall back from the aftermath of Fiona's battle with Yagura. Captain Yuki! Kaga shouted as he greeted him with a bow. Good to see you, Kaga, Fiona said with a smile. You too. Everything is good on our side, is the battle over? He said. Yes. I want you and your men to report to this location, where I will brief everyone at the same time. At once, Captain, Kaga said, not wasting any time. See you there, Kaga, Fiona said as his body turned to ice and his clone crumbled. 
All right, men, let's go. Kaga shouted as he leads the way. Fiona's last clone was currently making its way to find Hatsu and Ao. If he wasn't mistaken, he had last seen them in a battle against Aim Yuri. Fiona could feel Ao's chakra and watched as a massive thunderbolt hit the ground. Fiona rushed in to try and see what had happened, and he found Ao lying on the ground, hurt severely. Ao! What happened? Fiona asked as he knelt next to him. Well, look who decided to show, Ao said through the pain. He slowly sat up and pointed over to where the thunder had struck. It's not good, Fiona. Aim Yuri tried to take us all out in a last-ditched effort. I'm not sure if Hatsu made it. Ao said. Fiona turned around to get a better look. He was growing impatient and, with a wave of his arm, blew away the smoke with a gust of wind chakra. Aim Yuri was on her knees, still breathing somehow. However, to Fiona's atrocity. Hatsu was lead on the floor, lifeless. No. Fiona said as he walked over to take a good look at his body, seeing if there was anything he could do to try and save him. He's dead. Aim Yuri said through heavy breaths. The fool thought he could stick me and get away with it. She said, laughing at her own joke. This wasn't supposed to happen, Fiona said quietly to Hatsu, apologizing to his friend who had given his life for the sake of the village. I'm sorry, my friend. I wasn't able to protect you. He said, biting his lip. All of you are traitors and deserve to die. Hell, if I weren't so tired, I would do it myself. Aim Yuri said with a wicked smile. Fiona ran his fingers down Hatsu's eyes to close them before he made a few hand signs and placed his hand on his chest. I promise I will do what is right, just like you wanted me to, Hatsu, Fiona said, allowing his eyes to cover Hatsu's body so it would preserve it. So what now, boys? Aim Yuri said as she looked to Fiona and Ao, who was back on his feet clutching his arm. Ao, report to this location with the others. I want to brief everyone at the same time. Fiona said. Is it done? Ao asked. He's dead, Fiona said bluntly. Ao nodded and decided it was best he do as he was told, leaving Fu and Aim Yuri alone. Aim Yuri was shocked to hear that Yagura was dead and looked at Fiona, trying to gauge him from head to toe. You killed Lord Mizukage? She spat, still unable to move. Her attack had done a number on her, and from what Fiona could see, she had used her lightning style to keep her wound from killing her, for now. I did. Just like you killed my friend. Hatsu. Fiona said as he slowly kneeled down in front of her, so they were face to face. He was your friend? Well, sorry about that. She said as she coughed up more blood. I could save you. Your wounds are still within the realm of being able to save your life. By all rights, you are a strong Kunoichi, the second strongest in the whole village. Fiona said with his eyes closed as he was deep in thought. Just get on with it, will you already? I hate long drawn out speeches. She said. Fiona opened his eyes and placed a hand on her chest. He let his eyes spread and stopped the bleeding in her chest, it was a little painful, but she soon found relief. Why? She asked, confused. I think you have the wrong idea, Aim Yuri. I'm not saving your life. I am merely extending it so I can make you suffer. Fiona said as he suddenly drove a frozen knife hand into her stomach. Aim Yuri flinched as she could feel his hand inside her, and she coughed up some blood as he pulled it back out. Her face suddenly went pale as the pain started to become unbearable. What what have you done? She screamed all of a sudden as she doubled over from it. Aim Yuri curled up into a ball as she screamed in agony from whatever Fiona had done to her. Arga! She screamed as she kicked her legs out from the pain. Fiona remained knelt down Japanese style as he watched her squirm. What I have done to you is something I created for my worst enemies. I call it subatomic cryonic jutsu. Fiona said. It took me a long time to get it down. You are the first living person I have tried it on. Arga! Aim Yuri screamed again as she rolled and jarred around from the pain. 
What it does is it freezes your body at a subatomic level. I don't know what your knowledge of physics is like, but subatomic means something smaller than an atom. Fiona said, It's not something your world would know much about, but in mine. Well, where I am from, we knew about these things. He said with a small smile coming to his face as Aim Yuri started to spasm from the pain. It is the scale at which the atomic constituents, such as the nucleus containing protons and neutrons, and the electrons, which orbit in spherical or elliptical paths around the nucleus, become apparent. In layman's terms, your body is freezing from the inside out, from the very inside. The inside that you didn't even know you had is freezing, causing such severe pain that you will most likely die of a heart attack before you freeze to death. However, that's where I come in. Every time your heart is about to give out, I will kickstart it with a jolt of electricity, like a defibrillator, if you will. Bringing you back so that you can endure more and more pain every time. He said, Arg! Amuri screamed as she experienced her first heart failure. As promised, Fiona jolted her with a weak lightning style, restoring her heart after a moment, letting her feel the pain all over again. He continued to do this over and over so that she would suffer. This torture would continue in secret while everyone else met up with the real Fiona so he could brief them on what had happened until he was satisfied with his revenge. So that's the end of this chapter. A little bit deep towards the end, but a fate that she deserved for killing the MC's best friend. Chapter 43 Fiona waited by Yagura's body for the others to arrive. His clones had relayed the information to him once he had released the jutsu, and his heart was saddened by the news of Hatsu's death. He felt no remorse for what he had done to Aim Yuri, and he pushed the thought to the back of his mind as the others started to arrive. Mei and Ganryu's group were first. They gave Fiona a nod, and their unit fell in line at the sight of the dead Mizukage. Soon Kaga and his unit also arrived, and they did the same. The goal had been to stop the Mizukage either by freeing him or killing him. Everyone was surprised that Fiona had been able to kill him without a scratch. Yagura had seemed invincible to most, and the thought that he could be killed was far-fetched. Ao was the last to arrive and gave Fiona his respects, and he saw Yagura's body lying next to him on the ground. Now that everyone was here, Fiona was ready to brief them on what had happened. There was easily one hundred shinobi present, and Fiona gave them all a heavy gaze before he took a breath. As all of you can see, the Mizukage is dead. Fiona said, letting his voice echo over all of them. Our goal here was to break the Jinjutsu that was controlling him and hopefully save his life. That wasn't an option. Due to the circumstances and events that transpired along the way, I was forced to kill him. Fiona said, letting his words sink in. No one said anything as they all waited for him to continue, remaining silent. It is with a heavy heart that I report to you that our mission is complete. Let us remember the Mizukage, not for the things he was forced to do, but for the things he wanted for the village. Everyone fed off of Fiona's words and let the emotion set in. Where the mist falls, one shall find its people. Ever changing like water, they will give rise to more mist, that will forever preserve the village. Fiona said, quoting the words of the first Mizukage and lifting the spirits of his men. Let's hear it for General Fiona. Someone suddenly shouted. Everyone burst out into cheers as they started to chant his name, and even his captain started to join in. May couldn't help but smile as she looked at the man standing before her. He was a hero, and his strength was second to none. Fiona raised his hands for everyone to settle down, and after a moment, they did. Thank you, everyone. Let us remember those who gave their lives for our village today. Forever encompassing their names into the history of our village. Everyone nodded and paid their respects in a moment of silence before Fiona spoke again. What we have achieved here today will mark the start of a new future for all of us. The hidden mist will shed its dark and bloody past, and with the help of all of you, we shall lead her down a righteous path, protecting our own and doing what is right for our people. We still face dark days ahead. But in time, our village will heal, and its people grow. Fiona finished as he summoned Mei and his other captains to the front, including Mengetsu. Together, 
We will make the hidden mist great once more. He finished, getting cheers and applause for all of them. Fiona watched as all of the men and women surrounding him cheers and celebrated as they had completed their mission. Everyone was thankful that the dark reign of Yagura had come to an end. But Fiona knew it would take time to heal. First, he would have to confront the village elders and then the villagers themselves. There was much work to be done and little time to do it. As the threat of the sand remained a high priority, the mist would be forced to elect a new leader so as not to look weak in the face of her enemies. Fiona turned to his captains and decided to include Mangetsu, who had become complying with Fiona. You all know what is still to be done, he said, looking all of them in the eye. Kaga, take Mangetsu with you. Having the last member of the seven ninja swordsmen will aid our cause he said. Kaga agreed and turned to Mangetsu. I'll fill you in in the details along the way, Kaga said to him. Mangetsu nodded and decided to stay quiet for now. All right. Ao, May, with me. Everyone else. You know what to do. As planned, Fiona and the others returned to the village to sort out the affairs that would now need tending to. Kaga and now Mangetsu's job was to take a large scale of shinobi and prevent any unrest or possible uproar about what had happened. After all, the shockwaves of the battle had not gone unnoticed, and people were starting to ask questions. Fiona now also hoped with Mangetsu's help, they would be able to recruit more shinobi to their side to help with the unrest. Gonryu and Kogetsu were to patrol the borders to make sure no one left. Until this whole thing was cleared up, the village was on total lockdown as of Fiona's and Ao's orders. That left Fiona, Ao, and Mei to brief the village elders and summon all of the appropriate heads of state, including the daimyo. After they had finished tending to Mei and Ao's injuries, of course. Fiona and the others entered the Mizukage's office and now waited for the elders to arrive. They had made a stop to the medical bay to tend to their wounds, giving Fiona enough time to make the arrangements. Sure enough, it didn't take them long to respond to his summons and arrived all at once. They were not alone as the remaining clan heads of each clan also started to arrive. The head of the Hozuki clan who was Kogetsu's father. The other was the Hashigaki clan, the only other clan to remain as the Karatachi was lead by Yagura, and the others had all succumbed to genocide over the dark history of the village. They all looked surprised to see Ao, Mei and Fiona waiting for them and didn't wait for answers. What is the meaning of this? One of the elders spoke. Where is Lord Mizukage? Another asked. Fiona had been looking out of the large window like Yagura had used to. He turned around slowly and stepped forwards to address everyone in the room. Welcome, everyone. Elders. Clan heads. Please, everyone, take a seat. I'm afraid I have some rather terrible news to relay. They all did as he asked as they recognized his power. What is going on here, Fiona? The head elder said. Fiona waited for all of them to sit down around the large desk before he took his seat. Fiona was sat at the head of the table where Yagura would usually sit while Ao and Mei sat on either side of him. He had also left the chair at the other end of the table empty, yet no one had questioned why. Yagura is dead. Fiona said. Everyone in the room showed their surprise at the information, and Ao could see some were happier than others. You mean to tell us that you killed him? One of the elders shouted. It's about time he got what was coming to him. The head of the Hozuki clan said. I don't disagree. The head of the Hashigaki clan also spoke. This is an outrage. Another of the elders said. It's treason. Fiona didn't say anything as they all started to shout it and bicker with one another. Letting them get their thoughts out on the table before he continued. That's enough. Ao finally shouted, getting all of them to be quiet. Fiona stood from his seat, and everyone looked at him in surprise. Suddenly the doors opened, and a small man entered dressed in robes. Lord Fiona, his lordship the daimyo and his daughter, Princess Mizuko have arrived. He announced. All of the elders had a sudden sense of urgency as they stood to their feet so that they could adequately greet the daimyo. Everyone was now standing, and the daimyo walked in with his daughter not far behind him. 
Everyone bowed their heads in a show of respect and waited for him to sit down. Fiona also noticed his daughter Mizuko, who sure had grown since the last time he had seen her. She also noticed him and bowed her head a little, smiling at him. Fiona returned the bow and the smile. After all, she was the reason he had been able to summon the daimyo in the first place. Welcome, my lord. We were not expecting you to grace us with your presence. One of the elders said. Thank you. The daimyo said as he leaned back in his chair a little. I summoned him, Fiona said as he took his seat last. What I have to tell you involves not just us, but our entire nation, Fiona said, getting everyone's attention. I start once again by welcoming you all, including yourself, my lord and lady, Fiona said, paying his respects to the daimyo. As I said, the fourth Mizukage, Yagura Karatachi, is dead. Everyone remained silent this time apart from the daimyo. He's dead? How? Who? He asked, just as shocked as everyone else had been. I discovered that Yagura was under the manipulation of another, through a powerful jinjutsu. He was forced to act to their will like a puppet, carrying out all the atrocities over the years. Fiona said, That is correct. I am here today to vouch for Fiona. I confirmed this information with my Byakugan. Ao said, showing his support. I too stand by Fiona that this information is correct. Along with the signature of several other Umbu captains and one member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen. May said, producing the sheet of paper. We had no choice but to lead a rebellion against him to break the Jinjutsu and free the Mizukage. We tried our best to do this in secret so not to drag the village into this mess. However, I was unable to save him, and in the aftermath, he was killed. Fiona said. Everyone in the room was shocked by the news and held their tongue as they waited for the daimyo to speak. I can't say I don't believe you. He started. I have watched as Yagura carved a blood-soaked path for a long time now, unable to do anything about it as the leader of my own nation he said as he stood to his feet. You have my thanks, Fiona Yuki. He said as he bowed to him, showing his gratitude. The elders were shocked, and Fiona returned the bow. I assume you don't know who the man responsible is? The daimyo said as he sat back down. Fiona also sat back down. I do, he said. Everyone, including Ao and May, looked at him as they waited for his answer. I believe the man responsible is Madara Uchiha, he said bluntly. Everyone gasped, especially the elders who were old enough to remember that man's terror and power. That can't be. He died long ago. One of them protested. Fiona had decided rather than complicated things by dropping Abito's name. He would use Madara's and keep it simple. After all, no one would know who Abito was, and that was the name he was using for himself. I was able to defeat Yagura while under his control and break the Jinjutsu, but Madara had rigged it so that it would take Yagura's life in the process, Fiona said. We must act. We cannot let this go unpunished. The Hidden Leaf must be held accountable for their own Ru Shinobi. One of the elders shouted. You fool! If it really is Madara Uchiha, then there is no one left who can stop him. Another said, clearly remembering his power. Everybody, just hold on a minute. Are you also forgetting our problems with the sand? One of the female elders said. Everyone started to mumble again, and Ao was left with no choice but to speak over them. I can assure you that Madara will not be a problem anymore. As for the sand, well, we must elect a new Mizukage, someone who is strong enough to show them our strength. Ao said, crossing his arms over his chest. Everyone remained silent but agreed as they nodded their heads. The looming threat of the hidden sand was drawing closer, and a meeting with their Kazakage was due soon. You know the rules, only the strongest among us can be granted the title of Mizukage. The head elder spoke. Everyone was looking at Fiona now. After all, he was the one who had defeated Yagura and had led the rebellion to begin with. Ao stood up to speak. I purpose that. He started. 
That may Tarumi be the next Mizukage. Fiona suddenly shouted over him. What? May shouted unintentionally. Ao also looked surprised at Fiona, and the others all looked at each other, mumbling. May is the strongest Kunoichi in the village and a perfect fit to be our next Mizukage. Fiona carried on to say, Fiona, what on earth are you doing? May said to him quietly, It's all right, May. You will make a great Mizukage, I'm sure of it. Fiona said with a smile. The daimyo crossed his arms and nodded his head. If she is coming as a recommendation from you, Fiona, then I accept. He said, shocking everyone. Mizuko also smiled at Fiona locking her brown eyes with his. He stared for a moment and then looked away. It's so then, what say you? He said, asking the others. The elders all looked at each other before they got ready to cast their vote. Agreed. They all said. Fiona then looked to the clan heads and waited for their response. The Ozuki clan agrees. The Hashigaki also accepts. Fiona nodded and stood up, offering May his hand. She took it after a slight pause, letting the shock settle. Fiona pulled her to her feet and stood her at the head of the table while he took her spot. I give you the Gode Mizukage, Fiona said, letting everyone's attention fall on her. May was so surprised that she almost turned red in the face, but with a quick breath, she regained her composure. After all, she was a highly skilled shinobi. Not one to succumb to pressure easily. I thank you all for your consideration. She said. It's settled then. May will be sworn in as the next Mizukage. The daimyo said, clapping his hands together. Everyone agreed and rose as the daimyo stood to his feet. I trust you can handle the rest. He said, looking at all of them. Yes, my lord. The head elder spoke. Very well, my presence is no longer required. I shall head back to the capital. He said, turning on his heels. Mizuko also bowed to everyone and winked at Fiona, catching him off guard a little. Everyone bowed to them as he they left the Mizukage's office, and they turned back to May and Fiona. So be it. We shall make the preparations for the ceremony at once. The elders said as they excused themselves. Both the clan's head for the Ozuki and Hashigaki clan gave a slight bow to Mei and Fiona before they too took their leave, leaving Ao, Mei and Fiona alone. What the hell was that? Mei suddenly shouted as the door closed. Fiona was expecting as much and sat back down with his arms crossed over his chest. Calm down, Mei. It's as I said. You will make a better Mizukage than me. He said with a small smile. May didn't seem impressed as she was about to say something. However, she fell back onto her chair, clutching at her shoulder. May! Fiona said as he went to catch her. He didn't need to as the chair did all the work, but he was worried. You don't look good, May. Your shoulder still isn't right. It would help if you got back to the medical corps at once. Our new Mizukage should be at full health before taking office, after all. Ao said, looking at Fiona. Fiona agreed, and once May was ready, he helped escort her to the village hospital, where she was checked in for another healing session. Fiona and Ao left her there for the time being and made their way outside, now that they were finally alone. Fiona guessed that Ao had questions for him. Why did you do that? Ao asked, deciding to take the blunt approach. Do what? Fiona asked. Don't play dumb, Fiona. Why did you pass on the responsibilities of the Mizukage to me like that? It should be you. He said, almost shouting. Calm down, Ao, Fiona said with a sigh. The truth is, I'm not ready to become the Mizukage. And I'm pretty sure our next Mizukage shouldn't be the man who killed the last one he said. Besides, I don't have time to run the village. I think I will best serve it outside of the spotlight. Ao crossed his arms in protest. In not doubting my ability. She is the obvious choice after you. But it should be you. You're the reason all of this was possible, Fiona. It should be you who leads us now. Ao said. 
Fiona placed a hand on his shoulder and gave him a friendly smile. Thank you, Ao, for trusting me this far, Fiona said before he removed his hand. May will make a great mizukage, and both of us will be there to support her from the shadows, Fiona said with a serious tone. Ao decided to stay quiet and give up the argument for now. If you say so, he said. Good, it's settled then. Now, if you don't mind, I have some matters to attend to. Fiona said, bidding him farewell. Ao nodded. I will keep an eye on things and report to you if anything happens, Ao said. Thank you, Fiona said. With that, Fiona turned around and slowly walked off into the mist. It was dark out now, and Fiona hadn't been home yet. He hoped that both Haku and Kimamara weren't slacking while he had been away. He couldn't help think that soon everything would change. Soon, everything would get better. It had been a dream of his for this village for so long now, and finally, he had become strong enough to turn it into a reality. He stopped dead in his tracks for a moment as he remembered he still had one place to go before he went home. He had gotten so caught up in the village elders' meeting that he had almost forgotten about his friend Hatsu. This can't wait until morning, Fiona said as he turned right at the crossroads, heading away from his house and towards Hatsu's. Fiona had sworn to himself that he would be the one to break the news to Hata's wife, Yua. Fiona finally arrived at his house and raised his hand to knock on the door. For some reason, he hesitated for a brief moment before knocking. Fiona wasn't waiting long before the door opened about an inch as Yua answered. Why yes? She said, trying to see who it was. F. Fiona! She said as she recognized him instantly and unlocked the door, opening it to its full extent. She looked a little surprised that her husband wasn't with him, though. Fiona, where is Hatsu? She asked as she looked into his eyes. Fiona remained silent as he couldn't form the words. Not after looking her in the face. Not after her husband had died for him. No. She said as she realized the look in Fiona's eyes. It can't be, she said as the shock set into her delicate features. Fiona had never had to tell someone's loved one that they had died. He had never seen the pain of a wife that had lost her husband. No, she screamed as she fell to her knees, no longer able to hold back the tears. Fiona didn't know what else to do other than to pick her up and hug her. Yua sobbed and sobbed, hitting Fiona with her fists in anger before nuzzling into his chest as her emotions ran wild. Hatsu! She screamed as her tears continued to fall. Fiona didn't say or do anything as he let her get it all out of her system. He must have been stood there for at least five minutes before Yua finally pulled away from him as she tried to check her emotions and calm down. H. How? She asked as she allowed Fiona to enter her house. He died in battle, Fiona said as he cleared some space on the large kitchen table. Yua looked a little surprised at what he was doing, but she didn't have the mental energy to question him. Fiona made a few hand signs, and suddenly, an ice mirror formed. Out of it slowly slipped Hatsu, who was frozen in an ice coffin. Yua could see her husband frozen at peace as the coffin slid into the table. Hatsu she said as she placed her hand on the eyes to look at his face. I'm sorry, Yua. I couldn't save him. I, I couldn't. No, Yua said, interrupting him. Hatsu believed in you, Fiona. He believed in you so much that he was willing to die for you. She said as she slowly looked up at him. Fiona still couldn't shake the guilt and lowered his head at Yua's gaze. You must not blame yourself. Please, she said, taking his hand. If he died for your cause, then I can be at peace with that. He would have wanted it this way. He always spoke so highly of you, saying you would be the one to save this village. Yua said. Fiona looked into her eyes and could see that she meant every word. Thank you, Yua. He said, giving her a faint smile. If there is ever anything you need. Please, don't hesitate to ask. Fiona said, taking her hand in his. Yua gave a small smile as her tears started to run down her cheek again. I will, Fiona. She said as she took a step back and bowed to him. 
Fiona felt his heartstrings twitch, and he bowed lower than he had ever done before. Fiona didn't stay any longer and left Yuo with Hatsu's body. It was frozen as a special kind of ice that would never melt. Not until the caster died or released the jutsu, that way his body would be preserved forever. Fiona slowly made his way back home, reaching the crossroads in the village that he had done before. It wasn't far to his house from here. Of course, he could simply use an ice mirror if he wanted, but something made him feel like walking tonight. Fiona took a deep breath and placed his hands in his pockets as he continued in his stride towards his home. His thoughts had gone quiet for the time being, and he simply enjoyed the fresh air, taking as much in as he could. As Fiona approached the last turn to his house, he caught a slight scent of perfume. Turning around the corner, he was greeted by long blonde hair, brown eyes, and turquoise earrings. Esuerin. Fiona said in surprise as the woman turned to face him, letting her hair blow gently in the wind. I've been waiting for you. Fiona. She said as she brushed her hair behind her ear, exposing her heart-shaped face. Chapter 44 Swearing was waiting for Fiona outside of his house. Her hair was blowing in the gentle breeze of the night. Her brown eyes fixed on him as he slowly approached her. Fiona remembered that the sealing jutsu he had placed on her had been on a timer, which meant that the jutsu would undo itself after a specific time. Now that it had been undone, all of her memories would have returned, and of course, she would come seeking answers. He watched as she stood there in silence, looking between him and the floor. Swearin moved her hair out of her face once more and gave him a small smile. You saved me again. She said. I'm sorry about your teammates. He responded with a heavy heart. Swearin's face turned heavy as she slowly squeezed her first to her chest. How did you know? She whispered. How did you know that was going to happen? She said again louder. Fiona sighed a little as he thought about his answer. Should he tell her he knew all along, should he come clean about who he really was? I didn't. He said. Deciding to lie. I just had a bad feeling. He said, looking her in the eyes. Swearin looked away, almost ashamed of herself to meet his gaze. I spoke to Ganryu. He told me everything. Everything that has happened, everything you have done to help save our village. She said. Why save me? Why does my life mean more than the others? She shouted as tears started to cultivate in her eyes. I wish I could save everyone. I wish I had enough power to protect everyone in the village. But I don't. I try, and I try, but I can't save everyone but I could save you. Your life means more to me, Swearin. You. I. He said, struggling to think of the words. You're special to me. He finally said. Tears were flowing from Swearin's eyes now as she looked Fiona dead in his. Why does my life mean so much to you? You saved the whole village. You stopped the mazukage and saved everyone. Why go out of your way to save me? She shouted, tears flowing freely from her eyes now. Fiona didn't know what else to do now and walked over to her, embracing her in a hug as he wrapped his arms around her body, pulling her closer to him. Swearin was shocked but returned his embrace as she squeezed his blue cloak nuzzling her head into his chest as she let out her cries. You are special to me, Swearin. I would do it all over again if it meant saving you. Fiona said as he rested his chin on her head, holding her tightly in his arms. Swearin had stopped crying and just held him, never wanting this moment to end. I'm such a mess. She said, still resting her head against his chest. I don't think so, Fiona said as he slowly pulled her off him so that he could look into her eyes. He wiped away her tears with his hand and smiled at her. Everything is going to be okay now. Everything will get better for all of us soon, I promise. Fiona said, looking deep into her eyes. Swearin could feel herself getting lost in his intense dark blue eyes. She couldn't think straight anymore. All she knew was that she felt safe with him and that there was nowhere else she would rather be. Swearin could feel herself slowly moving forwards. She could no longer contain her feelings for him. 
The man that held her now was someone she knew she could give herself to forever. With that, Swearin pressed her lips against his softly, kissing him and closing her eyes, deciding to take a leap of faith with her feelings. Fiona was shocked at her sudden advance, but after a short pause, he returned her kiss, pulling her closer. Their night became one filled with wild and intense passion as they made love, lasting all throughout the twilight. Use your imagination. Fiona woke up slowly to small voices coming from outside his door. After a moment, he realized it was Haku and Kimimaro who sounded too afraid to knock. Don't wake him. We know the way. Let's just go, Kimimaro said. But we haven't seen him for two days now. We should at least say hello, Haku said. Fiona could see that Swearin was still fast asleep wrapped up inside the blankets. Well, I guess it's time to get up. He thought as he slowly got out of bed and pulled his trousers on. Oh no, now you've woken him up. Kimimaro said to Haku as they could hear movement. No, I didn't. Haku said back. Fiona opened the door and could see them both stood there in surprise. Well, hello, boys. Having fun, are we? He said as he crossed his arms over his chest. Master. Both of them shouted as they dived in to hug him. Where have you been? Haku said as he squeezed him tightly. Kimimaro let go and smiled, nodding his head. Good to see you both, Fiona said as he patted both of their heads, smiling at them. I've been working. You'll understand when you get older, though. He said with a slight laugh. Are you taking us to the academy today? Haku asked. Kimimaro also looked excited for his answer but waited, being more patient than Haku. Wait for me downstairs, okay boys, Fiona said as he saw Swearin wake up. Okay, let's go, Haku, Kimimaro said, noticing that Fiona needed to do something. Haku nodded and got dragged downstairs by Kimimaro, leaving Fiona and Swearin alone. Good morning, Fiona said as he sat on the bed next to Swearin. Good morning, she said, her cheeks a little red from the memory of last night. Would you like some breakfast? Fiona asked. Swearin calmed down as she looked into his eyes. His strong and calming presence relaxing her. Yes, that sounds nice. She said, pulling the blankets a little higher to her chin. Fiona smiled. All right, make yourself at home. I'll take the boys to the academy and pick us something up, okay? He said. Swearin nodded. Okay. She said with a smile. With that, Fiona grabbed the rest of his clothes and made his way downstairs to Kimimaro and Haku, who were already packed and ready to go. All right, you're both ready, then I see? Fiona said with a chuckle. Both of them nodded with excitement, and Haku rushed to the front door. Let's go, let's go! He shouted. Fiona couldn't believe how happy both of them were. It warmed his heart to see them both full of joy like this. He could only imagine the hardships they would both be facing now if they had stayed on their intended path. Fiona finished taking them to the academy and watched them go inside. As he did, he could see Junsai, who was the boy's instructor at the academy, waving him over. Fiona noticed him and decided to go over to see what he wanted. Fiona! Good to see you! How have you been? Junsai asked as he rubbed the back of his head. I'm good. Thank you, Junsai. Is there something I can help you with? He asked, not sure what he wanted. Well, you see, Fiona. He said, a little nervous. It's your boys. He said. What about them? Fiona asked. Well, it's just that they are progressing so fast. I feel as if they will no longer need to stay in the academy. Junsai said. Fiona gave a slight chuckle. I expected as much. After all, they get so much training at home. Junsai looked a little nervous as he didn't know what to say. Yes. They far outclass every other student in their class, and I fear they will soon become unchallenged. Don't worry, Junsai. Grade them as normal. Once they pass, I will take it from there. Fiona said. 
Junsai gave him a nod. Leave it to me, he said. With that, Fiona headed off into the village to find something for breakfast. He instantly noticed that more shops were open and more people were wandering the streets. What he didn't expect was that everywhere he went, people bowed to him and hailed him a hero. Good morning, Lord Fiona, the old lady at the sweet shop said with a bow. Fiona returned her greeting with an awkward smile. Good morning, he said. Can I get two of those, please? He said as he pointed to some large sweet buns. The woman packed two of them neatly and handed them over. How much? He asked. The lady shook her head from side to side. No charge for you, she said. Fiona looked confused. Why? Please let me pay you for them, he said, feeling as if everyone was watching him. You are a hero. You saved my shop and business. Please take them. It is the least I can do to thank you, she said, bowing. Fiona took the bag slowly and looked around. Everybody was watching him and whispering. They were all good things too, which shocked him even more. Thank you, Fiona Salma. Someone in the crowd suddenly shouted. Yeah. You're a hero. Someone else cheered. Fiona was suddenly caught in the middle of a crowd of villagers that were all cheering for him, each of them praising him like he was a hero. Once he finally slipped away, he returned home with the food for him and Swearin when he was greeted by Ao, who was waiting for him at his door. Ao? Fiona said in surprise. Is everything all right? He asked, getting a bad feeling. You need to come with me, Fiona. It can't wait. He said, looking serious. Fiona sighed. What is it? He asked. I think it best if you find out for yourself. He said, not giving him any clues. All right, give me a moment. He said. Fiona walked into his house to see Swearin sitting down at the table in the kitchen. She was wearing a large black hoodie with her legs bare as she sat and drank some tea. Oh, you're back. She said with a smile as she placed her cup down. Did you bring us some breakfast then? She asked as she crossed her legs. Fiona had to say she was looking amazing. His entire body was screaming at him to take her again, especially when he watched her cross her long smooth legs. Is everything all right? She asked, noticing the look on his face. No. I mean yes. He blurted out suddenly. Swearin laughed at his silly reaction. We could always skip breakfast and go back upstairs. She said, biting her lower lip a little as she looked at him hungrily. Fiona felt his crotch twitch a little as she did it, and he had to force himself to regain his composure. I'm sorry, Swearin. But something has come up, he said as he placed their breakfast on the table. Ao is outside, and he says it can't wait, he said, feeling awful. He could see the look on Swiren's face, and he wouldn't blame her if she left and never spoke to him again. Oh! If he has come here, then it must be important, she said, standing to her feet. Is it okay? Fiona asked. She looked at him as if he was stupid for a moment. Fiona, of course, it is all right. The needs of the village must be met. I understand. She said, being very reasonable. Fiona was shocked. Any normal girl would have left and never come back. But she was a shinobi, after all. Go on, go. Don't worry about me. She said with a smile. I'll just start without you, she said, almost teasing him. Fiona was very happy to hear it and gave her a playful smile before he said goodbye. Once outside, he pulled his cloak on and nodded to Ao. All right, this had better be important, he said. Oh, I think you will think so, Ao said as he nodded for him to follow. Ao lead them to the Mizukage's mansion, and he wondered what was so important that he was summoned. Once they arrived, Fiona could see that May and all of the village elders were present in the Mizukage's officer. Good, you have arrived, the head elder said. 
Fiona looked at all of them and could feel a strangely tense atmosphere surrounding everyone. What's going on? Fiona asked. All of the elders stood up and bowed to him before they left the room. Each of them slowly walking outside one by one until only May, Fiona, and Ao remained. Fiona was starting to get more and more impatient now and looked at them both. Will one of you tell me what's going on now? He said, looking at each of them. Ao sighed. I'll lead you to it. He said as he placed a hand on Fiona's shoulder before he too left the room and closed the doors. Leaving only May and Fiona. Fiona looked over to May and could see she seemed tense, unlike her usual self. What's going on, May? He asked in a serious tone. May was sat down on the Mizukage's chair, looking away from him in her own little world. Fiona's words snapped her out of it, and she looked him in the eye, giving him a small smile. It's about my role as the Mizukage. She said, placing her hands onto the desk. What about it? Fiona asked. I won't be able to fulfill that role anymore. She said with a heavy heart. Look, May. We have already been over this. You will make a great mizukage. Fiona said as he walked over towards her. May gave a faint smile as she placed a hand onto her belly. Fiona. I'm pregnant. And I won't take no for an answer. I already told you, you're a much better choice than I. He said as he crossed his arms and turned his back on her. Not hearing her words at all. She looked a little confused and cleared her throat. Fiona. She said this time getting his attention. He turned around to look at her now he had finished talking and looked into her eyes. I'm pregnant. She said again, this time getting his attention. Fiona's eyes opened wide as the words sank in slowly. P pregnant. He blurted out. Chapter 45 P pregnant. Fiona said as the words sank in, causing him to go quiet. You're pregnant? Fiona said as he simply looked at May and down to her stomach. Yes. The medical corps confirmed it this morning. May said. Fiona sat down on one of the chairs as the news set in. Are you angry? May asked. Fiona looked up and smiled at her. How could I be angry? He asked. It's just a shock, is all. He said. May nodded. I didn't plan for this to happen either. She said. But I won't get rid of it. Fiona's head suddenly snapped around to look at May. I would never ask you to do that. He said almost harshly. May was a little surprised but lowered her head with a simple smile. I know. She said. Look, Fiona. I don't expect you to be with me because I am pregnant suddenly. We are both adults, and we both have a responsibility to the village. Fiona leaned forward onto the table and interlocked his fingers as he started to think about what needed to be done now. The elders and Ao have agreed that the next Mizukage can't be a pregnant one. Not at this time. It has to be you. She said. You are the only one who can do it, Fiona. She said, placing her hand on top of his. Fiona knew she was right. He knew he had no choice now and could no longer bat off the responsibility to someone else. This was the price of power. You can come back and now, May shouted, allowing the elders and A.O., who were waiting outside, to enter. They all took their seats, and May slowly stood up to address them. The decision has been made. After receiving such news, I am stepping down as the next Mizukage as everyone agreed. Fiona Yuki will be taking my place she said, looking over at him. Fiona stood up to address everyone, accidentally letting his aura flare for a moment, getting everyone's attention as the sudden pressure was too strong not to notice. The role falls to me. I will lead our village to greatness and protect its people. Fiona said, letting his chakra settle. It's settled then. All hail Fiona Yuki, the Gode Mizukage. The head elder said, the others all bowed their heads in respect, and after a moment, Ao spoke. Make the preparations for the ceremony at once. The people need to see their new leader right away. 
he said. The others agreed. We will make the preparations at once. The ceremony will commence tomorrow. The elder said. Good. That gives us two days before the meeting with the new Kazakage. Ao then said. Very well. We shall take our leave. The elders said as they all bowed and left the office. Leading Ao, May, and Fiona. It's all settled then. I'll leave you two alone. Ao said, knowing they still had a lot to talk about. Fiona nodded, and both he and May bid him farewell. So about the baby, Fiona said after a moment of silence between them. It's okay, Fiona, May said, interrupting him. I don't expect you to just suddenly stick around because I am pregnant. Besides, you are now the most desirable man in the village. It's only natural I should have some competition. She said with a smile. Fiona was shocked at how adult her response was. It was certainly not something he was used to talking about and not the reaction he had expected. I'm sorry, May. I don't know what to say. He said at a loss for words. Then don't say anything for now. Instead, focus on your duties as the next Mizukage. May said, standing up and placing a hand on his shoulder. Our baby and I will be here when you are ready she said with a faint smile. Fiona could see past it, though. He could see the hurt inside her even though such a perfect smile. However, she was right. He had other things he had to do first and more significant things to worry about. I plan on being in this child's life. I hope you know that. Fiona said softly. This time May closed her eyes, and a genuine smile slowly filled her face. I know she said. Sometime later, Fiona made his way home after finding out about May and his unborn child, along with the news he was to become the next Mizukage. He had been gone for about two hours now, and he couldn't help wonder if Swearin would still be at his house. Once he got home, he slowly opened the door and walked into the kitchen. As he had expected, it was empty, and he couldn't feel a presence inside. Looks like she's gone, he thought to himself before looking at a note that had been left on the table. Fiona picked the paper up and read what was written on it. I have had to run out on an errand. Please don't think I have left. I want to see you again. If you want that, then please meet me later tonight at the small park down past the old tea shop. Swearin. Fiona read the note in his head and placed the paper back down onto the table. He had a lot to think about now his new position as Mizukage, his love life that was now starting to become tangled between two women, one of whom was now pregnant with his child. He wasn't sure what to do. On one hand, he had May, who he liked. She was fun, down-to-earth and gorgeous. She was also carrying his unborn child, and in a way, he felt terrible about not being there for her. On the other hand, there was Swearin. She was just as beautiful and entirely different from May personality-wise, and he had purposely gone out of his way to save her life twice now. Proving his feelings for her were real. He liked them both, but for the time being, instead of stringing them along, he would be honest with them and focus on the village and his goals. If they couldn't accept that, then that would be something he would have to make peace with. With the remaining time, Fiona now found himself with, he decided to give the house a quick clean over and prepare some food that would last for the week for him and the boys. With the help of a few Shadows clones, he quickly had the house cleaned and the food was preparing. It was around four o'clock in the afternoon now, meaning Kimimaro and Haku would soon be home from the academy. Fiona thought it important that he sit them both down and explain what was going to happen. Now he was going to become the next Mizukage he might struggle to spend as much time with them. He was adamant he wouldn't let that happen, though. Sitting down for a moment allowed him to collect his thoughts and plan for what was to come. First on the list was to break the news to Haku and Kimimaro. Next was to break the news to Swearin that he was worried about and wasn't sure how it could go. After that was the official ceremony, his crowning as Mizukage, his new decrees and laws he could suddenly enforce, all that kind of stuff. Then came the next threat the looming war between the sand and mist. 
he would have to meet with the new Kazakage to discuss the terms of a peace agreement. However, his faith in peace was not held in high expectations. Suddenly the door burst open, followed by the sound of Haku and Kimimaro's voices. We did it! We did it! They shouted as they bounded over with excitement. Fiona instantly noticed their new hidden mist headbands, showing they had graduated from the academy as Jin and level shinobi. Sensei, Fiona. We did it! We passed. Haku shouted in excitement. Kimimaro was less bouncy about it, but he was still just as excited. Fiona smiled at both of them and stood to his feet. I never had any doubt you wouldn't. He shouted in excitement himself. Looks like you are ready for the real test. He also shouted, getting both of the boys' attention. Real test? Haku asked. Kimimaro also seemed surprised. Do we have to fight you, Sensei? He asked. Fiona smiled as he crossed his arms. Kind of. He said. But the first test is much more simple than that. He said as he crossed his arms. First, you have to find me. He said, raising his arms into the hidden mist jutsu sign. The mist suddenly burst into the air all around them, covering their field of view. Come and find me if you can. Fiona shouted as his voice echoed through the mist before he vanished out of the house, leaving both the boys confused. He's gone! Haku shouted as he tried to get his bearings in the mist. Come on, Haku, focus! Kimimaro said as he grabbed his shoulder. I know, I know, Haku said as he let a burst of wind-style chakra release from his body, causing the mist to disperse from the kitchen. Both of the boys could see that Fiona had vanished and knew that the test was now to track him down. Haku and Kimimaro quickly assessed the kitchen, and both found that the window had been left open ever so slightly. This way, Haku said as he opened the window, jumping out of it onto the grass. Kimimaro followed him, and both of them knelt, seeing that footprints had been left in the mud. These are Fiona Sensei's footprints. He went this way. Haku said, Let's go! Haku said as he suddenly started running in the same direction that the footprints were headed. Kimimaro followed suit, and both of them entered the forest behind their house. Once there, they looked for more footprints seeing that the tracks had vanished, leading Kimimaro and Haku to assume that Fiona had taken to the tree branches to travel faster. Haku jumped onto the first tree beach inside and confirmed this by seeing more prints. Kimimaro did the same and suddenly got a bad feeling as he pushed Haku out of the way. Look out! He shouted as a large log came swinging at them on a rope. Kimimaro let his bones grow as a defensive shield before the log hit him. Thanks to his defense, though, he suffered no damage and landed next to Haku, who had flipped onto his feet. Wow, that was a close one, thanks, Kimimaro. You okay? He asked. Kimimaro let his bones return into his body and nodded. Fine. But we should be more careful from here on. He said. Haku agreed. Looks like Fiona Sensei isn't playing with us. He said as he closed his eyes and started to focus. Over their time in the academy and with Fiona so far, they had learned a lot. They were training every day and night to improve their abilities and discover new ones. Haku had shown great skill in tracking and sensory ability. Along with his speed and accuracy, he would become a dangerous foe. Kimimaro had shown to adapt to almost any situation. His calm attitude and natural talent in taijutsu was impressive, and he, too, showed remarkable potential. This way, Haku said. Kimimaro follower him, and this time, both of them remained on high alert for any more traps. Meanwhile, Fiona was sitting down enjoying the afternoon sun that had broken through the clouds. He had arrived at one of the larger training grounds on the outskirts of the village, one where he had done a lot of his own training when he was younger. In his hand, he held two bells, and he tossed them into the air, catching them every time as they fell back down. I wonder how much longer they will be. He thought to himself as he placed his hand over his knee, leaning back against a wooden post as he looked up into the sky. The weather is so nice today. Such a shame you won't live to enjoy it. 
Fiona suddenly said out loud, remaining as calm as before a storm. Suddenly a wind sword sliced right through the wooden post and through Fiona's body, even cutting into the ground. Fiona's body crumbled into ice, and the assailant responsible was shocked that his surprise attack had failed. You knew I was here all along? You certainly live up to your reputation, Katya Slayer. The assassin said. Fiona suddenly appeared as the breeze picked up, looking as if he was one with the wind itself. Fiona took a close look at the person who had just tried to kill him. Seeing that it was an umbu from the hidden sand, donning the traditional uniform of the Sunagakirnin, which included a turban, the village's forehead protector, flak jacket, as well as a cloth that hid the lower half of his face, leaving only his eyes visible. Another assassin? Fiona asked, almost sounding bored. Are you not aware of the meeting between your Katya and ours in two days? Fiona asked, crossing his arms. I'm not here for her. The assassin responded as they pulled out a handful of kunai, throwing them in form of themselves as if they were attached to wires. Fiona couldn't quite tell if the assassin was male or female yet, as their voice was soft and their body seemed like it could be either. Not that it mattered anyway. So you are acting alone? Fiona asked. I am here to avenge a friend. The person said before they ran into attack. Fiona sighed and readied himself for what was to come as the assassin charged in with the intent to kill. The assassin slashed with each hand. Wind swords had been formed on each of them, intending to cut Fiona to pieces. The kunai that also hung in the air around the assassin moved on their own and attacked at Fiona from all angles. Fiona dodged each slash, thrust, chop and every other attack that came his way. Ducking, weaving, and slipping each of them with ease before he decided enough was enough. With a wave of his hand, he broke right through the assailant's guard and grabbed them by the throat before slamming them to the ground. He moved way too fast for the assassin to react, and they hit the ground with such devastating force that their body left an imprint in the ground. Hmm. Not doing so good down there, are you? Fiona said as he let go of the person's face and slowly stood up. Fiona Sensei. Haku and Kimamaro suddenly shouted as they arrived from the tree line to see what had happened. Fiona turned around to face them and smiled. Ah, boys, just in time. He said. The assassin was hurting badly but was still able to get back up and push backwards to create some well-needed distance. Fiona turned to face his opponent and placed his hands in his pockets. Maybe you will fare better again these gin in here. Fiona then said. Kimimaro had already pieced together what was happening, and Haku was starting to make sense of it too. Now, boys, it looks as if your test has changed. This assassin will be your opponent. If you can defeat him, then you pass. Fiona said in a severe tone. Kimimaro and Haku didn't say anything and simply took a ready stance each, knowing that this was no joke. You want me to fight with these children? The person asked, standing to their full height, having recovered from Fiona's attack. The hidden sand shinobi quickly assessed the new situation and deemed the mission a failure. There is no chance I can get to him now. The assassin thought. I need to make my escape. They thought as they pulled out a smoke bomb, throwing it onto the ground. Quickly they adjusted their chakra to dash away as fast as possible, but the sudden of ice that gripped their wrists stopped them in their tracks. The assassin turned around in horror to see Fiona holding their wrist in his hand. H. How did you? The assassin said, shocked. If you try to run again, I will kill you myself, Fiona said as he let go of their wrist. Your only chance is to kill both of my students. Do that, and you are free to go. Fiona said. The assassin couldn't believe what Fiona was saying but realized there was no other choice. All right. Let the battle be. Fiona said as he suddenly vanished out of sight, leaving Haku and Kimimaro to face off against the hidden sand umbu. Kimimaro has already experienced the intensity of battle and the need to kill an opponent who is trying to kill you. Haku, however, has not. This is a perfect chance for both of them to test their full strength in a real life or death battle. Hopefully, they can survive. Fiona thought as he took up a better vantage point so he could watch the battle. 
Haku took out a handful of Sunban needles from his weapon pouch. Luckily, because they had been tested for graduation today, he had been allowed to carry real weapons and tools with him. Kimimaro, on the other hand, was a living weapon and had no need for kunai or shuriken. So be it. The assassin said as they let their kunai hang around their body once more before creating a wind blade in their right hand. I won't hold back. They said as they prepared to advance. Kimimaro was simply stood with a blank expression on his face as he waited to see what would happen. Haku, on the other hand, had already taken a defensive position and was ready to move at a moment's notice. Time to see how they fare. Fiona thought as he crossed his arms, getting ready for the show. I hope they survive. He said quietly, watching as the battle began. Chapter 46 the air was tense as Haku and Kimimaro waited for their opponent to make the first move. It was time to put all of their training to use. Time for them to face a real opponent in a life and death situation, allowing them to fight with all of their power. Something they had been looking forward to. Are you ready, Haku? Kimimaro asked as he let his bones grow around him. Yeah, Haku responded as he readied his senban needles in each hand. The assassin also waited as he watched both of the boys. He knew, although young, both of them posed a threat and that he shouldn't underestimate them. His suspicions were confirmed when he watched Kimimaro's body sprout bones from all over. So the kid has the same abilities as the Kavya Slayer. The assassin thought as they readied the kunai that were floating around them. Time to die, kids! The Sanumbu shouted as they charged. Kimimaro also charged head on to meet them, engaging in a fierce taijutsu battle. Kimimaro was agile and strong for his age, more than holding his own against his more experienced opponent. What the hell is this kid? The assassin thought as Kimimaro pushed them back. Kimimaro flipped AMD twirled, using his whole body as a weapon, allowing his bones to attack and defend simultaneously. His bones were deflecting the kunai that kept trying to attacking him as well as providing him with enough offense so that the sand umbu struggled to use his wind blade. Why you? The sand umbu shouted as he landed a hard front kick to Kimimaro's chest before he slashed down with his wind blade. Kimimaro had used his ribs to absorb the kick but didn't have time to avoid the wind blade, panic showing in his expression. Suddenly three Sinban hit the assassin in his arm, each one perfectly placed, striking the pressure points and disabling the assassin's arm and hand. How did he? The Umbu thought as they quickly jumped back, avoiding another two Sinban needles, as well as a counter-attack from Kimimaro. Haku had such a precise aim that even from a distance, he could hit the smallest target with high accuracy. Something even high-level Umbu struggled to achieve. To the sand Umbu's surprise, Haku suddenly appeared behind him with tremendous speed taking the assassin by surprise. I don't think so. The assassin shouted as they quickly flipped, attacking with their other arm as a wind blade slashed down towards Haku's head. Haku had already expected this and created his own wind enhanced Sunban to counter the strike. The Umbu was impressed by the boy's strength as he held his wind blade firm in place. Such precise chakra control. The Umbu thought. Haku smiled as he started to form hand signs with one hand, much to the surprise of the San Umbu. Hand signs with one hand? He said out loud, unable to contain his surprise. Quickly they jumped back, trying to avoid Haku's attack. However, the Umbu was met by Kimimaro, who fired a round of bone bullets, pushing on his advance towards them. The Umbu was able to use their kunai that still floated around their body to defend the attack but with only one arm in working order, was unable to match Kimimaro, who landed a clean punch to the stomach followed by a jumping spinning heel kick to the face that knocked the assassin spinning around onto the ground. Haku had finished his hand signs, and ice blades suddenly rained down from above, impaling the sand umbu from head to toe, ending the fight once and for all. Kimimaro and Haku smile at their handiwork and high-fived each other, proud of their strength. We did it! Haku said, switching from his emotionless fighting personality back to his happy one. Kimimaro didn't struggle as much as Haku did when it came to hurting others and instead took a more neutral approach to it. Were they really an Umbu-level ninja? He said, 
thinking the whole thing was too easy. Meanwhile, Fiona watched from a distance. Both his boys demonstrated their abilities in a marvelous fan's ion, proving they were already leagues ahead of anyone else their age in the village. But it would seem what they had in strength and potential. They lacked in experience. Suddenly the sand umbu's body burst into a poof of smoke, revealing it had been a substitution. Look out! Kimimaro shouted to Haku as the assassin appeared behind him with both arms crossed over his body. You may have got lucky with shutting down the nerves in my arm. But don't underestimate a shinobi of Sunagakure. Two wind blades suddenly sliced right through where Haku had been standing, but to the assassin's surprise, he hit nothing. W what? Kimimaro was also shocked to see that Haku had suddenly vanished just before he had been sliced in two. Suddenly Fiona appeared with Haku by his side, his hand resting on his shoulder. Haku's face was filled with surprise as he didn't even KNKW what had happened. Sorry about that. But I can't just let you cut one of my students in half now, can I? Fiona said with a slight chuckle. The Sunagakure Umbu was so shocked by Fiona's speed that they didn't know what to do next. Losing all hope of victory at the sight of Fiona's overwhelming power. It's not over. The assassin said under his breath. Now, boys, can you tell me what you did wrong? Fiona asked, ignoring the umbu. Haku and Kimimaro both nodded as they lowered their heads. Yes, sensei. We let our guard down. Kimimaro said. And Haku? Fiona asked. I undervaluated the opponent not taking into account their possible abilities or experience. Such is the fact they can most likely use medical ninjutsu as to counter my Senban nerve strikes. Haku said, clearly having seen everything he had missed now. Fiona had to say he was impressed, not expecting such a high level of evaluation. Very good, boys. I think you can rest easy for now. Fiona said as he rubbed both of their heads. You dare ignore me. You will pay for your arrogance with your life. The Sunagakure Umbu shouted as they ripped their flak jacket open to reveal a massive paper bomb vest. Ah yes, the suicide attempt, Fiona said as he watched from the small distance between them. Um, Sensei. Shouldn't we stop him? Kimimaro asked. Yes, let's cut this short. He said as he pointed his finger like a gun and pretended to fire. Suddenly, ice started to form around the paper bombs putting out the fuse that was needed to ignite them. What? How? When did you? The Umbu shouted in shock, unable to believe that Fiona could stop his final attempt to take him out with such ease. Sorry, but from the first moment I touched you, I left my seal on you, allowing me to finish you off whenever I want, Fiona said. No way. The Umbu said as they ripped their mask off, revealing their face. Fiona was sure he had seen this man somewhere before but just could not place him. He had sandy blonde hair, fair skin, and violet eyes, which made him look somewhat feminine. I came here to avenge the fourth Kazakage. But I can see now that you are too powerful. The man said as he activated his medical ninjutsu in each hand. Fiona wasn't sure what he was trying to do and simply watched. You know it's not too late for you to leave here alive? Fiona said. The umbu looked very surprised at his words. I'm sure you have someone who you care about back home. How would they feel if you didn't make it back? Fiona then said as he noticed he hit the mark. I made a promise that I would avenge Lord Kazakage. He said, letting his words sink in. Trying not to forget his resolve even against the overwhelming odds. And then what? Fiona shouted. Say you kill me and avenge your late Kazakage. Then what happens? Someone from my village wants revenge for me. Then so on and on until the cycle of death and hate grows so large that we forgot what we were even fighting about. Fiona shouted. The umbu was surprised at his words but not convinced. You talk about hate and revenge. But you are yet to feel that. You aren't the one who suffered from loss. You cannot understand my pain. My whole village's pain at our loss. The umbu shouted in return. 
Fiona remained quiet for a moment as he thought about what had been said. So what do you purpose? How do you suggest we find peace between the mist and the sand? Fiona then asked. For us to have peace between our villages, you must suffer as much as we have. You must feel all of our pain and sorrow before we can ever come to peace. The man said, letting his rage get the better of him. Fiona sighed. It's always the same in this shinobi world. I guess it's too soon for peace to happen. Fiona said as he ran his hand through his hair. I was going to let you live. But I'm sure you will only continue to cause more problems if I do. He then said, getting a shocked reaction from the sand umbu. Our villages will never have peace. Mark my words. The umbu shouted as he ripped his sleeves off to reveal more explosive tags. This will at least put a dent in the land of water, letting you never forget that the sands of Sunagakure will never stop until they crush you. Haku and Kimimaro flinched a little as even the ground beneath them started to turn into paper bombs. There were so many that the explosion would scar the land and indeed cause conflict before negotiations had even begun. Looks like you planned this well, Fiona said, actually impressed he hadn't known about this. Let's see. Fiona then said as he thought about the best way to contain the explosion. It's over. I happily give my life for this. The sand umbu said with a smile on his face. That was when Fiona recognized him, the cogs finally turning in his head. He was Yashimaru, Gara's uncle and right-hand man of the fourth Kazakage. That explains why he hates me so much, Fiona said as he started to form hand signs as he closed his eyes for a moment. I understand your hate and your pain at what I have done. But I cannot let it stop me from protecting the people I care about. Fiona shouted as a red chakra cloak burst to life around his entire body, all six tails swishing in the wind. Ice style. Frozen graveyard. Fiona shouted as he slammed his foot hard into the ground. The ice suddenly burst free and covered the entire ground, spreading rapidly, covering all of the paper bombs one by one until the ice reached Yashimaru himself. What is this power? Such. He shouted before the ice froze him in place and the rest of the paper bombs rendering them useless. Haku was amazed at the amount of ice he could create in such a short amount of time. Kimimaro was also impressed and remained quiet as he always did. Fiona then made a few more hand signs, and the ice suddenly broke away, crumbling into the air. Everything that had been frozen broke away into small pieces as if it were never there. That takes care of that, Fiona said as he relaxed a little. Wow, Fiona Sensei, that was amazing. Haku shouted. Kimimaro also nodded, highly impressed by his power. Thank you, boys. If you keep training hard, one day, you will be able to do things like that too. He said as he patted both of their heads. Now, how about we get home and eat? Besides, I have some important news to tell you both. Both of them nodded, and the three of them returned to their home to eat and rest from the day's events. Fiona decided it was time to break the news to them about him becoming the next Mizukage. After all, they were both ninjas now. What? No ways, Sensei. Haku shouted, spitting out his food. Fiona laughed. Yes. He said as he had another mouthful of his rice. So Fiona Sensei is going to be the next Mizukage, Kimimaro said, a large smile forming on his face. I wanted to let you both know because it means I may not be around as much as I am now. Fiona then said, That is why I have come to the conclusion that you will both be assigned to a new instructor where you will form a four-man team, Fiona said. Both Haku and Kimamaro nodded. Although a little sad, they were still excited that their sensei was becoming the next Mizukage. The most powerful shinobi in the village. Not that they ever doubted he wasn't. We will leave the details for later. For now, let's celebrate you both becoming Jenin. Fiona shouted as he raised his glass. Haku and Kimimaro also nodded, and the three of them ate and laughed together as they celebrated. After food and fun, the time had soon come for Fiona to go and meet with Swearin. He told both the boys to finish their chores around the house and that he was going out. Fiona left and headed to where he was meeting her. 
It was an old tea shop not far from his place. The shop was nothing special, but it did serve good sweets. Fiona had to admit he was feeling a little nervous about this whole thing. So much had already happened today, finding out he was becoming the next Mizukic and that May was also pregnant with his child. He then had to deal with an assassin from the hidden sand. He was pretty tired out from it all, and now he might have to face more drama depending on how this whole thing went. Before he knew it, he had arrived and noticed that Swearin wasn't there yet. I must be early, Fiona said as he took a good look around. It was dark out now, and the only light was from the street lanterns that faintly glowed in the darkness, illuminating the mist that never faded away. You came. A soft voice said from behind, causing Fiona to turn around. Swearing was stood with her hands crossed behind her back as she stood nervously looking him in the eyes. Her long blonde hair blowing in the gently breeze of the night. Hello, Swearin, Fiona said as his blue eyes locked with her sweet hazelnut ones. I wasn't sure if you would come. She said softly. Fiona smiled. Swearin. There is something I need to tell you. Chapter 47 Fiona looked into Swearin's brown eyes as he tried to build the courage to speak with his heart. Swearin, there is something I need to tell you. She looked nervous but stared into his pricing blue eyes, waiting for him to say what was on his mind. It's big news. Fiona said, not sure which part to tell her first. It's okay, Fiona. Please don't be nervous, whatever it is. I have been chosen as the next Mizukage. He said, interrupting her. Suarin's face changed in a way Fiona thought it wouldn't have. Instead, she smiled and jumped forwards, embracing him in a hug. That's amazing, Fiona. That's really amazing. I can't think of anyone better to become our next Mizukage. She said with contentment. Fiona hugged her back and could feel the warmth coming from her body. But he was sure she wouldn't react the same to what he had to say next. Swearin pulled away and looked into Fiona's eyes with hope. With you leading the village everything will change, you will make things right again. Swearin said with such belief in her eyes. Thank you. I only hope I can live up to your expectations. Fiona said with a faint smile. Swearin noticed and picked up on his emotions. What's wrong, Fiona? Is there something else you need to tell me? She asked, getting nervous again. Fiona could have slapped himself for not hiding it better. Yes. He said, trying to work up the courage to tell her. Swearin waited in silence, looking at him with her big brown eyes that reflected the light from the moon. I found out today that someone is carrying my child. He said, almost too scared to look at her. Swearin didn't react or say anything for a moment as his words sank in. I feel like you deserve better than me, Swearin. I don't want to hurt you or string you along. Now that I am the Mizukage. I have to. Swearin suddenly dived into his arms as she wrapped hers around his back. I don't care. She shouted suddenly taking Fiona off guard. That doesn't matter. I, Fiona, I, I love you. She said as she pushed off his chest to look at him as she said the words. Fiona was so shocked he couldn't say anything and just looked at Swearin not sure what to do. I don't care if you have a child with someone else. I don't care if you have to put the needs of the whole village above me. I don't care because I love you, Fiona. I have loved you for so long now that it hurt. Swearin said as she let go of him and curled up. Fiona let her speak without saying anything, his heart felt as if it could cry as he listened to her. But he had to, he had to let her get it out and finish what she had to say. Swearin looked into his eyes one last time as she finished saying what she had to say. I love you no matter what, Fiona. I understand if you don't want me or need me. But I... Fiona couldn't watch her hurt anymore as he wrapped his arms around her, pulling her into a kiss. Suerin's eyes opened wide from the shock before she quickly gave in and kissed him back. The kiss only lasted a few seconds yet both of them were lost for breath as they slowly pulled away. I can't promise you anything. Fiona said as he rested his forehead against her still trying to catch his breath. I know. Suerin replied as she did the same. 
but having you in my life is better than living without you. Fiona leaned in for another kiss, this time kissing her with more intensity. Swearin returned the passion she felt and held him tight, never wanting to let him go. Fiona slowly allowed an ice mirror to form and he slowly pulled them into it while they kissed under the moonlight, letting both of them slip through into his bedroom, where the two of them made love late into the morning. Fiona woke early that morning, Swearin was cuddled up next to him as she slept peacefully with her head resting on his arm. Today was the day of his coronation as the next Mizukage. Fiona couldn't help reflect on his spent here in the Naruto-verse. Everything he had done, everything he had worked so hard for to achieve was finally coming together. He was to become the next Mizukage. The next leader of his village. A village that had been soaked with blood and betrayal. He could finally change that. He could finally make a difference for the people of this nation that he had come to know as home. He had the chance many times to run away. Run away and become a rogue ninja. He had thought about it often. What if I had been born into the hidden leaf? What if I had run away and tried to join another village or nation? But he knew it didn't work like that. He knew how cold and ruthless this world was. Sure he could have survived and found work as a missing ninja or mercenary. But then what? What good could he have done? What would his life here be filled with? So far he had endured pain and suffering beyond anything he had ever known. But he had some many reasons to be thankful too. No was his chance to make a real difference in this world. Now was his time to become something more than himself. Fiona slowly got out of bed and did his best to not disturb Swearin. Slipping his clothes on and walking downstairs to get something to drink. It was still early, around six in the morning and the sun had yet to rise over the mountains that guarded the village hidden in the mist. Fiona poured himself a glass of water and sat at his kitchen table as he lit a cigarette, something he had not done in many years. Can't sleep? He then said as he noticed Kimamaro who was standing in the kitchen doorway that Fiona's back was too. As sensei I didn't know you were here, Kimamaro said impressed he knew he was there. Fiona turned around to look at the boy as he had another puff on his cigarette. What's the matter? Fiona asked as he noticed something strange with him. Kimimaro slowly walked into the kitchen and sat down next to Fiona. He seemed a little sad and he never showed his emotions. You can tell me anything, Kimimaro. We are family now. Do you understand that? Fiona said. Kimimaro nodded and put his small hands on the table. What will happen to us now you are becoming Mizukage? He asked, looking Fiona in the eyes. Fiona blew the smoke out of his mouth and smiled at such an innocent question. So that's what you're worried about, eh? Worried you won't get to see me as much. Kimimaro nodded his head. Well, don't you worry about that, kiddo. I've got the perfect person to be your new sensei while I'm busy. In fact, that reminds me, you will be meeting your new teammate today. Fiona said as he put the cigarette out with a bit of ice style in the palm of his hand. Kimimaro's eyebrow caught a little in question of who it could be. I promised a friend I would look after her, Fiona said as he stood to his feet. I am trusting you and Haku to do the same. He said patting him on the head. Can you do that for me? Fiona asked bending over so he was the same height as Kimimaro, giving him a big grin. Yes, sensei. The boy said as a large grin formed on his face. That's my boy. Now go and wake Haku up and I'll make us some breakfast. Kimimaro did just that as he and Haku ended up downstairs with Fiona, helping him cook a feast of food. Swearin also came down after the noise woke her. Swearin! Haku shouted as he ran over to say good morning. She smiled in surprise as he hugged her, returning his hug with her own. Well, good morning to you too, Haku. She said as she looked over to Fiona, who was smiling at her. Care for some breakfast? He asked while holding the frying pan. Please. She said with a nod. The four of them sat and ate breakfast together, all of them laughing and giggling as they talked about everything and anything. But now the time had come for Fiona to prepare for the ceremony. Swearin realized bee time and blurted it out before anyone else. Oh my gosh! Fiona looked at the time. She said, pointing to the cock. 
Fiona turned around to look still with a piece of toast in his mouth. Oh, my will you look at that? He said, taking another bite. Well, time to get ready, everyone. He said as he clapped his hands for them to hurry. Haku and Kimimaro nodded and rushed off not taking long at all. Swearing was a little more unprepared instead helped clear the table. I need to get home so I can get changed. She said with a small smile. You're not coming with us? Fiona asked as he put the rest of the pots and pans in the sink. I think it's best if the whole village doesn't see their new mazukage with me on the first day. She said a little shy. Fiona understood and pulled her in for a hug. How about later then? He asked softly. Swearin nodded as she returned his embrace, kissing his bare chest. Here, this will help get you home a little quicker. He then said as he summoned an ice mirror for her to walk through. You have one at my place? She asked surprised. Of course. He said giving her a slight wink. Swearin punched his arm playfully before putting her hands on her hips. Anyway go and get ready. You can't be late to your own coronation she said. Fiona nodded. See you there? See you there. She replied as she slowly stepped into the ice mirror. Fiona waited for her to fully disappear before releasing the jutsu and going to get dressed. He pulled on his black trousers with his black shinobi boots. Next, he pulled on his black long-sleeved undershirt and his purple flak jacket before finally pulling out his new blue cloak with the words Fifth Water Shadow written on them. In Japanese. Today is the day. He said as he took a good look at himself in the mirror. All right, it's time. He then said as he walked out of his bedroom to see Haku and Kimimaro both dressed in their formal blue robes. Well, don't you both look smart? He said feeling like a proud father. Are you both ready? He asked. They both nodded and Fiona placed a hand each on their heads. All right then. Let's go, he said as he created an ice mirror that took them to the Mizukage's office. His office. All of the village elders were waiting for him around the table, along with Ao and Mei. Everyone noticed as he walked through his ice mirror with Haku and Kimimaro behind him. Sorry, I'm late everyone, he said as he walked over and greeted them. So nodded to him. He was stood with his arms crossed over his chest wearing his blue robes looking like he did in the anime, just younger. Better late than never, May said as she stood to greet him. She was looking beautiful dressed in a pink kimono, something he had never seen her wear. Enough with the pleasantries. The whole village is waiting to see you. The head elder said. Fiona gave an apologetic laugh as he nodded. Yes, I suppose you're right. He said as he became serious. On with it then, Ao said as he waves his arms telling everyone to get ready. Everyone walked out of the room and Fiona followed with Kimimaro and Haku. Haku tugged on Fiona's cloak looking a little nervous and Fiona smiled as he held his hand. Don't worry Haku, I'm not going anywhere, Fiona said comforting him. Kimimaro didn't pay them attention as he acted more mature than Haku, but deep down he was feeling it too. I want both of you to stay with Ao until this is over, okay? Fiona said. Both of them nodded in response and the three of them walked out onto the roof of the Mizukage's building. Fiona could already see that the entire village was waiting to see who would be named as the new Mizukage, after all, it was supposed to be top secret until he was revealed. The head elder handed the Mizukage hat to Fiona and had him a nod. You are worthy of this young Fiona. Do our village and nation proud. He said giving him the go-ahead. Fiona gave Haku and Kimimaro over to Ao who took them to the sides so they were out of the way as the whole thing began. The head elder walked over to the front stand on the building to announce to the whole village. I greet you all in this sad time at the loss of our leader and former Mizukage. The elder said getting everyone's attention. However, after careful consideration, I am pleased to present to you our new leader and the Godain Mizukage. The entire village held their breath as Fiona walked out onto the stand with his face covered by his Mizukage hat. He could see the entire village from here. All of her people had gathered just to see him. Just to get a glimpse of their new leader. 
and he wasn't about to disappoint them. Fiona made a single hand sign and the mist in the village cleared, allowing the sun to shine brightly upon all of them. He then reached up and took his hat off, revealing his face to everyone as the next Mizukage. No one dared say a word as they could see who it was. Fiona Yuki, the hero of the village who had killed the Kazakage and both the Mizukage while still under the age of twenty. He was considered the strongest shinobi in the entire village and a genius whose skills were unmatched. I swear on my name, Fiona Yuki, that I will protect my village. No, our village and all of her people. From this day onwards, I swear I will do everything in my power so that you never have to suffer again. Where the mist falls, one shall find its people. Ever changing like water, they will give rise to more mist that will forever preserve the village. Fiona finished, quoting the words of the first Mizukage once more as he watched the crowd's reaction. The entire village started roaring with happiness as they waved their arms in the arm towards Fiona. I promise I will do my best. He said quietly as the applause continued, echoing through the entire land of water as they cheered for the man that had saved them and promised to bring prosperity to the nation. Chapter 48 Akatsuki theme playing in the background. Fiona stood before his people on top of the Mizukage building as he waved to the whole village. He had just quoted the words of the first Mizukage and had promised to bring prosperity to the nation. A bold promise, to say the least. That was when he heard the words. You shall know pain. Fiona looked up in disbelief as he could see pain of the Akatsuki floating above the village. No. Fiona muttered under his breath not believing it as he tried to get ready to act. Almighty push. Pain said unleashing his jutsu. New. No. Fiona screamed as he watched Pain's jutsu uproot his entire village. All of the buildings suddenly crumbled and the people were crushed and hurled like rag dolls with them. Fiona couldn't do anything as he was forced to cross his arms over his face to shield them from the debris until the jutsu reached him too, taking him off his feet and blasting him away. Fiona suddenly shot up covered in sweat. He took a good look around and realized he was in his bed, and the village was safe. Is everything all right? Swearin asked as she sat up, waking from his sudden reaction. It's nothing. I just had a nightmare. Fiona said as he took a breath of fresh air. Do you want to talk about it? She asked, placing her hand on his shoulder. No, it's okay. He said, smiling at her to let her know he was all right. Just a bad dream, go back to sleep, Swearin. He said, stroking her face with the back of his hand. Swearin smiled and slowly placed her head back on her pillow. I'll be back in a minute, I need some water. He whispered to her as he got up. Fiona made his way down to the kitchen and got himself a glass of water, drinking all of it in one go. Fiona rinsed the glass and placed it next to the sink before he splashed a little water on his face, trying to shake the image from his dreams. Is everything all right, Fiona? Saiken asked, sensing his distress. I'm all right, Saiken, just a bad dream. He said to the six tails, reassuring the tailed beast. Still, he couldn't help wonder what he would do if Payne ever decided to attack the village like that. Would I be able to protect everyone and counter his jutsu? Fiona asked himself as he made a first, looking at it as he did. Fiona didn't waste much more time and made his way back to bed, he had a busy day in the morning as the new Mizukage. He got up, made breakfast with Swearin and the boys before they headed out to the academy where they would be assigned with a new sensei and meet their new teammate. Fiona also said goodbye to Swearin for the time being and headed off. First was his meeting with the clan leaders in the village, Fiona had summoned them so he could talk to them about their current strength. He wished to make peace with all remaining Kekiai Jinkai users in the land of water as their numbers were running low. In doing so he believed he could boost the village's military strength. He only hoped it wasn't too late. Next, he was to place new decrees and laws, of course, the signing and process would take some time and require him to be in his office. The Mizukage role seemed much different than that of the Hokages from what he could see. In which sense the Mizukage had others to do the smaller tasks, while from what he had seen, the Hokage was always stuck doing paperwork. Seems that Yagura didn't like to waste his time. 
Fiona thought as he took his seat at his new desk. He had to admit it certainly felt strange to be sitting here in this office. Fiona had met two former Mazukij in this room since he had been in this world. The thought that he would one day sit here himself had never crossed his mind back then. Suddenly a knock at the door snapped him out of his thoughts. Come in, Fiona said. The doors opened and Ao walked into the room along with four Ambu Ninja. Good morning, Lord Mizukage, Ao said, greeting him. Good morning, Ao. What do we have here? Fiona asked, getting right to the point. I have taken the trouble of assigning these four to be your personal bodyguard. I handpicked them myself, he said. Fiona eyed the four of them carefully, getting a good read of them. He also saw Kogetsu who was Manjetsu's cousin and next in line as the head of the Ozuki clan was one of them. Very well. I trust your judgment, Ao. By the way, are the clan heads here yet? He then asked, leaning back on his chair. They are outside, my lord. Shall I summon them? Ao said. Yes, please do, Ao, Fiona said. Ao gave the nod and the four Umbu bowed before disappearing out of sight. They hadn't gone far and could react at a moment's notice if needed. Ao escorted the clan leaders into Fiona's office and they bowed before Fiona, showing their respect. Welcome he said as he stood from his chair. Two men stood before Fiona and Ao. A large man with a solid frame, white hair and a large scar down the center of his face. He was the Hozuki clan leader and Kogetsu's father. The other was the Hashigaki clan head. He was an old man now and had clearly served his time as a shinobi, his shark-like features present as all the members of his clan. They were currently the only clans left in the village, now that Yagura was dead the Karatachi clan was reduced to one person. Welcome both of you, Fiona said. Our pleasure, to what do we owe the honor Lord Mizukage? The Ozuki clan had asked. Please both of you sit down, Fiona said. Both of them sat down around the large table in the center of the office and waited to see what he had to say. I have asked you both here today to discuss our village's current Kekiai Jankai user's strength. It has come to my attention that your clans are the only two to have survived after the Civil War. My own clan was destroyed along with the Kagaya. Fiona said. Yes, some were more fortunate than others. The old shark from the Hashigaki clan said. Fiona nodded. He knew that the Hozuki clan possessed a Kekiai Jinkai to turn their body to water, rendering physical attacks virtually useless. Obviously, he knew his own Yuki and Kagaya clan's abilities. He also knew that the Karatachi clan did not process any Kekiai Jinkai. But their history for producing exceptional shinobi over the generations had been evident. However, Fiona knew very little about the Hashigaki clan's abilities other than being able to breathe underwater. As Mizukage, I would like to establish a positive relationship with both of you. After all, our clans are the strongest in the whole village. Fiona said. Are? The Hozuki head asked. That's right, Fiona said. My name is Fiona Yuki, is it not? He said. Both of them remained quiet, deciding to listen to what he had to say. I have had word put out across the land for any surviving Yuki and Kagaya clan members to return to the village. They will be under my protection. Both of the others tried not to give any reaction and remained quiet. That being said, I would like to offer the same protection to your clans. Fiona then said. The old Hashigaki clan head smiled as he placed his hands onto the table. Forgive my rudeness, young Mizukage. He said, using the word young on purpose. My clan has been here since before the village was built, and I believe we will be here long after. We can protect our own with our own strength. He said, giving a toothy grin. Fiona smiled as he crossed his arms. I understand that, old man, Fiona said, countering him. But I am the Mizukage now. And I would appreciate it if both of you would cooperate. Both of them leaned back a little after listening to what he had said. They both knew that his power exceeded their own and that if he wished he could kill all of them. What is it you want, Lord Mizukage? The Ozuki clan head asked, deciding to skip straight to the point. I want your clans to become one with the village. 
by joining our clans with the village rather than resisting against it. I believe we can create a stronger bond and strengthen our military might. Fiona said telling them his plan. Again both of them remained silent as they thought about what Fiona was proposing. A simple start would be to send your young to the village academy. I know that in the past your clans refused to send your own to the academy due to the old ritual. But now things have changed. Our village needs to realize that we are all on the same side, what better way than to start by mixing the children together? Fiona said. I don't disagree. My young ones could do with learning to mingle. The Ozuki clan head said. However, the Hashigaki head disagreed. I feel that my clan should remain separate just as we have always done. Fiona wasn't pleased to hear it and decided to drop his trump card. At the moment your clan is facing a lot of turmoil, my lord. With the deserting of Kisame and him stealing one of the seven blades, you're not in the best light. Fiona said. Therefore this is your opportunity to prove to the village that your clan is willing to fight for their sake, Fiona said as he stood to his feet. I dream that our village unites and builds itself stronger than it has ever been. He then said reaching his arms out. Please take this first step with me, this is the first step to building a better future for our nation. Both of the clan heads seemed moved by his words. Very well, we accept your offer, Lord Mizukage. The Ozuki head said, This boy. He's nothing like the others before him. The Hashigaki clan head thought as he looked deep into his eyes. Very well. The Hashigaki clan accepts. He then said after a moment. Fiona smiled. Excellent. I will have the paperwork drawn up at once. Fiona said. Both of them stood to their feet and bowed their head a little before bidding him farewell. Fiona sighed as they left and turned to Ao who had remained quiet the whole time. Well, that went better than expected. He said. Ao nodded. There is no one left who can challenge your rule Fiona. Everyone will fall in line soon enough. Ao said. Fiona laughed a little. I don't want them to fall in like Ao. I want them to agree on their own. I meant what I said back there. Ao was a little surprised. But then again this was Fiona Yuki he was talking to. Anyway, your meeting with the elders is due in ten minutes, shall I tell them you are ready? Ao asked. Yes. Let's get this over with. Fiona said taking a seat. Meanwhile, both Haku and Kimimaro had made their way to the academy. Although they had recently passed the Janin exam, they had still to be set a task or duty. These days, now that the village wasn't at war, the standard procedure was to take a team of three jinin and place them with a chunin or jonin instructor. It all depended on who was available at the time. Their academy instructor had been Junsai who was good friends and an ex-teammate of Swearin. He had told Fiona that both the boys had far outpaced the other students their age and had recommended that they take the graduation exam. Unlike the old days, the next test was much more simple. It consisted of a written exam, a test of one's taijutsu and shuriken jutsu, where they would be evaluated on their ability. After that was a display of chakra control and basic ninjutsu demonstration such as a substitute jutsu and clone jutsu. Both Haku and Kimimaro had passed with flying colors and all that was left was to place them on a team. Junsai had assumed they would be placed with Fiona, but with his promotion to Mizukage that wasn't possible at the moment. Haku and Kimimaro were the youngest in the room being eight. All the others who had passed the exams were an average age of twelve years old. They had hidden their abilities from the others as Fiona had told them to. That way the other students had little hate for them other than being jealous. All right, you lock quiet down. Junsai shouted getting the attention of the classroom. There was a total of twelve students including Haku and Kimimaro, meaning there would be four squads formed today. All right, listen up for your names. Junsai shouted as he started calling their names one by one and announced what squad they would be on. All of the others were paired up into threes and dismissed to meet their new sensei, leaving Haku, Kimimaro, and one other left. All right, you too. As per Fuei Dash. Lord Mizukage request. He said clearing his throat. 
You too are to be placed with Koyoki Karatachi. He said. Haku and Kimimaro already knew who she was because Fiona had told them. She was the daughter of the late Mizukage, Yagura Karatachi. She was currently ten years old, also one of the younger students to have passed the exam. She was tall for her age and had long hair, blonde like her father's. Her eyes were pupilless pink just like her father's too and she has pretty soft features. She stood up and walked over to Haku and Kimimaro. Hello, I'm Koyoki Karatachi, she said with confidence. Haku gave her a warm smile and nodded his head. Nice to meet you, I'm Haku Yuki, he said. Kimimaro. Nice to meet you, Kimimaro said also smiling at her. Good, now that you are all acquainted. Time to go and meet your new instructor, Junsai said as he gave them a map with a location on it. The three of them nodded and bid their old instructor goodbye, setting off through the village to find their new one. Fiona was currently dealing with the elders of the village as he was stating the changes he wanted to make. The elders listened carefully and wrote everything down as he said it. As I said, these will be the new changes to the academy. I have taken a look at how our young are being taught and trained, and frankly, it is outdated. The corrections I have put together in this document will help get our young on track much quicker. Fiona said as he handed it to them. They quickly scanned it, a little shocked at how in-depth it was. Next is the tax reduction to our nation's citizens. I am lowering the tax rate from 50% to 20% for everyone. Fiona said getting a stunned reaction from them all. But my lord, we can barely keep our nation afloat financial as it is. One of them said, Fiona nodded. I have also come up with a solution to that too. He said. Firstly I am dropping the price that we charge for missions. It's a wonder anyone hires us at all with the price of them. Put the word out across the globe, the hidden mist is open for work. With such cheap prices for our national services, we will surely attract more clients. Secondly is our fishing trade. We live on an island nation and we have a rich fishing history, do we not? He asked. Why, yes, my lord. One of the elders said. Then why do we not trade with the other nations? He asked. Lord Forth refused to allow business between our and any other nation, my lord. One of the younger advisors said as she pushed her glasses back onto her face. Fiona had suspected as much. Abito had done his best to isolate the hidden mist from the rest of the world as best he could. That ends now. Put the word out to all fishermen and shipping units that are still left. I want us to offer the very best we have and at a low price. But why, my lord, we won't make any money if we do that? First we lower the price so that no one else can compete with us, stealing the market. Once we have a good hold we will steadily make up the price over time. Besides with the number of sales we get, we will surely make up the amount in no time. The others were impressed at Fiona's knowledge in the matter and proceed to write everything down. And lastly, for those who cannot work due to injuries suffered in the service of our nation, or to those who have suffered due to Lord Forth's rule, we will offer a benefit scheme to help feed their families until they can find work. Fiona said, But my lord, how are we supposed to afford that? The head elder spoke up. You can use my wage. He said, surprising them. The money that would come into my pocket can be placed in the benefits pot. Let's call it. The Mizukage's gift to the fallen found. Fiona said with an approving nod. Everyone was amazed at his generosity. Now go and make the arrangements, Fiona said, dismissing them. I have other matters to attend to. He said. The elders nodded and bowed before leading. Ao looked at Fiona with a small smile. Your first day on the job and already changing the nation, Ao said. Fiona nodded as he poured himself a glass of water from the fresh jug on his table. On to more pressing matters. He then said. What's the word from the sand? He asked. Nothing has changed. The meeting is still a go for tomorrow. Ao said. Fiona nodded as he sat back down and took a drink. I can only hope that the Kazakage is willing to make peace, Fiona said. 
I heard they sent another assassin the other day, Ao said not looking happy about it. Are we really going to let that slide? Fiona sighed. I think we have suffered enough losses with everything that has happened Ao. The last thing we need is another war. He said. Ao agreed to some extent. He knew that if they went to war with the sand, the other villages wouldn't stand by and watch from the sidelines. So what's your plan? He asked. Fiona spun around on his chair so he could see the village through the window. I'm not sure yet. He said. Ao nodded. Well, we had better come up with a plan of action should the worst happen. Fiona sighed. I know. I can only hope that the Kazakage will see reason rather than madness. He said as he leaned his head on his fist, sitting back in his chair. Chapter 49 The day of the summit with the Kazakage had arrived. Fiona had carefully selected his escort that would accompany him to the meeting location. He wanted to believe that the Kazakage would also honor the agreement and only bring an escort of three others. Not that Fiona was worried about his capabilities, but the more people involved the less chance there would be for peace. Ao. Mengetsu. Gonryu. Fiona said as he looked out of his office window towards the village. He had chosen the three of them to accompany him to the meeting. Ao for his Byakugan and sight. Mengetsu for his strength and Gonryu for his wit. Listen carefully, Fiona said as he turned to face them. Under no circumstances are you to engage with the San Shinobi unless your lives are in danger. Is that understood? He said being deadly serious. Ao and Ganryu both nodded in acknowledgement. However, Mangetsu wasn't complacent. Why does peace matter so much? We should just kill them while we have the chance. He said shrugging his shoulders. Ao slapped him round the back of the head. Even though Mangetsu was stronger than him and Gonryu, it didn't mean he was smarter. Fool, listen to Lord Mizukage. He said, crossing his arms. Mangetsu wasn't happy, but Fiona stepped in to enforce the matter. Mangetsu, I will not have you question me on this matter. If you cannot be trusted, then you will not be coming. He said with calm authority. Mangetsu got the picture and he could feel Fiona's aura. All right. He said, lowering his head a little in defeat. Very well, let's get going. Fiona then said with a smile on his face. As the four of them walked out of the Mizukage's office, they were met by May, who had been waiting outside. May? Fiona asked a little surprised. The others all looked at them both and then left as Ao gave a nod. What's the matter, May? Is everything all right? Fiona asked. He had told her to stay in the village and oversee everything while he was gone. Although she was the second strongest in the village, she was pregnant. Because of this Fiona would not allow her to risk her safety or that of the baby. I'm fine Fiona. I just wanted to wish you good luck with the meeting. She said, her cheeks a slight blush. Thank you. Fiona said a little taken back. Is there anything you would like me to do while you are gone? May then asked. Fiona rubber the back of his head. No, May, please don't stress. He said. May nodded and stepped closer to him. I should be coming with you. She whispered softly. Fiona looked down at her stomach and then back to her soft features. You know I can't risk that. He said as he gently grasped her chin. Besides, if anything happens to me, the village will need you to lead them he said smiling at her. May's cheeks turned a little red as she stared deeply into his eyes. You had better come back, she said as she placed her hand on his chest. Fiona nodded. See you soon, May, he said as he placed his Mizukage hat on and walked out. With that, he went off to join the others who were waiting outside the Mizukage's mansion. As he got outside there was already a large crowd of people who had gathered to wish him good fortune. After all, word had already spread of the new changes that would be taking place in the village thanks to him. Lord Mizukage! You're the best! They screamed and cheered. Fiona and the others made their way through the village. He was already hailed as a hero and now his popularity had risen even more. 
That proved evident as there were even groups of women and women who were lined up to see him, declaring their love for him as he walked by. Well, well check you out, Lord Mizukage, Ao said in a joking manner. Fiona couldn't help laughing as he waved to everyone bidding them a good day. I guess it comes with the job. He said, a large smile plastered on his face. Soon enough they reached the edge of the village and Fiona gave one final wave to his people before the four of them left. All right, it's time to pick up the pace a little, he said to the others. They all agreed and the four of them dashed into the tree line, making haste as they set off on their journey across the country. The meeting place had been agreed upon through letter. The Kazakage had requested that they meet in the land of wind. However, Fiona disapproved of the location and instead suggested the land of tea south to the land of fire. It was a neutral country and equally close for both parties to travel to. Fiona and the others had arrived onto the ferry that would cross the sea from the land of water to the land of tea. Of course, it was a secret that the Mizukage was traveling but still everyone in the land of water showed to wave him off. Fiona stood on the deck as he watched the land of water disappear into the distance, nothing but open sea ahead of them now. Ao was currently in talks with the captain and the crew on what to do in case of an emergency. Mangetsu was sat down with his arms sling across both sides of the boat as he looked up into the sky without a care in the world. Gonryu was also sat down as he sharpened his blade, going over the edge again and again. I think it's sharp enough, Gonryu, Fiona said. Gabriel stopped and looked at Fiona as he spoke to him. Yes. One can never be too prepared. He said as he examined the edge of his blade. Fiona nodded as he crossed his arms. Well, you're not wrong. Meanwhile. Excuse me, Lord Kazakage. Baki of the Sand said, entering the Kazakage's office. It's all right, Baki, come in. Baki walked into the office and shut the door behind him. Pakura stood tall as she looked out of the large window. She was fair-skinned with pupilous brown eyes. She had green hair that she tied in a bun on top of her head with a hair needle running through it and one short and long strands of hair with orange tips framing each side of her face. Baki bowed as he got closer. Lord Kazakage, I am reporting that Yashimaru left the village and was last week heading to the mist. Pakura sighed. So he defied my orders, Pakura said with a heavy sigh. Our relationship with the mist is fragile enough. I can only hope they don't try to use this. She said as she took a seat and opened a file. The new Mizukage. Just so happens to be the mist's very own Kage killer. She said as she looked at a picture of Fiona. Baki also had a worried look on his face as he took a quick glance at his profile. He's a monster. We can't afford to risk a war with the mist now. Baki said. Pakura didn't want to admit it and closed the file. He is indeed strong. She said as she interlocked her fingers. We can only act based on how he wishes to proceed. She said. Baki had a worried look. All our attempts to assassinate him have failed. Even Lord Forth couldn't stop him. He said. Well. He hasn't faced me yet. She said as she opened the palm of her hand and let a glowing orb of fire burst to life for effect. Baki nodded. We should make the arrangements to go soon, Lady Kazakage. The meeting is tomorrow. He said. Pakura nodded as she extinguished her scotch-style orb. Yes. I trust you to make the arrangements, Baki. She said. Baki bowed and left the room, leaving her alone. Lord Mizukage, we have arrived, Ao said. Fiona was currently sat down with Ho's legs crossed as he meditated. He had been in a trance for the last two hours as he focused on controlling his tailed beast chakra. They are calling you Fiona, Saiken said giving him a poke with one of his tails. I can see that Fiona said as he opened his eyes and let the chakra fade away. Looks like the time has arrived, Fiona said as he let his mind return to the physical world. Fiona stood up and placed his hat back on. Thanks, Ao. He said giving him a nod. Fiona walked over to the edge of the ship to see the land of tea in the distance. The meeting point wasn't far from the shoreline and would only take an hour at most to arrive. 
It was early morning now, as the trip across the sea had taken a full day. Looks like we're finally here, Mangetsu said as he stretches his arms out. Gonryu also appeared with the same look on his face as always. Fiona smiled as he pulled his Kage hat down over his face to stop the morning sunrise from blonding his vision. Be on guard. Anything could happen from here on out. With that, the ship made port into the dock AMD Fiona and the others quietly made their way off and into the town. Of course, all of them had a disguise on as not to startle any of the town residents. Once on land, the four of them made their way out of town and slowly walked into the forest as to disappear from sight. Once clear they took to the trees and made haste as they moved closer and closer to the meeting location. Before they knew it they had arrived and the four of them jumped to the ground out of the trees. The spot was an old town that was in ruins, most likely having been destroyed in the last war and abandoned. I can't sense anyone here, Lord Mizukage, Ao said as he took a look around. The others also scouted the area a little and could feel nothing. Well, we are a little early, Fiona said as he took a good look around the place. But we can wait. He said as he flexed his fingers and created a large chair made of ice. Fiona then sat down and crossed his legs as he got comfy. Shame we don't have any tea. He said as a little joke. Mangetsu also found a place to sit and rest as he took his water bottle out and took a large sip. Don't get too comfy, Ao said as he crossed his arms. The Kazakage will arrive soon. We had best be on guard just in case. He said. I'm always on guard, Ganryu said, not joking. Mangetsu scoffed and pretended not to hear them as he took another sip from his water bottle. Everyone went silent for a moment as they waited for the Kazakage to arrive each of them tending to their own devices. Fiona had his legs crossed while he sat on his throne of ice, tapping his fingers on the armrest one after to be other as he waited for the time to pass. After about ten minutes the sound was all the others could hear as the tapping of his fingers got faster and faster, crunching against the ice on which he sat. Suddenly the tapping stopped, alerting the others to the immediate silence. They are here, Fiona said, getting everyone's attention. Ao, Mangetsu and Gonryu all gathered around Fiona, who remained seated on his throne. Pakura and three others slowly approached, coming into view. Greetings, Lady Kazakage, Fiona said still sat in his seat. Pakura pulled her kage hat up a little revealing her face to him. Greetings, Lord Mizukage. She said nodding her head a little. Fiona waves his fingers, getting a slight flinch from the Kazakage's guards. However, Pakura raised her hand for them to release as she then gestured to the seat of ice that he had created for her. Please have a seat, he said as he leaned forwards. Pakura accepted his offer and slowly sat down. Her three guard who wore the signature hidden sand umbu masks and robes gathered around her and halted, waiting for her command. So Lady Kazakage, can I offer you some tea? Fiona asked after a brief moment of silence. Deciding to break the ice. As he did he also removed his kage hat, fully revealing his face to all of their surprises. Come now, I have nothing to hide, Fiona said as he slowly raised two fingers. Once again Pakura's guard flinched as they were expecting him to attack. Please! If I wanted to attack you, I would have done so already. Fiona said as his crystal ice mirror finished developing. Fiona reached a hand inside of it much to everyone's surprise and pulled out two cups and a teapot. So, how about that tea? He said again, placing it on a small ice table in the middle of both of them. Chapter 50 Fiona set the teapot and both cups down onto the small table of ice he had created. So Lady Kazakage, tea? He asked as he poured himself a cup. Pakura was impressed by his jutsu and also his manners as she eyed him up. Yes, thank you. She said as she relaxed just a little. Fiona poured the tea and placed the teapot down on the table before picking his cup up and taking a sip. Pakura did the same, much to Baki's distrust of Fiona. So, how was your trip? Fiona asked, making small talk. Pakura was very surprised by his character as she took a small sip of the tea. 
she had only ever had information to go off that had been reported by any survivors that had encountered him. Fiona Yuki, the so-called Ice Devil of the Mist, the Kage Slayer and Master of the Six Tales. He seemed to hold many titles, now even holding the title of Kage himself as his reputation had grown, spreading far and wide throughout the land. Pakura could see that he was still young, still not even in his twenties yet. But she could also see that he had wisdom beyond his years, something she didn't plan to underestimate. Yes, the trip was fine, thank you. She replied as she placed her tea back onto the table. Excellent, Fiona said as he took another drink. Well, to business then? He suddenly said as he uncrossed his legs and leaned forwards. Pakura was a little taken back, but glad to skip the awkward chit-chat. Very well. She said nodding. I'll be blunt, Fiona said as his voice grew a little deeper. I would like to avoid a war with the sand. Peace would suit me much better. He said, looking her dead in the eye. Pakura was surprised at his honesty. It was something seen very little from leaders. I can only hope that you wish the same. I understand that our history is not, well, the greatest. But, I am willing to put all of that behind us and start fresh. Fiona said, sitting up straight. Pakura sat very ladylike as she listened to Fiona's words. She could sense no ill will behind them. No hidden motive or plot that he was hatching and so, decided to let him carry on. I understand that the situation involving you former Kage and our land's princess has created ill will between our nations, Fiona said, and he interlocked his fingers. I also understand the hate towards me for the outcome of that battle, Fiona said as he remembered the battle he had with the fourth Kazakage. However, as I stated before, I am willing to put the past behind us, so that our future may become brighter. Not just for us, but for our people and nation. He said, Pakura had to say, she was impressed. She had only just met Fiona, and already he had swallowed any pride he could have had in front of an enemy. Pakura remained silent for a moment as she looked to the floor, thinking about her response. Lord Mizukij, she said as he looked into his eyes. As the fifth Kazakage, I speak for my people and for my nation. I too wish for peace. I no longer wish to see the blood of my people spilt she said with a serious expression. But, do not mistake my kindness for weakness, or my understanding for foolishness. I accept your offer for peace, but please understand. The sand and mist cannot become friends. We may not seek vengeance now, but one day, you shall be held accountable for what you did to our former Kage. Ao was clearly outraged by her words and stepped forwards about to unload what was on his mind. Fiona quickly raised his hand though and he stopped in his tracks. It's okay Ao, please step back, Fiona said. Ao held his tongue and did as Fiona asked, although he was not happy about it. Fiona looked back at Pakura and sighed. I understand that your village would want revenge against me for what I did. But, I will give you a word of advice. I will do whatever it takes to survive and protect my village. No matter who my enemy is, whether it be a person or a nation. Fiona said in a serious tone. However, he then said as he relaxed a little. Someone once told me, Why have enemies when you can have friends? He said with a small smile coming to his face. Pakura didn't understand the reference, but she did understand the threat he had just given. Very well. I believe we have said everything we need to say. Pakura said as she stood from her seat. Fiona did the same not wanting to seem rude. Yes, I believe we have. He said. Very well. As Kazakage I hereby declare peace between the sand and the mist. She said with a slight nod. Fiona also nodded. As Nzayukage, I too declare there shall be peace between the mist and the sand. He said with a large smile. Fiona then held his hand out towards Pakura as a sign of good faith. Pakura was a little surprised but took it in her own and shook it. Fiona quickly pulled her in close much to the shock of her umbu guards and his own. Lady Kazakage! Baki shouted, about to dive in and attack. 
Pakura was also extremely surprised, and it had happened so fast she hadn't had time to react, astonished by his speed. Fiona whispered something into her ear as he pulled her closer so that only she could hear him. Remember, Lady Kazakage, there are bigger threats that seek nothing but war between us all. I ask you to be wiser to their efforts, Fiona whispered into her ear before he let go of her hand. Pakura was very surprised and quickly pulled back as she raised her hand for her guards to halt. I bid you a safe trip back, Lady Kazakage. And thank you for agreeing to a peaceful outcome. Fiona said as he gave her a slight bow of his head. Pakura slowly nodded, still a little surprised by his advance. Yes. Well, good day, Lord Mizukage. She said taking a few steps back from him, not taking her eyes off of his. Are you all right, Lady Kazakage? Baki asked, clearly enraged by what Fiona had just done. Yes, I'm fine, Baki. She said as she finally turned her back. What was that about? He asked. It's nothing, Baki, let us take our leave. She said, still thinking about what Fiona had just said to her. Fiona and the others watched as the Kazakage and her guards slowly walked off into the distance before they vanished from sight. What was that about? Ao asked as he stepped next to Fiona. I wouldn't worry about it if I was you, Ao, Fiona said, patting him on the shoulder. Let's focus on the positive, at least we aren't going to war. He said with a grin on his face. Ao agreed, but only to an extent. He was of course pleased that they had avoided war with the hidden sand. However, displeased at the fact that Fiona had been so nice about it. Are we really going to let them go? Mangetsu said. I also agree, Lord Mizukage, Ganryu spoke out, agreeing with Mangetsu. Now is the perfect chance to strike and deal a critical blow, Ganryu said. Fiona sighed and rubbed the back of his head. I don't plan on starting a war with the sand at this time or any, if I can help it, Fiona said. How dare you both speak out against Lord Mizukage, Ao said to both of them not happy. It's all right, Ao. I understand your motives and am glad you feel like you can share them with me. But please, I ask that you trust my decisions in this matter. Fiona said as he turned to face them. Both Mangetsu and Ganryu bowed their heads a little as Fiona's gaze set on them. Very well. Please forgive me, Lord Mizukage. Ganryu said after a moment. Whatever, you're the Mizukage, not me, Mangetsu said as he stretched his arms over his head. Ao suddenly burst forward slamming a palm strike into Mangetsu's chest in anger. Learn some respect, boy. He shouted as he did. His attack had done little as his hand had passed right through Mangetsu's body as it burst into water. So it's like that, is it? Mangetsu said as he reached for the hilt of his blade. That is enough, Fiona said as his chakra flared to life. Ao pulled his hand free and Mangetsu just smiled as he turned his back. Lucky for you, he said under his breath. Suddenly his body froze on the spot as a current of electricity ran through his body. W what the? Mangetsu said as he slowly turned to see that it was Fiona who had done it. Listen to me very carefully, Mangetsu, Fiona said as he walked closer to him. If you ever question me, disobey an order, or threaten one of my men again. I will kill you he said as he placed his hand on Mangetsu's shoulder. Mangetsu suddenly realized the difference in power between them and for the first time in his life felt fear. He knew now that he stood no chance against him and that Fiona only allowed him to live because he allowed it. Is that clear, Mangetsu? Fiona asked. Mangetsu slowly nodded through the pain. Yes. Lord Mizukage. He said, calling him Lord Mizukage for the first time. Fiona didn't like to do it, but sometimes in the hidden mist, a show of power was the only way to get anything done. Good, Fiona said as he turned around. Now let's get back to the village. He said as he created an ice mirror in front of them. Both Ao and Ganri were used to this by now and nodded, each of them walking into the mirror. Mangetsu had never actually seen this jutsu firsthand and was a little skeptical about it. Go on Mangetsu, Fiona said, waving his hand. Mangetsu nodded and slowly walked into the mirror, shocked to see that he was back in the Mizukage's office when he stepped out of it. 
All right, let's get the debrief in order and then we can report the success of the mission, Fiona said as he too stepped out of the mirror and sat down in his chair. Mangetsu took a mental note that day to never cross Fiona again, not unless he wanted to die that was. Meanwhile, Lady Kazakage, is this really all right? If we are really planning to betray the mist and attack, what was the point of the meeting today? Baki asked quietly. Pakura and her Ambu guards slowly walked through the trees as they entered the border to the land of wind. I wanted to see what the Mizukage's own motives were Baki. No. I needed to see what they were. She said as she tried to put all the pieces together in her mind. I now know that we simply cannot win against the mist. Not yet anyway. She said. So what do we do now, Lady Kazakage? Baki asked. We wait. And we prepare for war. Our day will come Baki, we just need to be patient. Pakura said. But first, take care of the spies. She said, giving him the order. Baki nodded before he created a wind blade and cut down both of the other umbu that were with them, getting a scream from them as he cut them in half. The council cannot know what was said here today, Pakura said, not even turning back to look. Back in the hidden mist. And that concludes my report from the meeting with the Kazakage, Fiona said to the elders, having finished telling them what happened. And how can we trust the word of the Kazakage? The head elder asked. We can't, Fiona said truthfully. All we can do is wait and prepare. He then responded as he sat back in his chair. Yes. The elder spoke before standing. Very well. We leave things in your care, Lord Mizukage. He said bowing. Fiona nodded and watched as they excused themselves from his office. Fiona sighed and looked over to Ao who as his advisor was still present. Something on your mind Ao? He asked, noticing Ao's expression. Ao was a little surprised that Fiona noticed and shook his head. No. It's nothing. He said. Fiona couldn't help but laugh a little. Well, now I really want to know. He said interested. Please Ao speak your mind, Fiona said with a smile. This time Ao sighed as he folded his arms over his chest. It's just... Well... I don't like it. He said getting in a little mood. You don't like what? Fiona asked. I don't trust the San Fiona. They are up to something no doubt about it. Ao said this time waiting his hands as he spoke. Fiona smiled. I know Ao I know. Look I'm not stupid. But we have peace, even if it is only for now. I expect they will betray us sooner or later. Ao looked surprised. Then why go to all that trouble and not just kill them now? He asked. I can't tell you that for now, Ao. Just trust me. He said as he stood up. Ao slowly nodded his head and then bowed. I'm sorry, Lord Mizukage. It's not my place to question you. He said. Please, Ao. I welcome it. I already told you, I don't plan on doing things like Yagura. If you ever need to ask me why then please do. Just know that there are some things I can tell you and some I can't. Not just yet anyway. He said smiling at Ao. Ao nodded. All right, now get yourself home and rest. I'll finish up here for the night, Fiona said. Ao nodded and bid Fiona good night before he left the office. I'm sorry, Ao. But there is still a lot I will not be able to tell you for a long time yet. Fiona thought as he watched him go. That goes for everyone else too. He then thought as he sat back down. Fiona then noticed the paperwork on his desk that he had asked for the day before. It was the files on the new Jinan that had passed out of the academy and the teams they had been placed in. Fiona looked over all of them and read the report each of them had been given displaying their strengths and weaknesses. Finally, he got to Haku and Kimimaro's team that also including Koyoki, the daughter of Yagura who he had promised he would look after. Koyoki Karatachi Fiona said as he read her profile. I see she is a gifted one. Ten years old, she clearly takes after her father. He thought as he carried on reading the report. 
Fiona then picked up the final piece of paper that was the last team that had been formed. It had seemed this squad had been made at the request of the head of the Hashigaki to enter one of their own into the ranks, as Fiona had requested. Kujira Hashigaki. This one looks interesting. Fiona said with a slight smile as he read his file. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching, I truly appreciate you. And with that being said I'll see you in part 3. Peace.